Section 1 of The Oxford Book of American Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Carson. The Oxford Book of American Essays. Chosen by Brander Matthews. Section 1. Introduction. The customary antithesis between American literature and English literature is unfortunate and misleading in that it seems to exclude American authors from the noble role of those who have contributed to the literature of our mother tongue. Of course, when we consider it carefully, we cannot fail to see that the literature of a language is one and indivisible, and that the nativity or the domicile of those who make it matters nothing. Just as Alexandrian literature is Greek, so American literature is English. And as Theocritus demands inclusion in any account of Greek literature, so Thoreau cannot be omitted from any history of English literature as a whole. The works of Anthony Hamilton and Rousseau, Mademoiselle de Stey, and M. Maeterlinck are not more indisputably a part of the literature of the French language than the works of Franklin and Emerson, of Hawthorne and Poe, are part of the literature of the English language. Theocritus may never have set foot on the soil of Greece, and Thoreau never adventured himself on the Atlantic to visit the island home of his ancestors. Yet the former expressed himself in Greek and the latter in English, and how can either be neglected in any comprehensive survey of the literature of his own tongue? Nonetheless, it is undeniable that there is in Franklin and Emerson, in Walt Whitman and Mark Twain, whatever their mastery of the idiom they inherited in common with Steele and Carlyle, with Browning and Lamb, an indefinable and intangible flavor which distinguishes the first group from the second. The men who have set down the feelings and the thoughts, the words and the deeds of the inhabitants of the United States have not quite the same outlook on life that we find in the men who have made a similar record in the British Isles. The social atmosphere is not the same on the opposite shores of the Western Ocean and the social organization is different in many particulars. For all that, American literature is, in the apt phrase of Mr. Howells, a condition of English literature. Nevertheless, it is also distinctively American. American writers are as loyal to the finer traditions of English literature as British writers are. They take an equal pride that they are also heirs of Chaucer and Dryden and subjects of King Shakespeare. Yet they cannot help having the note of their own nationality. Green, when he came to the 4th of July, 1776, declared that thereafter the history of the English-speaking people flowed in two currents, and it is equally obvious that the stream of English literature has now two channels. The younger and smaller is American, and what can we call the older and the ampler? except British. A century ago there were published collections entitled The British Poets, The British Novelists, and The British Essayists, and the adjective was probably then chosen to indicate that these gatherings included the work of Scotch and Irish writers. Whatever the reason, the choice was happy, and the same adjective would serve to indicate now that the selections excluded the work of American writers. The British branch of English literature is the richer and the more various, yet the American branch has its own richness and its own variety, even if these qualities have revealed themselves only in the past hundred years. It may be noted also that although American literature has not been adorned by so great a galaxy of brilliant names as illumined British literature in the nineteenth century. It has had the good fortune to possess some authors of cosmopolitan fame that can be found in the German literature of the past hundred 
years, in the Italian or in the Spanish. A forgotten American essayist once asserted that foreign nations are a contemporaneous posterity, and even if this smart saying is not to be taken too literally, it has its significance. There is therefore food for thought in the fact that at least half a dozen, not to say half a score, of American authors have won wide popularity outside the limits of their own language, a statement which could not be made of as many German or Italian or Spanish authors of the nineteenth century. From the death of Goethe to the arrival of the playwrights of the present generation, perhaps Heine is the sole German writer either of prose or of verse, who has established his reputation broadly among the readers of other tongues than his own and not more than one or two spanish or italian authors have been received either by their fellow latins as warmly as the french and the germans have welcomed cooper and poe emerson and mark twain it is to present typical and characteristic examples of the american contribution to english literature in the essay form that this volume has been prepared. Perhaps the term essay form is not happily chosen since the charm of the essay lies in the fact that it is not formal, that it may be whimsical in its point of departure and capricious in its ramblings after it has got itself under way. Even the essay is itself a chameleon, changing color while we study it. There is little in common between Locke's austere essay on the human understanding and lamb's fantastic and frolicsome essay on roast pig he would be bold indeed who should take compass and chain to measure off the precise territory of the essay and to mark with scientific exactness the boundaries which separate it from the address on the one side and from the letter on the other some there are that turn over all books and are equally searching in all papers said ben jonson that write out of what they presently find or meet without choice such are all the essayists ever their master montaigne bacon and emerson followed in the footsteps of montaigne and present us with the results of their browsings among books and of their own dispersed meditations in their hands the essay lacks cohesion and unity it is essentially discursive montaigne never stuck to his text when he had one and the paragraphs of any of emerson's essays might be shuffled without increasing their fortuitous discontinuity after montaigne and bacon came steele and addison in whose hands the essay broadened its scope and took on a new aspect the eighteenth century essay is so various that it may be accepted as the forerunner of the nineteenth century magazine with its character sketches and its brief tales its literary and dramatic criticism its obituary commemorations and its social stories for what but a serial story is the succession of papers devoted to the sayings and doings of sir roger it was a new departure although the writers of the tattler and of the spectator had profited by the conversations of walton and by the characters of la bruyere by the epistles of horace and by the comedies of moliere has it ever been pointed out that the method of steele and addison in depicting sir roger is curiously akin to the method of moliere in presenting monsieur jourdain the delightful form of poetry which we call by a french name vers de societe although it has flourished more abundantly in english literature than in french and which mr austin dobson one of its supreme masters prefers to call by cowper's term familiar verse may be accepted as the metrical equivalent of the prose essay as this was developed and expanded by the english writers of the eighteenth century and as the familiar verse of our language is ampler and richer than that of any other tongue so also is the familiar essay indeed the essay is one of the most characteristic expressions of the quality of our race 
in its ease and its lightness and its variety it is almost unthinkable in german and even in french it is far less frequent than in english and far less assiduously cultivated as emerson trod in the footsteps of bacon so washington irving walked in the trail blazed by steele and addison and goldsmith and franklin earlier although his essays are in fact only letters had revealed his possession of the special quality the essay demands the playful wisdom of a man of the world who is also a man of letters indeed dr franklin was far better fitted to shine as an essayist than his more ponderous contemporary dr johnson certainly franklin would never have made little fishes talk like whales and in the nineteenth century the american branch of english literature has had a group of essayists less numerous than that which adorned the british branch but no less interesting or less important to their own people among these american essayists we may find all sorts and conditions of writers poets adventuring themselves in prose novelists eschewing storytelling statesmen turning for a moment to matters of less weight men of science and men of affairs chatting about themselves and airing their opinions at large in their hands as in the hands of their british contemporaries the essay remains infinitely various refusing to conform to any single type and insisting on being itself and on expressing its author we find in the best of these american essayists the familiar style and the everyday vocabulary the apparent simplicity and the seeming absence of effort the horror of pedantry and the scorn of affectation which are the abiding characteristics of the true essay we find also the flavor of good talk of the sprightly conversation that may sparkle in front of a wood fire and that often vanishes with the curling blue smoke it is the bounden duty of every maker of an anthology to set forth the principles that have guided him in the choice of the examples he is proffering to the public the present editor has excluded purely literary criticism as not quite falling within the boundaries of the essay properly so called then he has avoided all set orations although he has not hesitated to include more than one paper originally prepared to be read aloud by its writer because these examples seem to him to fall within the boundaries of the essay nearly all of emerson's essays it may be noted had been lectures in an early stage of their existence furthermore he has omitted all fiction strictly to be so termed although he would gladly have welcomed an apologue like mark twain's travelling with a reformer which is essentially an essay despite its use of dialogue he has included also franklin's dialogue with the gout which is instinct with the true spirit of the essay and he has accepted as essays franklin's ephemera and the whistle although they are both of them letters to the same lady as the essay flowers out of leisure and out of culture and as there has been in the united states no long background of easy tranquillity there is in the american branch of english literature a relative deficiency in certain of the lighter forms of the essay more abundantly represented in the british branch and therefore the less frequent examples of these lighter forms have been companioned by graver discussions never grave enough however to be described as disquisitions finally every selection is presented entire except that dana's paper on keen's acting has been shorn of a needless preparatory note brander matthews the ephemera an emblem of human life to madame brillon of passy benjamin franklin you may remember my dear friend that when we lately spent that happy day in the delightful garden and sweet society of the moulin jolie i stopped a little in one of our walks 
and stayed some time behind the company. We had been shown numberless skeletons of a kind of little fly called an ephemera, whose successive generations, we were told, were bred and expired within the day. I happened to see a living company of them on a leaf who appeared to be engaged in conversation. You know I understand all the inferior animal tongues. My too great application to the study of them is the best excuse I can give for the little progress I have made in your charming language. I listened through curiosity to the discourse of these little creatures, but as they in their national vivacity spoke three or four of them, I could make but little of their conversation. I found, however, by some broken expressions that I heard now and then, they were disputing warmly on the merit of two foreign musicians, one a cousin and the other a mochetto, in which dispute they spent their time, seemingly as regardless of the shortness of life as if they had been sure of living a month. Happy people, thought I you are certainly under a wise just and mild government since you have no public grievances to complain of nor any subject of contention but the perfections and imperfections of foreign music i turned my head from them to an old grey-headed one who was single on another leaf and talking to himself being amused with his soliloquy i put it down in writing in hopes it will likewise amuse her to whom i am so much indebted for the most pleasing of all amusements her delicious company and heavenly harmony it was said he the opinion of learned philosophers of our race who lived and flourished long before my time that this vast world the moulin joli could not itself subsist more than eighteen hours and i think there was some foundation for that opinion since by the apparent motion of the great luminary that gives life to all nature and which in my time has evidently declined considerably toward the ocean at the end of our earth it must then finish its course be extinguished in the waters that surround us and leave the world in cold and darkness necessarily producing universal death and destruction i have lived seven of those hours a great age being no less than four hundred and twenty minutes of time how very few of us continue so long i have seen generations born flourish and expire my present friends are the children and grandchildren of the friends of my youth who are now alas no more and i must now follow them for by the course of nature though still in health i cannot expect to live above seven or eight minutes longer what now avails all my toil and labour in amassing honey dew on this leaf which i cannot live to enjoy what the political struggles i have been engaged in for the good of my compatriot inhabitants of this bush or my philosophical studies for the benefit of our race in general for in politics what can laws do without morals our present race of ephemerae will in a course of minutes become corrupt like those of other and older bushes and consequently as wretched and in philosophy how small our progress alas art is long and life is short my friends would comfort me with the idea of a name they say i shall leave behind me and they tell me i have lived long enough to nature and to glory but what will fame be to an ephemera who no longer exists and what will become of all history in the eighteenth hour when the world itself even the whole moulin joli shall come to its end and be buried in universal ruin to me after all my eager pursuits no solid pleasures now remain but the reflection of a long life spent in meaning well sensible conversation of a few good lady ephemerae and now and then a kind smile and a tune from the ever amiable brillante the whistle 
to madame brillon benjamin franklin i received my dear friends two letters one for wednesday and one for saturday this is again wednesday i do not deserve one for today because i have not answered the former but indolent as i am and averse to writing the fear of having no more of your pleasing epistles if i do not contribute to the correspondence obliges me to take up my pen and as mr b has kindly sent me word that he sets out to-morrow to see you instead of spending this wednesday evening as i have done its namesakes in your delightful company i sit down to spend it in thinking of you in writing to you and in reading over and over again your letters i am charmed with your description of paradise and with your plan of living there and i approve much of your conclusion that in the meantime we should draw all the good we can from this world in my opinion we might all draw more good from it than we do and suffer less evil if we would take care not to give too much for whistles for to me it seems that most of the unhappy people we meet with are become so by neglect of that caution you ask what i mean you love stories and will excuse my telling one of myself when i was a child of seven years old my friends on a holiday filled my pocket with coppers i went directly to a shop where they sold toys for children being charmed with the sound of a whistle that i met by the way in the hands of another boy i voluntarily offered and gave all my money for one i then came home and went whistling all over the house much pleased with my whistle but disturbing all the family my brothers and sisters and cousins understanding the bargain i had made told me i had given four times as much for it as it was worth put me in mind with good things i might have bought with the rest of the money and laughed at me so much for my folly that i cried in vexation and the reflection gave me more chagrin than the whistle gave me pleasure this however was afterwards of use to me click this however was afterwards of use to me the impression continuing on my mind so that often when i was tempted to buy some unnecessary thing i said to myself don't give too much for that whistle and i saved my money as i grew up came into the world and observed the actions of men i thought i met with many very many who gave too much for the whistle when i saw one too ambitious of court favor sacrificing his time in attendance on levies his repose his liberty his virtue and perhaps his friends to attain it i have said to myself this man gives too much for his whistle when i saw another fond of popularity constantly employing himself in political bustles neglecting his own affairs and ruining them by that neglect he pays indeed said i too much for his whistle if i knew a miser who gave up every kind of comfortable living all the pleasure of doing good to others all the esteem of his fellow-citizens and the joys of benevolent friendship for the sake of accumulating wealth poor man said i you pay too much for your whistle when i met with a man of pleasure sacrificing every laudable improvement of the mind or of his fortune to mere corporeal sensations and ruining his health in their pursuits mistaken man said i you are providing pain for yourself instead of pleasure you give too much for your whistle if i see one fond of appearance or fine clothes fine houses fine furniture fine equipages all above his fortune for which he contracts debts and ends his career in a prison alas say i he has paid dear very dear for his whistle when i see a beautiful sweet tempered girl married to an ill-natured brute of a husband what a pity say i that she should pay so much for a whistle in short i conceive that great part of the miseries of mankind 
are brought upon them by the false estimates they have made of the value of things, and by their giving too much for their whistles. Yet I ought to have charity for these unhappy people when I consider that, with all this wisdom of which I am boasting, there are certain things in the world so tempting, for example, the apples of King John, which happily are not to be bought, for if they were put to sale by auction, I might very easily be led to ruin myself in the purchase, and find that I had once more given too much for the whistle. Adieu, my dear friend, and believe me ever yours, very sincerely, and with unalterable affection. Dialogue between Franklin and the Gout Midnight, 22nd of October, 1780 Franklin, eh, oh, eh, what have I done to merit these cruel sufferings? Gout, many things you have ate and drank too freely and too much indulged those legs of yours in their indolence. Franklin, who is it that accuses me? Gout, it is I, even I, the gout. Franklin, what, my enemy in person? Gout, no, not your enemy. Franklin, I repeat it, my enemy, for you would not only torment my body to death, but ruin my good name. You reproach me as a glutton and a tippler. Now all the world that knows me will allow that I am neither the one nor the other. Gout, the world may think as it pleases. It is always very complacent to itself, and sometimes to its friends, but I very well know that the quantity of meat and drink proper for a man who takes a reasonable degree of exercise would be too much for another who never takes any franklin i take oh oh as much exercise oh as i can madame gout you know my sedentary state and on that account it would seem madame gout as if you might spare me a little seeing it is not altogether my own fault gout not a jot your rhetoric and your politeness are thrown away your apology avails nothing if your situation in life is a sedentary one your amusements your recreation at least should be active you ought to walk or ride or if the weather prevents that play at billiards but let us examine your course of life while the mornings are long and you have leisure to go abroad what do you do why, instead of gaining an appetite for breakfast, by salutary exercise, you amuse yourself with books, pamphlets, or newspapers, which commonly are not worth the reading. Yet you eat an inordinate breakfast, four dishes of tea with cream, and one or two buttered toasts with slices of hung beef, which I fancy are not things the most easily digested. Immediately afterwards you sit down to write at your desk, or converse with persons who apply to you on business. Thus the time passes till one without any kind of bodily exercise, but all this I could pardon in regard, as you say, to your sedentary condition. But what is your practice after dinner? Walking in the beautiful gardens of those friends with whom you have dined would be the choice of men of sense. Yours is to be fixed down to chess, where you are found engaged for two or three hours. This is your perpetual recreation, which is the least eligible of any for a sedentary man, because instead of accelerating the motion of the fluids, the rigid attention it requires helps to retard the circulation and obstruct internal secretions. Wrapped in the speculations of this wretched game, you destroy your constitution. What can be expected from such a course of living but a body replete with stagnant humours, ready to fall play to all kinds of dangerous maladies, if I, the gout, did not occasionally bring you relief by agitating those humours, and so purifying or dissipating them? If it was in some nook or alley in Paris, deprived of walks, that you played a while at chess after dinner, this might be excusable, but the same taste prevails with you in Passy, Auteuil, Montmartre, Assanoy. 
places where there are the finest gardens and walks a pure air beautiful women and most agreeable and instructive conversation all which you might enjoy by frequenting the walks but these are rejected for this abominable game of chess fie then mr franklin but amidst my instructions i had almost forgot to administer my wholesome corrections so take that twinge and that franklin oh e o o as much instruction as you please madame gout and as many reproaches but pray madame a truce with your corrections gout no sir no i will not abate a particle of what is so much for your good therefore franklin oh eh it is not fair to say i take no exercise when i do very often going out to dine and returning in my carriage gout that of all imaginable exercises is the most slight and insignificant if you allude to the motion of a carriage suspended on springs by observing the degree of heat obtained by different kinds of motion we may form an estimate of the quantity of exercise given by each thus for example if you turn out to walk in winter with cold feet in an hour's time you will be in a glow all over ride on horseback the same effect will scarcely be perceived by four hours round trotting but if you lull in a carriage such as you have mentioned you may travel all day and gladly enter the last inn to warm your feet by a fire flatter yourself then no longer that half an hour's airing in your carriage deserves the name of exercise providence has appointed few to roll in carriages while he has given to all a pair of legs which are machines infinitely more commodious and serviceable be grateful then and make a proper use of yours would you know how they forward the circulation of your fluids in the very action of transporting you from place to place observe when you walk that all your weight is alternately thrown from one leg to the other this occasions a great pressure on the vessels of the foot and repels their contents when relieved by the weight being thrown on the other foot the vessels of the first are allowed to replenish and by a return to this weight this repulsion again succeeds thus accelerating the circulation of the blood the heat produced at any given time depends on the degree of this acceleration the fluids are shaken the humours attenuated the secretions facilitated and all goes well the cheeks are ruddy and health is established behold your fair friend at Autuy. a lady who received from bounteous nature more readily useful science than half a dozen such pretenders to philosophy as you have been able to extract from all your books when she honours you with a visit it is on foot she walks all hours of the day and leaves indolence and its concomitant maladies to be endured by her horses in this see at once the preservative of her health and personal charms but when you go to Autuil, you must have your carriage, though it is no farther from Passy to Autuil than from Autuil to Passy. Franklin, your reasonings grow very tiresome. Gout, I stand corrected. I will be silent and continue my office. Take that and that. Franklin, oh, oh. Talk on, I pray you. Gout, no, no i have a good number of twinges for you to-night and you may be sure of some more to-morrow franklin what with such a fever i shall go distracted oh hey can no one bear it for me gout ask that of your horses they have served you faithfully franklin how can you so cruelly sport with my torments gout sport i am very serious i have here a list of offences against your own health distinctly written and can justify every stroke inflicted on you read it then click franklin read it then gout it is too long a detail but i will briefly mention some particulars 
franklin proceed i am all attention gout do you remember how often you have promised yourself the following morning a walk in the grove of bologna in the garden of de la mute or in your own garden and have violated your promise alleging at one time it was too cold at another too warm too windy too moist or what else you pleased when in truth it was too nothing but your insuperable love of ease that i confess may have happened occasionally probably ten times in a year gout your confession is very far short of the truth the gross amount is one hundred and ninety-nine times franklin is it possible gout so possible that it is fact you may rely on the accuracy of my statement you know monsieur billon's gardens and what fine walks they contain you know the handsome flight of a hundred steps which lead from the terrace above to the lawn below you have been in the practice of visiting this amiable family twice a week after dinner and it is a maxim of your own that a man may take as much exercise in walking a mile up and down stairs as in ten on level ground what an opportunity was here for you to have had exercise in both these ways did you embrace it and how often franklin i cannot immediately answer that question gout i will do it for you not once franklin not once gout even so during the summer you went there at six o'clock you found the charming lady with her lovely children and friends eager to walk with you and entertain you with their agreeable conversation and what has been your choice why to sit on the terrace satisfy yourself with a fine prospect and passing your eye over the beauties of the garden below without taking one step to descend and walk about in them on the contrary you call for tea and the chessboard and lo you are occupied in your seat till nine o'clock and that besides two hours play after dinner and then instead of walking home which would have bestirred you a little you step into your carriage how absurd to suppose that all this carelessness can be reconcilable with your health without my interposition franklin i am convinced now of the justice of poor richard's remark that our debts and our sins are always greater than we think for gout so it is you philosophers are sages in your maxims and fools in your conduct franklin but do you charge among my crimes that i return in a carriage from m billon's gout certainly for having been seated all the while you cannot object the fatigue of the day and cannot want therefore the relief of a carriage franklin what then would you have me do with my carriage gout burn it if you choose you would at least get heat out of it once in this way or if you dislike that proposal here's another for you observe the poor peasants who work in the vineyards and grounds about the villages of passy Altou, and chalot etc you may find every day among these deserving creatures four or five old men and women bent and perhaps crippled by weight of years and too long and too great labor after a most fatiguing day these people have to trudge a mile or two to their smoky huts order your coachman to set them down this is an act that will be good for your soul and at the same time after your visit the brillons if you return on foot that will be good for your body franklin ah how tiresome you are gout well then to my office it should not be forgotten that i am your physician there franklin oh what a devil of a physician gout how ungrateful you are to say so is it not i who in the character of your physician have saved you from the palsy dropsy and apoplexy one or other of which would have done for you long ago but for me franklin i submit and i thank you for the past but entreat 
the discontinuance of your visits for the future for in my mind one had better die than be cured so dolefully permit me just to hint that i have also not been unfriendly to you i never feed physician or quack of any kind to enter the list against you if then you do not leave me to my repose it may be said you are ungrateful too gout i can scarcely acknowledge that as any objection as to quacks i despise them they may kill you indeed but cannot injure me and as to regular physicians they are at least convinced that the gout in such a subject as you are is no disease but a remedy and wherefore cure a remedy but to our business there franklin oh oh for heaven's sake leave me and i promise faithfully never more to play at chess but to take exercise daily and live temperately gout i know you too well you promise fair but after a few months of good health you will return to your old habits your fine promises will be forgotten like the forms of last year's clouds let us then finish the account and i will go but i leave you with an assurance of visiting you again at a proper time and place for my object is your good and you are sensible now that i am your real friend consolation for the old bachelor francis hopkinson mr atkin your old bachelor having pathetically represented the miseries of his solitary situation severely reproaching himself for having neglected to marry in his younger days i would fain alleviate his distress by showing that it is possible he might have been as unhappy even in the honourable state of matrimony i am a shoemaker in this city and by my industry and attention have been enabled to maintain my wife and a daughter now six years old in comfort and respect and to lay by a little at the year's end against a rainy day my good wife had long teased me to take her to new york in order to visit mrs snip the lady of an eminent tailor in that city and her cousin from whom she had received many pressing invitations this jaunt had been the daily subject of discussion at breakfast dinner and supper for a month before the time fixed upon for putting it in execution as our daughter jenny could by no means be left at home many and great were the preparations to equip miss and her mamma for their important journey and yet as my wife assured me there was nothing provided but what was absolutely necessary and which we could not possibly do without my purse sweat at every pore at last the long-expected day arrived preceded by a very restless night for as my wife could not sleep for thinking on the approaching jaunt neither would she suffer me to repose in quiet if i happened through wearisomeness to fall into a slumber she immediately roused me by some unseasonable question or remark frequently asking if i was sure the apprentice had greased the chair wheels and seen that the harness was clean and in good order often observing how surprised her cousin snip would be to see us and as often wondering how poor dear miss jenny would bear the fatigue of the journey thus passed the night in delightful discourse if that can with propriety be called a discourse wherein my wife was the only speaker my replies never exceeding the monosyllables yes or no murmured between sleeping and waking no sooner was it fair daylight but up started my notable wife and soon roused the whole family the little trunk was stuffed with baggage even to bursting and tied behind the chair and the chair box was crammed with trumpery which we could not possibly do without 
Miss Jenny was dressed and breakfast devoured in haste. The old negro wench was called in and the charge of the house committed to her care and the two apprentices and the hired maid received many wholesome cautions and instructions for their conduct during our absence all of which they most liberally promised to observe whilst i attended with infinite patience the adjustment of these preliminaries at length however we set off and turning the first corner lost sight of our habitation with great regret on my part and no less joy on the part of miss jenny and her mamma when we got to pool's bridge there happened to be a great concourse of wagons carts etc so that we could not pass for some time miss jenny frightened my wife very impatient and uneasy wondered i did not call out to those impudent fellows to make way for us observing that i had not the spirit of a louse having got through this difficulty we proceeded without obstruction my wife in good humor again miss jenny in high spirits at kensington fresh troubles arise bless me miss jenny says my wife where is the bandbox i don't know mamma the last time i saw it it was on the table in your room what's to be done the bandbox is left behind it contains miss jenny's new wire cap there is no possibility of doing without it as well no new york as no wire cap there is no alternative we must e'en go back for it teased and mortified as i was my good wife administered consolation by observing that it was my business to see that everything was put into the chair that ought to be but there was no depending upon me for anything and that she plainly saw i undertook this journey with an ill will merely because she had set her heart upon it silent patience was my only remedy an hour and a half restored to us this essential requisite the wire cap and brought us back to the place where we first missed it after innumerable difficulties and unparalleled dangers occasioned by ruts stumps and tremendous bridges we arrived at neshamony ferry but how to cross it was the question my wife protested that neither she nor jenny would go over in the boat with the horse i assured her that there was not the least danger that the horse was as quiet as a dog and that i would hold him by the bridle all the way these assurances had little weight the most forcible argument was that she must go that way or not at all for there was no other boat to be had thus persuaded she ventured in the flies were troublesome the horse kicked my wife in panics miss jenny in tears ditto at trenton ferry as we started pretty early and as the days were long we reached trenton by two o'clock here we dined my wife found fault with everything and whilst she disposed of what i thought a tolerable hearty meal declared there was nothing fit to eat matters however would have gone on pretty well but miss jenny began to cry with the toothache sad lamentations over miss jenny all my fault because i had not made the glazier replace a broken pane in her chamber window nota bene i had been twice for him and he promised to come but was not so good as his word after dinner we again entered upon our journey my wife in good humor miss jenny's toothache much easier various chat i acknowledge everything my wife says for fear of discomposing her we arrive in good time at princeton my wife and daughter admire the college we refresh ourselves with tea and go to bed early in order to be up by times for the next day's expedition 
in the morning we set off again in tolerable good humour and proceeded happily as far as rocky hill here my wife's fears and terrors returned with great force i drove as carefully as possible but coming to a place where one of the wheels must unavoidably go over the point of a small rock my wife in a great fright seized hold of one of the reins which happening to be the wrong one she pulled the horse so as to force the wheel higher up the rock than it would otherwise have gone and overset the chair we were all tumbled hicklety picklety into the road miss jenny's face all bloody the woods echo to her cries my wife in a fainting fit and i in great misery secretly and most devoutly wishing cousin snip at the devil matters begin to mend my wife recovers miss jenny has only received a slight scratch on one of her cheeks the horse stands quite still and none of the harness broke matters grew worse again the twine with which the bandbox was tied had broke in the fall and the aforesaid wire cap lay soaking in a nasty mud puddle grievous lamentations over the wire cap all my fault because i did not tie it better no remedy no wire caps to be bought at rocky hill at night my wife discovered a small bruise on her hip was apprehensive it might mortify did not know but the bone might be broken or splintered many instances of mortifications occasioned by small injuries after passing unhurt over the imminent dangers of passaic and hackensack rivers and the yet more tremendous horrors paulus hook ferry we arrived at the close of the third day at cousin snips in the city of new york here we sojourned a tedious week my wife spent as much money as would have maintained my family for a month at home in purchasing a hundred useless articles which we could not possibly do without and every night when we went to bed fatigued me with encomiums on her cousin snip leading to a history of the former grandeur of her family and concluding with insinuations that i did not treat her with the attention and respect i ought on the seventh day my wife and cousin snip had a pretty warm altercation respecting the comparative elegancies and advantages of new york and philadelphia the disputes ran high and many aggravating words passed between the two advocates the next morning my wife declared that my business would not admit of a longer absence from home and so after much ceremonious complaisance in which my wife was by no means exceeded by her very polite cousin we left the famous city of new york and i with heartfelt satisfaction looked forward to the happy period of our safe arrival in water street philadelphia but this blessing was not to be obtained without much vexation and trouble but lest i should seem tedious i shall not recount the adventures of our return how we were caught in a thunderstorm how our horse failed by which we were benighted three miles from our stage how my wife's panics returned how miss jenny howled and how very miserable i was made suffice it to say that after many distressing disasters we arrived at the door of our own habitation in water street no sooner had we entered the house than we were informed that one of my apprentices had run away with the hired maid nobody knew where the old negro had got drunk fallen into the fire and burnt out one of her eyes and our best china bowl was broken my good wife contrived with her usual ingenuity to throw the blame of all these misfortunes upon me 
as this was a consolation to which i had been long accustomed in all untoward cases i had recourse to my usual remedy vis-a-vis silent patience after sincerely praying that i might never more see cousin snip i sat industriously down to my trade in order to retrieve my manifold losses this is only a miniature picture of the married state which i present to your old bachelor in hopes it may abate his choler and reconcile him to a single life but if this opiate should not be sufficient to give him some ease i may perhaps send him a stronger dose hereafter end of section one section two of the oxford book of american essays chosen by brander matthew this librivox recording is in the public domain section two john bull by washington irving an old song made by an aged old pate of an old worshipful gentleman who had a great estate kept a brave old house at a bountiful rate and an old porter to relieve the poor at his gate with an old study filled full of learned old books with an old reverend chaplain you might know him by his looks with an old buttery hatch worn quite off the hooks and an old kitchen that maintained half a dozen old cooks like an old courtier etc an old song there is no species of humour in which the english more excel than that which consists in caricaturing and giving ludicrous appellations or nicknames in this way they have whimsically designated not merely individuals but nations and in their fondness for pushing a joke they have not spared even themselves one would think that in personifying itself a nation would be apt to picture something grand heroic and imposing but it is characteristic of the peculiar humour of the english and of their love for what is blunt comic and familiar that they have embodied their national oddities in the figure of a sturdy corpulent old fellow with a three-cornered hat red waistcoat leather breeches and stout oaken cudgel thus have they taken a singular delight in exhibiting their most private foibles in a laughable point of view and have been so successful in their delineations that there is scarcely a being in actual existence more absolutely present to the public mind than that eccentric personage john bull perhaps the continual contemplation of the character thus drawn of them has contributed to fix it upon the nation and thus to give reality to what at first may have been painted in a great measure from the imagination men are apt to acquire peculiarities that are continually ascribed to them the common orders of english seem wonderfully captivated with the beau ideal which they have formed of john bull and endeavour to act up to the broad caricature that is perpetually before their eyes unluckily they sometimes make their boasted bullism an apology for their prejudice or grossness and this i have especially noticed among those truly home-bred and genuine sons of the soil who have never migrated beyond the sound of bow bells if one of these should be a little uncouth in speech and apt to utter impertinent truths he confesses that he is a real john bull and always speaks his mind if he now and then flies into an unreasonable burst of passion about trifles he observes that john bull is a choleric old blade but then his passion is over in a moment and he bears no malice if he betrays a coarseness of taste and an insensibility to foreign refinements 
he thanks heaven for his ignorance he is a plain john bull and has no relish for frippery and knick-knacks his very proneness to be gulled by strangers and to pay extravagantly for absurdities is excused under the plea of munificence for john is always more generous than wise thus under the name of john bull he will contrive to argue every fault into a merit and will frankly convict himself of being the honestest fellow in existence however little therefore the character may have suited in the first instance it has gradually adapted itself to the nation or rather they have adapted themselves to each other and a stranger who wishes to study english peculiarities may gather much valuable information from the innumerable portraits of john bull as exhibited in the windows of the caricature shops still however he is one of those fertile humorists that are continually throwing out new portraits and presenting different aspects from different points of view and often as he has been described i cannot resist the temptation to give a slight sketch of him such as he has met my eye john bull to all appearance is a plain downright matter-of-fact fellow with much less of poetry about him than rich prose there is little of romance in his nature but a vast deal of strong natural feeling he excels in humour more than in wit is jolly rather than gay melancholy rather than morose can easily be moved to a sudden tear or surprised into a broad laugh but he loathes sentiment and has no turn for light pleasantry he is a boon companion if you allow him to have his humour and to talk about himself and he will stand by a friend in a quarrel with life and purse however soundly he may be cudgelled in this last respect to tell the truth he has a propensity to be somewhat too ready he is a busy-minded personage who thinks not merely for himself and family but for all the country round and is most generously disposed to be everybody's champion he is continually volunteering his services to settle his neighbours affairs and takes it in great dudgeon if they engage in any matter of consequence without asking his advice though he seldom engages in any friendly office of the kind without finishing by getting into a squabble with all parties and then railing bitterly at their ingratitude he unluckily took lessons in his youth in the noble science of defence and having accomplished himself in the use of his limbs and his weapons and has become a perfect master at boxing and cudgel play he has had a troublesome life of it ever since he cannot hear of a quarrel between the most distant of his neighbours but he begins incontinently to fumble with the head of his cudgel and consider whether his interest or honour does not require that he should meddle in the broil indeed he has extended his relations of pride and policy so completely over the whole country that no event can take place without infringing some of his finely spun rights and dignities couched in his little domain with these filaments stretching forth in every direction he is like some choleric bottle-bellied old spider who has woven his web over a whole chamber so that a fly cannot buzz nor a breeze blow without startling his repose and causing him to sally forth wrathfully from his den though really a good-hearted good-tempered old fellow at bottom yet he is singularly fond of being in the midst of contention it is one of his peculiarities however that he only relishes the beginning of an affray he always goes into a fight with alacrity 
but comes out of it grumbling even when victorious and though no one fights with more obstinacy to carry a contested point yet when the battle is over and he comes to the reconciliation he is so much taken up with the mere shaking of hands that he is apt to let his antagonist pocket all that they have been quarrelling about it is not therefore fighting that he ought so much to be on his guard against as making friends it is difficult to cudgel him out of a farthing but put him in a good humour and you may bargain him out of all the money in his pocket he is like a stout ship which will weather the roughest storm uninjured but roll its masts overboard in the succeeding calm he is a little fond of playing the magnifico abroad of pulling out a long purse flinging his money bravely about at boxing matches horse races cock-fights and carrying a high head among gentlemen of fancy but immediately after one of these fits of extravagance he will be taken with violent qualms of economy stop short at the most trivial expenditure talk desperately of being ruined and brought upon the parish and in such moods will not pay the smallest tradesman's bill without violent altercation he is in fact the most punctual and discontented paymaster in the world drawing his coin out of his breeches pocket with infinite reluctance paying to the uttermost farthing but accompanying every guinea with a growl with all his talk of economy however he is a bountiful provider and a hospitable housekeeper his economy is of a whimsical kind its chief object being to devise how he may afford to be extravagant for he will begrudge himself a beefsteak and pint of port one day that he may roast an ox whole broach a hog's head of ale and treat all his neighbours on the next his domestic establishment is enormously expensive not so much from any great outward parade as from the great consumption of solid beef and pudding the vast number of followers he feeds and clothes and his singular disposition to pay hugely for small services he is a most kind and indulgent master and provided his servants humour his peculiarities flatter his vanity a little now and then and do not peculate grossly on him before his face they may manage him to perfection everything that lives on him seems to thrive and grow fat his house servants are well paid and pampered and have little to do his horses are sleek and lazy and prance slowly before his state carriage and his house-dog sleep quietly about the door and will hardly bark at a housebreaker his family mansion is an old castellated manor-house grey with age and of a most venerable though weather-beaten appearance it has been built upon no regular plan but is a vast accumulation of parts erected in various tastes and ages the centre bears evident traces of saxon architecture and is as solid as ponderous stone and old english oak can make it like all the relics of that style it is full of obscure passages intricate mazes and dusky chambers and though these have been partially lighted up in modern days yet there are many places where you must still grope in the dark additions have been made to the original edifice from time to time and great alterations have taken place towers and battlements have been erected during wars and tumults wings built in time of peace and outhouses lodges and offices run up according to the whim or convenience of different generations until it has become one of the most spacious rambling tenements imaginable an entire wing is taken up with a family chapel a reverend pile 
that must have been exceedingly sumptuous and indeed in spite of having been altered and simplified at various periods has still a look of solemn religious pomp its walls within are stored with the monuments of john's ancestors and it is snugly fitted up with soft cushions and well-lined chairs where such of his family as are inclined to church services may doze comfortably in the discharge of their duties to keep up this chapel has cost john much money but he is staunch in his religion and piqued in his zeal from the circumstance that many dissenting chapels have been erected in his vicinity and several of his neighbours with whom he has had quarrels are strong papists to do the duties of the chapel he maintains at a large expense a pious and portly family chaplain he is a most learned and decorous personage and a truly well-bred christian who always backs the old gentleman in his opinions winks discreetly at his little piccadilloes rebukes the children when refractory and is of great use in exhorting the tenants to read their bibles say their prayers and above all to pay their rents punctually and without grumbling the family apartments are in a very antiquated state somewhat heavy and often inconvenient but full of the solemn magnificence of former times fitted up with rich though faded tapestry unwieldy furniture and loads of massy gorgeous old plate the vast fireplaces ample kitchens extensive cellars and sumptuous banqueting halls all speak of the roaring hospitality of the days of yore of which the modern festivity at the manor-house is but a shadow there are however complete suites of rooms apparently deserted and time-worn and towers and turrets that are tottering to decay so that in high winds there is danger of their tumbling about the ears of the household john has frequently been advised to have the old edifice thoroughly overhauled and to have some of the useless parts pulled down and the others strengthened with their materials but the old gentleman always grows testy on this subject he swears the house is an excellent house that it is tight and weatherproof and not to be shaken by tempests that it has stood for several hundred years and therefore is not likely to tumble down now that as to its being inconvenient his family is accustomed to the inconveniences and would not be comfortable without them that as to its unwieldy size and irregular construction these result from its being the growth of centuries and being improved by the wisdom of every generation that an old family like his requires a large house to dwell in new upstart families may live in modern cottages and snug boxes but an old english family should inhabit an old english manor-house if you point out any part of the building as superfluous he insists that it is material to the strength or decoration of the rest and the harmony of the whole and swears that the parts are so built into each other that if you pull down one you run the risk of having the whole about your ears the secret of the matter is that john has a great disposition to protect and patronize he thinks it indispensable to the dignity of an ancient and honourable family to be bounteous in its appointments and to be eaten up by dependents and so partly from pride and partly from kind-heartedness he makes it a rule always to give shelter and maintenance to his superannuated servants the consequence is that like many other venerable family establishments his manor is encumbered by old retainers whom he cannot turn off and an old style which he cannot lay down his mansion is like a great hospital of invalids and with all its magnitude is not a whit too large for its inhabitants 
not a nook or corner but is of use in housing some useless personage groups of veteran beef-eaters gouty pensioners and retired heroes of the buttery and the larder are seen lolling about its walls crawling over its lawns dozing under its trees or sunning themselves upon the benches at its doors every office and outhouse is garrisoned by these supernumeraries and their families for they are amazingly prolific and when they die off are sure to leave john a legacy of hungry mouths to be provided for a mattock cannot be struck against the most mouldering tumble-down tower but out pops from some cranny or loophole the grey pate of some superannuated hanger-on who has lived at john's expense all his life and makes the most grievous outcry at their pulling down the roof from over the head of a worn-out servant of the family this is an appeal that john's honest heart never can withstand so that a man who has faithfully eaten his beef and pudding all his life is sure to be rewarded with a pipe and tankard in his old days a great part of his park also is turned into paddocks where his broken-down chargers are turned loose to graze undisturbed for the remainder of their existence a worthy example of grateful recollection which if some of his neighbours were to imitate would not be to their discredit indeed it is one of the great pleasures to point out these old steeds to his visitors to dwell on their good qualities extol their past services and boast with some little vainglory of the perilous adventures and hardy exploits through which they have carried him he is given however to indulge his veneration for family usages and family encumbrances to a whimsical extent his manner is infested by gangs of gipsies yet he will not suffer them to be driven off because they have invested the place time out of mind and been regular poachers upon every generation of the family he will scarcely permit a dry branch to be lopped from the great trees that surround the house lest it should molest the rooks that have bred there for centuries owls have taken possession of the dovecote but they are hereditary owls and must not be disturbed swallows have neatly choked up every chimney with their nests martins build in every frieze and cornice crows flutter about the towers and perch on every weathercock and old grey-headed rats may be seen in every quarter of the house running in and out of their holes undauntedly in broad daylight in short john has such a reverence for everything that has been long in the family that he will not hear even of abuses being reformed because they are good old family abuses all those whims and habits have concurred woefully to drain the old gentleman's purse and as he prides himself on punctuality in money matters and wishes to maintain his credit in the neighbourhood they have caused him great perplexity in meeting his engagements this too has been increased by the altercations and heart burnings which are continually taking place in his family his children have been brought up to different callings and are of different ways of thinking and as they have always been allowed to speak their minds freely they do not fail to exercise the privilege most clamorously in the present posture of his affairs some stand up for the honour of the race and are clear that the old establishment should be kept up in all its state whatever may be the cost others who are more prudent and considerate entreat the old gentleman to entrench his expenses and to put his whole system of housekeeping on a more moderate footing he has indeed at times seemed inclined to listen to their opinions but their wholesome advice has been completely defeated by the obstreperous conduct of one of his sons this is a noisy rattle-pated fellow 
of rather low habits, who neglects his business to frequent alehouses, is the orator of village clubs, and a complete oracle among the poorest of his father's tenants. No sooner does he hear any of his brothers mention reform or retrenchment than up he jumps, takes the words out of their mouths, and roars out for an overturn. When his tongue is once going, nothing can stop it. He rants about the room, hectors the old man about his spendthrift practices, ridicules his tastes and pursuits, insists that he shall turn the old servants out of doors, give the broken-down horses to the hounds, send the fat chaplain packing, and take a field preacher in his place. Nay, that the whole family mansion shall be levelled with the ground, and a plain one of brick and mortar built in its place. He rails at every social entertainment and family festivity, and skulks away growling to the alehouse whenever an equipage drives up to the door. Though constantly complaining of the emptiness of his purse, yet he scruples not to spend all his pocket money in these tavern convocations, and even runs up scores for the liquor over which he preaches about his father's extravagance. It may readily be imagined how little such thwarting agrees with the old cavalier's fiery temperament. He has become so irritable from repeated crossings that the mere mention of retrenchment or reform is a signal for a brawl between him and the tavern oracle. As the latter is too sturdy and refractory for paternal discipline, having grown out of all fear of the cudgel, they have frequent scenes of wordy warfare, which at times run so high that John is fain to call in the aid of his son Tom, an officer who has served abroad, but is at present living at home on half pay. This last is sure to stand by the old gentleman, right or wrong, likes nothing so much as a racketing, roistering life, and is ready at a wink or nod to out sabre and flourish it over the orator's head if he dares to array himself against paternal authority. These family dissensions, as usual, have got abroad, and are rare food for scandal in John's neighbourhood. People begin to look wise, and shake their heads whenever his affairs are mentioned. They all hope that matters are not so bad with him as represented, but when a man's own children begin to rail at his extravagance, things must be badly managed. They understand he is mortgaged over head and ears, and is continually dabbling with money-lenders. He is certainly an open-handed old gentleman, but they fear he has lived too fast. Indeed, they never knew any good come of this fondness for hunting, racing, reveling, and prize-fighting. In short, Mr. Bull's estate is a very fine one, and has been in the family a long time, but for all that they have known many finer estates come to the hammer. What is worst of all? is the effect which these pecuniary embarrassments and domestic feuds have had on the poor man himself. Instead of that jolly round corporation and smug rosy face which he used to present, he has of late become as shriveled and shrunk as a frost-bitten apple. His scarlet gold-laced waistcoat, which bellied out so bravely in those prosperous days when he sailed before the wind, now hangs loosely about him like a mainsail in a calm. His leather breeches are all in folds and wrinkles, and apparently have much ado to hold up the boots that yawn on both sides of his once sturdy legs. Instead of strutting about as formerly, with his three-cornered hat on one side, flourishing his cudgel, and bringing it down every moment with a hearty thump upon the ground, looking every one sturdily in the face, and trolling out a stave of a catch or a drinking song. 
he now goes about whistling thoughtfully to himself with his head drooping down his cudgel tucked under his arm and his hands thrust to the bottom of his breeches pockets which are evidently empty such is the plight of honest john bull at present yet for all this the old fellow's spirit is as tall and gallant as ever if you drop the least expression of sympathy or concern he takes fire in an instant swears that he is the richest and stoutest fellow in the country talks of laying out large sums to adorn his house or buy another estate and with a valiant swagger and grasping of his cudgel longs exceedingly to have another bout at quarterstaff though there may be something rather whimsical in all this yet i confess i cannot look upon john's situation without strong feelings of interest with all his odd humours and obstinate prejudices he is a sterling-hearted old blade he may not be so wonderfully fine a fellow as he thinks himself but he is at least twice as good as his neighbours represent him his virtues are all his own all plain home-bred and unaffected his very fault smack of the raciness of his good qualities his extravagance savours of his generosity his quarrelsomeness of his courage his credulity of his open faith his vanity of his pride and his bluntness of his sincerity they are all the redundancies of a rich and liberal character he is like his own oak rough without but sound and solid within whose bark abounds with excrescences in proportion to the growth and grandeur of the timber and whose branches make a fearful groaning and murmuring in the least storm from their very magnitude and luxuriance there is something too in the appearance of his old family mansion that is extremely poetical and picturesque and as long as it can be rendered comfortably habitable i should almost tremble to see it meddled with during the present conflict of tastes and opinions some of his advisers are no doubt good architects and might be of service but many i fear are mere levellers who when they had once got to work with their mattocks on this venerable edifice will never stop until they have brought it to the ground and perhaps buried themselves among the ruins all that i wish is that john's present troubles may teach him more prudence in future that he may cease to distress his mind about other people's affairs that he may give up the fruitless attempt to promote the good of his neighbours and the peace and happiness of the world by dint of the cudgel that he may remain quietly at home gradually get his house into repair cultivate his rich estate according to his fancy husband his income if he thinks proper bring his unruly children into order if he can renew the jovial scenes of ancient prosperity and long enjoy on his paternal lands a green and honourable and a merry old age the mutability of literature a colloquy in westminster abbey by washington irving i know that all beneath the moon decays and what by mortals in this world is brought in time's great period shall return to naught i know that all the muses heavenly lays with toil of sprite which are so dearly bought as idle sounds of few or none are sought that there is nothing lighter than mere praise by drummond of hawthornden there are certain half-dreaming moods of mind in which we naturally steal away from noise and glare and seek some quiet haunt where we may indulge our reveries and build our air castles undisturbed in such a mood i was loitering about the old grey cloisters of westminster abbey enjoying that luxury of wandering thought which one is apt to dignify with the name of reflection 
when suddenly an interruption of madcap boys from Westminster School playing at football broke in upon the monastic stillness of the place, making the vaulted passages and mouldering tombs echo with their merriment. I sought to take refuge from their noise by penetrating still deeper into the solitudes of the pile and applied to one of the vergers for admission to the library. He conducted me through a portal rich with the crumbling sculpture of former ages, which opened upon a gloomy passage leading to the chapter house and the chamber in which doomsday book is deposited. Just within the passage is a small door on the left. To this the verger applied a key. It was double-locked and opened with some difficulty, as if seldom used. We now ascended a dark, narrow staircase, and, passing through a second door, entered the library. I found myself in a lofty antique hall, the roof supported by massive joists of old English oak. It was soberly lighted by a row of Gothic windows at a considerable height from the floor, and which apparently opened upon the roofs of the cloisters. An ancient picture of some reverend dignitary of the church in his robes hung over the fireplace. Around the hall and in a small gallery were the books, arranged in carved oaken cases. They consisted principally of old polemical writers, and were much more worn by time than use. In the center of the library was a solitary table with two or three books on it, an inkstand without ink, and a few pens parched by long disuse. The place seemed fitted for quiet study and profound meditation. It was buried deep among the massive walls of the abbey, and shut up from the tumult of the world. I could only hear now and then the shouts of the schoolboys faintly swelling from the cloisters, and the sound of a bell tolling for prayers, echoing soberly along the roofs of the abbeys. By degrees the shouts of merriment grew fainter and fainter, and at length died away. The bell ceased to toll, and a profound silence reigned through the dusky hall. I had taken down a little thick quarto, curiously bound in parchment, with brass clasps, and seated myself at the table in a venerable elbow chair. Instead of reading, however, I was beguiled by the solemn monastic air and lifeless quiet of the place into a train of musing. As I looked around upon the old volumes in their mouldering covers, thus ranged on the shelves, and apparently never disturbed in their repose, I could not but consider the library a kind of literary catacomb, where authors, like mummies, are piously entombed, and left to blacken and moulder in dusty oblivion. How much, thought I, has each of these volumes, now thrust aside with such indifference, cost some aching head, how many weary days, how many sleepless nights, how have their authors buried themselves in the solitude of cells and cloisters, shut themselves up from the face of man, and the still more blessed face of nature, and devoted themselves to painful research and intense reflection, and all for what? To occupy an inch of dusty shelf, to have the title of their works read now and then in a future age by some drowsy churchman or casual straggler like myself, and in another age to be lost even to remembrance. Such is the amount of this boasted immortality, a mere temporary rumour, a local sound, like the tone of that bell which has just tolled among these towers, filling the ear for a moment, lingering transiently in echo, and then passing away like a thing that was not. While I sat half murmuring, half meditating these unprofitable speculations, with my head resting on my hand, 
I was thrumming with the other upon the quarto, until I accidentally loosened the clasps, when, to my utter astonishment, the little book gave two or three yawns, like one awakening from a deep sleep, then a husky, <clears throat> and at length began to talk. At first its voice was very hoarse and broken, being much troubled by a cobweb which some studious spider had woven across it, and having probably contracted a cold from long exposure to the chills and damps of the abbey. In a short time, however, it became more distinct, and I soon found it an exceedingly fluent, conversable little tome. Its language, to be sure, was rather quaint and obsolete, and its pronunciation, what in the present day would be deemed barbarous. But I shall endeavour, as far as I am able, to render it in modern parlance. It began with railings about the neglect of the world, about merit being suffered to languish in obscurity, and other such commonplace topics of literary ripening, and complained bitterly that it had not been opened for more than two centuries, that the dean only looked now and then into the library, sometimes took down a volume or two, trifled with them for a few moments, and then returned them to their shelves. What a plague do they mean, said the little quarto, which I began to perceive was somewhat choleric, what a plague do they mean by keeping several thousand volumes of us shut up here and watched by a set of old vergers, like so many beauties in a harem, merely to be looked at now and then by the dean. Books were written to give pleasure and to be enjoyed, and I would have a rule passed that the dean should pay each of us a visit at least once a year, or if he is not equal to the task, let them once in a while turn loose the whole school of Westminster among us, that at any rate we may now and then have an airing. Softly, my worthy friend, replied I, you are not aware how much better you are off than most books of your generation. By being stored away in this ancient library, you are like the treasured remains of those saints and monarchs which lie enshrined in the adjoining chapels, while the remains of your contemporary mortals left to the ordinary course of nature have long since returned to dust. Sir, said the little tome, ruffling his leaves and looking big, I was written for all the world, not for the bookworms of an abbey. I was intended to circulate from hand to hand, like other great contemporary works, but here have I been clasped up for more than two centuries, and might have silently fallen a prey to those worms that are playing the very vengeance with my intestines, if you had not by chance given me an opportunity of uttering a few last words before I go to pieces. My good friend, rejoined I, had you been left to the circulation of which you speak, you would long ere this have been no more. To judge from your physiognomy, you are now well stricken in years. Very few of your contemporaries can be at present in existence, and those few owe their longevity to being immured like yourself in old libraries, which, suffer me to add, instead of likening to harems, you might more properly and gratefully have compared to those infirmaries attached to religious establishments, for the benefit of the old and decrepit, and where, by quiet fostering and no employment, they often endure to an amazingly good-for-nothing old age. You talk of your contemporaries as if in circulation. Where do we meet with their works? What do we hear of Robert Grotest, of Lincoln? No one could have toiled harder than he for immortality. He is said to have written nearly two hundred volumes. He built, as it were, a pyramid of books to perpetuate his name, but alas, the pyramid has long since fallen, and only a few fragments are scattered in various libraries, where they are scarcely disturbed even by the antiquarian. 
what do we hear of geraldus cambrensis the historian antiquary philosopher theologian and poet he declined two bishoprics that he might shut himself up and write for posterity but posterity never inquires after his labours what of henry of huntington who besides a learned history of england wrote a treatise on the contempt of the world which the world has revenged by forgetting him what is quoted of joseph of exeter styled the miracle of his age in classical composition of his three great heroic poems one is lost forever excepting a mere fragment the others are known only to a few of the curious in literature and as to his love verses and epigrams they have entirely disappeared what is in current use of john wallace the franciscan who acquired the name of the tree of life of william of malmesbury of simeon of durham of benedict of peterborough of john hanville of st albans of pretty friend cried the quarto in a testy tone how old do you think me you are talking of authors that lived long before my time and wrote either in latin or french so that they in a manner expatriated themselves and deserved to be forgotten in latin and french hath many serene rites had great delight to indite and have many noble things fulfilled but certes there been some that speak in their posy in french of which speech the frenchmen have as good a fantasy as we have in hearing of frenchmen's english from chaucer's testament of love and of footnote but i sir was ushered into the world from the press of the renowned winken de word i was written in my own native tongue at a time when the language had become fixed and indeed i was considered a model of pure and elegant english i should observe that these remarks were couched in such intolerably antiquated terms that i have had infinite difficulty in rendering them into modern phraseology i cry your mercy said i for mistaking your age but it matters little almost all the writers of your time have likewise passed into forgetfulness and the words publications are mere literary rarities among book collectors the purity and stability of language too on which you found your claims to perpetuity have been the fallacious dependence of authors of every age even back to the times of the worthy robert of gloucester who wrote his history in rhymes of mongrel saxon footnote holinshed in his chronicle observes afterwards also by diligent travel of geoffrey chaucer and of john gower in the time of richard the second and after them of john scogan and john lydigate monk of berry our said tongue was brought to an excellent pass notwithstanding that it never came into the type of perfection until the time of queen elizabeth wherein john jewel bishop of sorum john fox and sundry learned and excellent writers have fully accomplished the ornature of the same to their great praise and immortal commendation even now many talk of spencer's well of pure english undefiled as if the language ever sprang from a well or fountain-head and was not rather a mere confluence of various tongues perpetually subject to changes and intermixtures it is this which has made english literature so extremely mutable and the reputation built upon it so fleeting unless thought can be committed to something more permanent and unchangeable than such a medium even thought must share the fate of everything else and fall into decay this should serve as a check upon the vanity and exultation of the most popular writer
he finds the language in which he has embarked his fame gradually altering and subject to the dilapidations of time and the caprice of fashion he looks back and beholds the early authors of his country once the favourites of their days supplanted by modern writers a few short ages have covered them with obscurity and their merits can only be relished by the quaint taste of the bookworm and such he anticipates will be the fate of his own work which however it may be admired in its day and held up as a model of purity will in the course of years grow antiquated and obsolete until it shall become almost as unintelligible in its native land as an egyptian obelisk or one of those runic inscriptions said to exist in the deserts of tartary i declare added i with some emotion when i contemplate a modern library filled with new works in all the bravery of rich gilding and binding i feel disposed to sit down and weep like the good xerxes when he surveyed his army pranked out in all the splendour of military array and reflected that in one hundred years not one of them would be in existence ah said the little quarto with a heavy sigh i see how it is these modern scribblers have superseded all the good old authors i suppose nothing is read nowadays but sir philip sydney's arcadia sackville's stately plays and mirror of magistrates or the fine-spun euphuisms of the unparalleled john lyly there you are again mistaken said i the writers whom you suppose in vogue because they happened to be so when you were last in circulation have long since had their day so philip sidney's arcadia the immortality of which was so fondly predicted by his admirers footnote live ever sweet book the simple image of his gentle wit and the golden pillar of his noble courage and ever notify unto the world that thy writer was the secretary of eloquence the breath of the muses the honey-bee of the daintiest flowers of wit and art the pith of moral and intellectual virtues the arm of bellona in the field the tongue of suada in the chamber the sprite of practice in s and the paragon of excellency in print harvey pierce's supererogation and a footnote and which in truth is full of noble thoughts delicate images and graceful turns of language is now scarcely ever mentioned sackville has strutted into obscurity and even lyly though his writings were once the delight of a court and apparently perpetuated by a proverb is now scarcely known even by name a whole crowd of authors who wrote and wrangled at the time have likewise gone down with all their writings and their controversies wave after wave of succeeding literature has rolled over them until they are buried so deep that it is only now and then that some industrious diver after fragments of antiquity brings up a specimen for the gratification of the curious for my part i continued i consider this mutability of language a wise precaution of providence for the benefit of the world at large and of authors in particular to reason from analogy we daily behold the varied and beautiful tribes of vegetables growing up flourishing adorning the fields for a short time and then fading into dust to make way for their successors were not this the case the fecundity of nature would be a grievance instead of a blessing the earth would groan with rank and excessive vegetation and its surface become a tangled wilderness in like manner the works of genius and learning decline and make way for subsequent productions language gradually varies and with it fade away the writings of authors who have flourished their allotted time otherwise the creative powers of genius 
would overstock the world, and the mind would be completely bewildered in the endless mazes of literature. Formerly there were some restraints on this excessive multiplication. Works had to be transcribed by hand, which was a slow and laborious operation. They were written either on parchment, which was expensive, so that one work was often erased to make way for another, or on papyrus, which was fragile and extremely perishable. Authorship was a limited and unprofitable craft, pursued chiefly by monks in the leisure and solitude of their cloisters. The accumulation of manuscripts was slow and costly, confined almost entirely to monasteries. To these circumstances it may, in some measure, be owing that we have not been inundated by the intellect of antiquity, that the fountains of thought have not been broken up, and modern genius drowned in the deluge. But the inventions of paper and the press have put an end to all these restraints. They have made every one a writer, and enabled every mind to put itself into print and diffuse itself over the whole intellectual world. The consequences are alarming. The stream of literature has swollen into a torrent, augmented into a river, expanded into a sea. A few centuries since, five or six hundred manuscripts constituted a great library. But what would you say to libraries such as actually exist, containing three or four hundred thousand volumes? legions of authors at the same time busy, and the press going on with fearful increasing activity to double and quadruple the number, unless some unforeseen mortality should break out among the progeny of the muse, now that she has become so prolific, I tremble for posterity. I fear the mere fluctuation of language will not be sufficient. Criticism may do much, it increases with the increase of literature, and resembles one of those salutary checks on population spoken of by economists. All possible encouragement, therefore, should be given to the growth of critics, good or bad. But I fear all will be in vain. Let criticism do what it may. Writers will write, printers will print, and the world will inevitably be overstocked with good books. It will soon be the employment of a lifetime merely to learn their names. Many a man of passable information at the present day reads scarcely anything but reviews, and before long a man of erudition will be little better than a mere walking catalogue. My very good sir, said the little quarto, yawning most drearily in my face, Excuse my interrupting you, but I perceive you are rather given to prose. I would ask the fate of an author who was making some noise just as I left the world. His reputation, however, was considered quite temporary. The learned shook their heads at him, for he was a poor half-educated varlet that knew little of Latin and nothing of Greek, and had been obliged to run the country for deer-stealing. I think his name was Shakespeare. I presume he soon sunk into oblivion. On the contrary, said I, it is owing to that very man that the literature of his period has experienced a duration beyond the ordinary term of English literature. There rise authors now and then who seem proof against the mutability of language because they have rooted themselves in the unchanging principles of human nature. They are like gigantic trees that we sometimes see on the banks of a stream, which by their vast and deep roots, penetrating through the mere surface and laying hold on the very foundations of the earth, preserve the soil around them from being swept away by the ever-flowing current, and hold up many a neighboring plant and perhaps worthless weed to perpetuity. Such is the case with Shakespeare, whom we behold, defying the encroachments of time, 
retaining in modern use the language and literature of his day and giving duration to many an indifferent author merely for having flourished in his vicinity but even he i grieve to say is gradually assuming the tint of age and his whole form is overrun by a profession of commentators who like clambering vines and creepers almost bury the noble plant that upholds them here the little quarto began to heave his sides and chuckle until at length he broke out into a plethoric fit of laughter that had well nigh choked him by reason of his excessive corpulency mighty well cried he as soon as he could recover breath mighty well and so you would persuade me that the literature of an age is to be perpetuated by a vagabond deer-stealer by a man without learning by a poet forsooth a poet and here he wheezed forth another fit of laughter i confess that i felt somewhat nettled at his rudeness which however i pardoned on account of his having flourished in a less polished age i determined nevertheless not to give up my point yes resumed i positively a poet for of all writers he has the best chance for immortality others may write from the head but he writes from the heart and the heart will always understand him he is the faithful portrayer of nature whose features are always the same and always interesting prose writers are voluminous and unwieldy their pages are crowded with commonplaces and their thoughts expanded into tediousness but with the true poet everything is terse touching or brilliant he gives the choicest thoughts in the choicest language he illustrates them by everything that he sees most striking in nature and art he enriches them by pictures of human life such as it is passing before him his writings therefore contain the spirit the aroma if i may use the phrase of the age in which he lives they are caskets which enclose within a small compass the wealth of the language its family jewels which are thus transmitted in a portable form to posterity the setting may occasionally be antiquated and require now and then to be renewed as in the case of chaucer but the brilliancy and intrinsic value of the gems continue unaltered cast a look back over the long reach of literary history what vast valleys of dullness filled with monkish legends and academical controversies what bogs of theological speculations what dreary wastes of metaphysics here and there only do we behold the heaven illuminated bards elevated like beacons on their wildly separated heights to transmit the pure light of poetical intelligence from age to age footnote throw earth and waters deep the pen by skill doth pass and featly nips the world's abuse and shews us in a glass the virtue and the vice of every right alive the honeycomb that bee doth make is not so sweet in hive as are the golden leaves that drop from the poet's head which doth surmount our common talk as fair as dross doth lid churchyard End of footnote. i was just about to launch forth into eulogiums upon the poets of the day when the sudden opening of the door caused me to turn my head it was the verger who came to inform me that it was time to close the library i sought to have a parting word with the quarto but the worthy little tome was silent the clasps were closed and it looked perfectly unconscious of all that had passed i have been to the library two or three times since and have endeavoured to draw it into further conversations but in vain and whether all this rambling colloquy actually took place or whether it was another of those odd daydreams to which i am subject i have never to this moment been able to discover end of section two
Section 3 of The Oxford Book of American Essays Chosen by Brander Matthews This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 3 Keene's Acting by Richard Henry Dana For, doubtless, that indeed, according to art, is most eloquent, which turns and approaches nearest to nature from whence it came. Milton Professed diversions, cannot these escape? We ransack tombs for pastime from the dust, call up the sleeping hero, bid him tread the scene for our amusement. How like gods we sit, and wrapped in immortality shed generous tears on wretches born to die their fate deploring to forget our own young i had scarcely thought of the theatre for some years when keen arrived in this country and it was more from curiosity than from any other motive that i went to see for the first time the great actor of the age i was soon lost to the recollection of being in a theatre or looking upon a great display of the mimic art the simplicity earnestness and sincerity of his acting made me forgetful of the fiction and bore me away with the power of reality and truth if this be acting said i as i returned home i may as well make the theatre my school and henceforward study nature at second hand how can I describe one who is almost as full of beauties as nature itself, who grows upon us the more we become acquainted with him, and makes us sensible that the first time we saw him in any part, however much he may have moved us, we had but a partial apprehension of the many excellences of his acting. We cease to consider it a mere amusement. It is an intellectual feast and he who goes to it with a disposition and a capacity to relish it will receive from it more nourishment for his mind than he would be likely to do in many other ways in twice the time our faculties are opened and enlivened by it our reflections and recollections are of an elevated kind and the voice which is sounding in our ears long after we have left him creates an inward harmony which is for our good keen in truth stands very much in that relation to other players whom we have seen that shakespeare does to other dramatists one player is called classical another makes fine points here and another there keen makes more fine points than all of them together but in him these are only little prominences showing their bright heads above a beautifully undulated surface a continual change is going on in him partaking of the nature of the varying scenes he is passing through and the many thoughts and feelings which are shifting within him in a clear autumnal day we may see here and there a massed white cloud edged with a blazing brightness against a blue sky and now and then a dark pine swinging its top in the wind with the melancholy sound of the sea but who can note the shifting and untiring play of the leaves of the wood and their passing hues when each seems a living thing full of sensations and happy in its rich attire a sound too of universal harmony is in our ears and a widespread beauty before our eyes which we cannot define yet a joy is in our hearts our delight increases in these day after day the longer we give ourselves to them till at last we become as it were a part of the existence without us so it is with natural characters they grow upon us imperceptibly till we become bound up in them we scarce know when or how so in its degree it will fare with the actor who is deeply filled with nature and is perpetually throwing off her evanescences 
instead of becoming tired of him as we do after a time of others he will go on giving something which will be new to the observing mind and will keep the feelings alive because their action will be natural i have no doubt that excepting those who go to a play as children look into a show-box to admire and exclaim at distorted figures and raw unharmonious colours there is no man of a moderately warm temperament and with a tolerable share of insight into human nature who would not find his interest in keen increasing with a study of him it is very possible that the excitement would lessen but there would be a quieter pleasure instead of it stealing upon him as he became familiar with the character of the acting taken within his range of characters the versatility of his playing is striking he seems not the same being now representing richard and again hamlet but the two characters alone appear before you and as distinct individuals who had never known or heard of each other so does he become the character he is to represent that we have sometimes thought it a reason why he was not universally better liked here in richard and that because the player did not make himself a little more visible he must needs bear a share of our dislike of the cruel king and this may be still more the case as his construction of the character whether right or wrong creates in us an unmixed dislike of richard till the anguish of his mind makes him the object of pity from which time to the close all allow that he plays the part better than any one has done before him in his highest wrought passion when the limbs and muscles are alive and quivering and his gestures hurried and vehement nothing appears ranted or overacted because he makes us feel that with all this there is something still within him struggling for utterance the very breaking and harshness of his voice in these parts help to this impression and make up in a good degree for this defect if it be a defect here though he is on the very verge of truth in his passionate parts he does not fall into extravagance but runs along the dizzy edge of the roaring and beating sea with feet as sure as we walk our parlours we feel that he is safe for some preternatural spirit upholds him as it hurries him onward and while all is uptorn and tossing in the whirl of the passions we see that there is a power and order over the whole a man has feelings sometimes which can only be breathed out there is no utterance for them in words i had hardly written this when the terrible ha with which keen makes lear hail cornwall and regan as they enter in the fourth scene of the second act came to my mind that cry seemed at the time to take me up and sweep me along in its wild swell no description in the world could give a tolerably clear notion of it it must be formed as well as it may be from what is here said of its effect keen's playing is sometimes but the outbreaking of inarticulate sounds the throttled struggle of rage and the choking of grief the broken laugh of extreme suffering when the mind is ready to deliver itself over to an insane joy the utterance of overall love which cannot and would not speak in express words and that of wildering grief which blanks all the faculties of man no other player whom i have heard has attempted these except now and then and should any one have made the trial in the various ways in which keen gives them probably he would have failed keen thrills us with them as if they were wrung from him in his agony they have not the appearance of study or artifice the truth is that the labour of a mind of his genius constitutes its existence and delight it is not like the toil of ordinary men at their 
task work what shows effort in them comes from him with the freedom and force of nature some object to the frequent use of such sounds and to others they are quite shocking but those who permit themselves to consider that there are really violent passions in man's nature and that they utter themselves a little differently from our ordinary feelings understand and feel their language as they speak to us in keen probably no actor has conceived passion with the intenseness and life that he does it seems to enter into him and possess him as evil spirits possessed men of old it is curious to observe how some who have sat very contentedly year after year and called the face-making which they have seen expression and the stage stride dignity and the noisy declamation and all the rhodomontade of acting energy and passion complain that keen is apt to be extravagant when in truth he seems to be little more than a simple personation of the feeling or passion to be expressed at the time it has been so common a saying that lear is the most difficult of characters to personate that we have taken it for granted no man could play it so as to satisfy us perhaps it is the hardest to represent yet the part which has generally been supposed the most difficult the insanity of lear is scarcely more so than that of the choleric old king inefficient rage is almost always ridiculous and an old man with a broken down body and a mind falling in pieces from the violence of its uncontrolled passions is in constant danger of exciting along with our pity a feeling of contempt it is a chance matter to which we may be most moved and this it is which makes the opening of lear so difficult we may as well notice here the objection which some make to the abrupt violence with which keen begins in lear if this be a fault it is shakespeare and not keen who is to blame for no doubt he has conceived it according to his author perhaps however the mistake lies in this case where it does in most others with those who put themselves into the seat of judgment to pass upon great men in most instances shakespeare has given us the gradual growth of a passion with such little accompaniments as agree with it and go to make up the whole man in lear his object being to represent the beginning and course of insanity he has properly enough gone but a little back of it and introduced to us an old man of good feelings enough but one who has lived without any true principle of conduct and whose unruled passions had grown strong with age and were ready upon a disappointment to make shipwreck of an intellect never strong to bring this about he begins with an abruptness rather unusual and the old king rushes in before us with his passions at their height and tearing him like fiends king gives this as soon as the fitting occasion offers itself had he put more of melancholy and depression and less of rage into the character we should have been much puzzled at his so suddenly going mad it would have required the change to have been slower and besides his insanity must have been of another kind it must have been monotonous and complaining instead of continually varying at one time full of grief at another playful and then wild as the winds that roared about him and fiery and sharp as the lightning that shot by him the truth with which he conceived this was not finer than his execution of it not for a moment in his utmost violence did he suffer the imbecility of the old man's anger to touch upon the ludicrous when nothing but the justest conception and feeling of the character could have saved him from it 
It has been said that Lear is a study for one who would make himself acquainted with the workings of an insane mind, and it is hardly less true that the acting of Cain was an embodying of these workings. His eye, when his senses are first forsaking him, giving an inquiring look at what he saw, as if all before him was undergoing a strange and bewildering change which confused his brain, the wandering, lost motions of his hands, which seemed feeling for something familiar to them, on which they might take hold and be assured of a safe reality, the under-monotone of his voice, as if he was questioning his own being, and what surrounded him, the continuous but slight oscillating motion of the body, all these expressed with fearful truth the bewildered state of a mind fast unsettling, and making vain and weak efforts to find its way back to its wanted reason. There was a childish, feeble gladness in the eye, and a half-piteous smile about the mouth at times, which one could scarce look upon without tears. As the derangement increased upon him, his eye lost its notice of objects about him, wandering over things as if he saw them not, and fastening upon the creatures of his crazed brain. The helpless and delighted fondness with which he clings to Edgar as an insane brother is another instance of the justness of Keane's conceptions. Nor does he lose the air of insanity even in the fine moralizing parts, and where he inveighs against the corruptions of the world. There is a madness even in his reason. The violent and immediate changes of the passions in Lear, so difficult to manage without jarring upon us, are given by Keen with a spirit and with a fitness to nature which we had hardly thought possible. These are equally well done both before and after the loss of reason. The most difficult scene in this respect is the last interview between Lear and his daughters, Goneril and Regan, and how wonderfully does Keane carry it through. The scene which ends with the horrid shout and cry with which he runs out mad from their presence, as if the very brain had taken fire. The last scene which we are allowed to have of Shakespeare's Lear for the simply pathetic was played by Keen with unmatched power. We sink down, helpless under the oppressive grief. It lies like a dead weight upon our hearts. We are denied even the relief of tears, and are thankful for the shudder that seizes us when he kneels to his daughter in the deploring weakness of his crazed grief. It is lamentable that Keane should not be allowed to show his unequalled powers in the last scene of Lear, as Shakespeare wrote it, and that this mighty work of genius should be profaned by the miserable, mawkish sort of by-play of Edgar's and Cordelia's loves. Nothing can surpass the impertinence of the man who made the change, but the folly of those who sanctioned it. When I began, I had no other intention than that of giving a few general impressions made upon me by Keane's acting, but, falling accidentally upon his leer, I have been led unawares into particulars. It is only to take these as some of the instances of his powers in Lear, and then to think of him as not inferior in his other characters, and some notion may be formed of the effect of Keane's playing upon those who understand and like him. Neither this nor anything I might add would be likely to reach his great and various powers. If it could be said of anyone, it might be said of Keane that he does not fall behind his author, but stands forward, the living representative of the character he has drawn. When he is not playing in Shakespeare, he fills up where his author is wanting, and when in Shakespeare he gives not only what is set down, but whatever the situation and circumstances attendant upon the being he personates, 
would naturally call forth. He seems at times to have possessed himself of Shakespeare's imagination, and to have given it body and form. Read any scene in Shakespeare, for instance, the last of Lear that is played, and see how few words are there set down and then remember how keen fills out with varied and multiplied expression and circumstances and the truth of this remark will be obvious enough there are few men i believe let them have studied the plays of shakespeare ever so attentively who can see keen in them without confessing that he has helped them to a truer and fuller conception of the author notwithstanding what their own labours had done for them. It is not easy to say in what character Keane plays best. He so fits himself to each in turn that if the effect he produces at one time is less than at another, it is because of some inferiority in stage effect in the character. Othello is probably the character best adapted to stage effect, and Keane has an uninterrupted power over us in playing it. When he commands, we are awed. When his face is sensitive with love, and love thrills in his soft tones, all that our imaginations had pictured to us is realized. His jealousy, his hate, his fixed purposes are terrific and deadly, and the groans wrung from him in his grief have the pathos and anguish of esau's when he stood before his old blind father and sent up an exceeding bitter cry again in richard how does he hurry forward to his object sweeping away all between him and it the world and its affairs are nothing to him till he gains his end he is all life and action and haste he fills every part of the stage, and seems to do all that is done. I have said before that his voice is harsh and breaking in its high tones, in his rage, but that this defect is of little consequence in such places, nor is it well suited to the more declamatory parts. This again is scarce worth considering, for how very little is there of mere declamation in good English plays, but it is one of the finest voices in the world for all the passions and feelings which can be uttered in the middle and lower tones, in Lear. If you have poison for me, I will drink it, and again, you do me wrong to take me out of the grave, thou art a soul in bliss. Why should I cite passages? Can any man open upon the scene in which these are contained without Keane's piteous looks and tones being present to him? And does not the mere resemblance of them as he reads bring tears into his eyes yet once more in Othello? Had it pleased heaven to try me with affliction, etc., in the passage beginning with, Oh, now forever, farewell the tranquil mind there was a mysterious confluence of sounds passing off into infinite distance and every thought and feeling within him seemed travelling with them how graceful he is in othello it is not a practised educated grace but the unbought grace of his genius uttering itself in its beauty and grandeur in the movements of the outward man when he says to Iago so touchingly, Leave me, leave me, Iago, and turning from him, walks to the back of the stage, raising his hands and bringing them down upon his head with clasped fingers, and stands thus with his back to us, there is a grace and majesty in his figure which we look on with admiration. Talking of these things in Keene is something like reading the beauties of Shakespeare, for he is as true in the subordinate as in the great parts, but he must be content to share with other men of genius, and think himself fortunate if one in a hundred sees his lesser beauties and marks the truth and delicacy of his underplaying. For instance, 
when he has no share in the action going on, he is not busy in putting himself into attitudes to draw attention, but stands or sits in a simple posture, like one with an engaged mind. His countenance, too, is in a state of ordinary repose, with but a slight general expression of the character of his thoughts. For this is all the face shows, when the mind is taken up in silence with its own reflections. It does not assume marked or violent expressions, as in soliloquy, when a man gives utterance to his thoughts, though alone, the charmed rest of the body is broken. He speaks in his gestures, too, and the countenance is put into a sympathizing action. I was first struck with this in his Hamlet, for the deep and quiet interest so marked in Hamlet made the justness of Keane's playing in this respect the more obvious, and since then I have observed him attentively and have found the same true acting in his other characters. This right conception of situation and its general effect seems to require almost as much genius as his conceptions of his characters, and indeed may be considered as one with them. He deserves praise for it, for there is, for there is so much of the subtlety of nature in it, if one may speak so, that while a few are able, with his help, to put themselves into the situation and perceive the justness of his acting in it, the rest, both those who like him upon the whole as well as those who profess to see little in him, will be apt to let it pass by without observing it. Like most men, however, Keane receives a partial reward at least for his sacrifice of the praise of the many to what he feels to be the truth for when he passes from the state of natural repose even into that of general motion and ordinary discourse, he is immediately filled with a spirit and life which he makes every one feel who is not armor-proof against him. This helps to the sparkling brightness and warmth of his playing, the grand secret of which, like that of colors in a picture, lies in a just contrast. We can all speculate concerning the general rules upon this, but when the man of genius gives us their results, how few are there who can trace them out with an observant eye, or look with a discerning satisfaction upon the great whole? Perhaps this very beauty in Keen has helped to an opinion, which no doubt is true, that he is at times too sharp and abrupt. I well remember, while once looking at a picture in which the shadow of a mountain fell in strong outline upon a part of a stream. I overheard some quite sensible people expressing their wonder that the artist should have made the water of two colors, seeing it was all one and the same thing. Instances of Keane's keeping of situations were striking in the opening of the trial scene in The Iron Chest and in Hamlet, when the father's ghost tells the story of his death. The composure to which he is bent up in the former must be present with all who saw him, and, though from the immediate purpose shall I pass by the startling and appalling change when madness seized upon his brain with the swiftness and power of a fanged monster. Wonderfully, as this last part was played, we cannot well imagine how much the previous calm and the suddenness of the unlooked-for change from it added to the terror of the scene. The temple stood fixed on its foundations. The earthquake shook it, and it was a heap. Is this one of Keane's violent contrasts? While Keane listened in Hamlet to the father's story, the entire man was absorbed in deep attention mingled with a tempered awe. His posture was simple, with a slight inclination forward. The spirit was the spirit of his father, whom he had loved and reverenced, and who was to that moment ever present in his thoughts. The first superstitious terror at meeting him had passed off. 
the account of his father's appearance given him by horatio and the watch and his having followed him some distance had in a degree familiarized him to the sight and he stood before us in the stillness of one who was to hear then or never what was to be told but without that eager reaching forward which other players give and which would be right perhaps in any character but that of hamlet who connects the past and what is to come with the present and mingles reflection with his immediate feelings however deep for an instance of keen's familiar and if i may be allowed to term domestic acting the first scene in the fourth act of his sir giles overreach may be taken his manner at meeting lovell and through the conversation with him the way in which he turns his chair and leans upon it were as easy and natural as they could have been in real life had sir giles been actually existing and engaged at that moment in conversation in lovell's room it is in these things scarcely less than in the more prominent parts of his playing that keen shows himself the great actor he must always make a deep impression but to suppose the world at large capable of a right estimate of his different powers would be forming a judgment against everyday proof the gradual manner in which the character of his playing has opened upon me satisfies me that in acting as in everything else however deep may be the first effect of genius upon us we come slowly and through study to a perception of its minute beauties and delicate characteristics after all the greater part of men seldom get beyond the first general impression as there must needs go a modicum of fault-finding along with commendation it may be well to remark that keen plays his hands too much at times and moves about the dress over his breast and neck too frequently in his hurried and impatient passages and that he does not always adhere with sufficient accuracy to the received readings of shakespeare and that the effect would be greater upon the whole were he to be more sparing of sudden changes from violent voice and gesticulation to a low conversation tone and subdued manner his frequent use of these in sir giles overreach is with good effect for sir giles is playing his part so too in lear for lear's passions are gusty and shifting but in the main it is a kind of playing too marked and striking to bear so frequent repetition and had better sometimes be spared where considered alone it might be properly enough used for the sake of bringing it in at some other place with greater effect it is well to speak of these defects for though the little faults of genius in themselves considered but slightly affect those who can enter into its true character yet such are made impatient at the thought that an opportunity is given those to carp who know not how to command though i have taken up a good deal of room i must end without speaking of many things which occur to me some will be of the opinion that i have already said enough thinking of keen as i do i could not honestly have said less or i hold it to be a low and wicked thing to keep back from merit of any kind its due and with steel that there is something wonderful in the narrowness of those minds which can be pleased and be barren of bounty to those who please them although the self-important out of self-concern give praise sparingly and the main measure there is by their likings or dislikings of a man and the good even are often slow to allow the talents of the faulty their due lest they bring the evil to repute yet it is the wiser as well as the honester 
course not to disparage an excellence because it neighbors upon a fault or to take away from another what is his right with a view to our own name nor to rest our character for discernment upon the promptings of an unkind heart where god has not feared to bestow great powers we may not fear giving them their due nor need we be parsimonious of commendation as if there were but a certain quantity for distribution and our liberality would be to our loss nor should we hold it safe to detract from another's merit as if we could always keep the world blind lest we live to see him whom we disparaged praised and whom we hated loved whatever be his failings give every man a full and ready commendation for that in which he excels it will do good to our own hearts while it cheers his nor will it bring our judgment into question with the discerning for enthusiasm for what is great does not argue such an unhappy want of discrimination as that measured and cold approval which is bestowed alike upon men of mediocrity and upon those of gifted minds gifts by ralph waldo emerson gifts of one who loved me twas high time they came when he ceased to love me time they stopped for shame it is said that the world is in a state of bankruptcy that the world owes the world more than the world can pay and ought to go into chancery and be sold i do not think this general insolvency which involves in some sort all the population to be the reason of the difficulty experienced at christmas and new year and other times in bestowing gifts since it is always so pleasant to be generous though very vexatious to pay debts but the impediment lies in the choosing if at any time it comes into my head that a present is due from me to somebody i am puzzled what to give until the opportunity is gone flowers and fruits are always fit presents flowers because they are a proud assertion that a ray of beauty outvalues all the utilities of the world these gay natures contrast with the somewhat stern countenance of ordinary nature they are like music heard out of a workhouse nature does not cocker us we are children not pets she is not fond everything is dealt to us without fear or favor after severe universal laws yet these delicate flowers look like the frolic and interference of love and beauty men used to tell us that we love flattery even though we are not deceived by it because it shows that we are of importance enough to be courted something like that pleasure the flowers give us what am i to whom these sweet hints are addressed fruits are acceptable gifts because they are the flower of commodities and admit of fantastic values being attached to them if a man should send to me to come a hundred miles to visit him and should set before me a basket of fine summer fruit i should think there was some proportion between the labor and the reward for common gifts necessity makes pertinences and beauty every day and one is glad when an imperative leaves him no option since if the man at the door have no shoes you have not to consider whether you could procure him a paint-box and as it is always pleasing to see a man eat bread or drink water in the house or out of doors so it is always a great satisfaction to supply these first wants necessity does everything well in our condition of universal dependence it seems heroic to let the petitioner be the judge of his necessity and to give all that is asked though at great inconvenience 
if it be a fantastic desire it is better to leave to others the office of punishing him i can think of many parts i should prefer playing to that of the furies next to things of necessity the rule for a gift which one of my friends prescribed is that we might convey to some person that which properly belonged to his character and was easily associated with him in thought but our tokens of compliment and love are for the most part barbarous rings and other jewels are not gifts but apologies for gifts the only gift is a portion of thyself thou must bleed for me therefore the poet brings his poem the shepherd his lamb the farmer corn the miner a gem the sailor coral and shells the painter his picture the girl a handkerchief of her own sewing this is right and pleasing for it restores society in so far to the primary basis when a man's biography is conveyed in his gift and every man's wealth is an index of his merit but it is a cold lifeless business when you go to the shops to buy me something which does not represent your life and talent but a goldsmith's this is fit for kings and rich men who represent kings and a false state of property to make presents of gold and silver stuffs as a kind of symbolical sin offering or payment of blackmail the law of benefits is a difficult challenge which requires careful sailing or rude boats it is not the office of a man to receive gifts how dare you give them we wish to be self-sustained we do not quite forgive a giver the hand that feeds us is in some danger of being bitten we can receive anything from love for that is a way of receiving it from ourselves but not from any one who assumes to bestow we sometimes hate the meat which we eat because there seems something of degrading dependence in living by it brother if jove to thee a present make take heed that from his hands thou nothing take we ask the whole nothing less will content us we arraign society if it do not give us besides earth and fire and water opportunity love reverence and objects of veneration he is a good man who can receive a gift well we are either glad or sorry at the gift and both emotions are unbecoming some violence i think is done some degradation born when i rejoice or grieve at a gift i am sorry when my independence is invaded or when a gift comes from such as do not know my spirit and so the act is not supported and if the gift pleases me overmuch then i should be ashamed that the donor should read my heart and see that i love his commodity and not him the gift to be true must be the flowing of the giver unto me correspondent to my flowing unto him when the waters are at level then my goods pass to him and his to me all his are mine all mine his i say to him how can you give me this pot of oil or this flagon of wine when your own oil and wine is mine which belief of mine this gift seems to deny hence the fitness of beautiful not useful things for gifts this giving is flat usurpation and therefore when the beneficiary is ungrateful as all beneficiaries hate all timons not at all considering the value of the gift but looking back to the greater store it was taken from i rather sympathize with the beneficiary than with the anger of my lord timon for the expectation of gratitude is mean and is continually punished by the total insensibility of the obliged person it is a great happiness to get off without injury and heart burning from one who has had the ill luck to be served by you it is a very onerous business this of being served and the debtor naturally wishes to give you a slap 
a golden text for these gentlemen is that which i do admire in the buddhist who never thanks and who says do not flatter your benefactors the reason for these discords i conceive to be that there is no commensurability between a man and any gift you cannot give anything to a magnanimous person after you have served him he at once puts you in debt by his magnanimity the service a man renders his friend is trivial and selfish compared with the service he knows his friend stood in readiness to yield him alike before he had begun to serve his friend and now also compared with that good will i bear my friend the benefit it is in my power to render him seems small besides our action on each other good as well as evil is so incidental and at random that we can seldom hear the acknowledgments of any person who would thank us for a benefit without some shame and humiliation we can rarely strike a direct stroke but must be content with an oblique one we seldom have the satisfaction of yielding a direct benefit which is directly received but rectitude scatters favors on every side without knowing it and receives with wonder the thanks of all people i fear to breathe any treason against the majesty of love which is the genius and god of gifts and to whom we must not affect to prescribe let him give kingdoms or flower leaves indifferently there are persons from whom we always expect fairy tokens let us not cease to expect them this is prerogative and not to be limited by our municipal rules for the rest i like to see that we cannot be bought and sold the best of hospitality and of generosity is also not in the will but in fate i find that i am not much to you you do not need me you do not feel me then am i thrust out of doors though you proffer me house and lands no services are of any value just only likeness when i have attempted to join myself to others by services it proved an intellectual trick no more they eat your service like apples and leave you out but love them and they feel you and delight in you all the time uses of great men by ralph waldo emerson it is natural to believe in great men if the companions of our childhood should turn out to be heroes and their condition regal it would not surprise us all mythology opens with demigods and the circumstance is high and poetic that is their genius is paramount in the legends of guatama the first men ate the earth and found it deliciously sweet nature seems to exist for the excellent the world is upheld by the veracity of good men they make the earth wholesome they who lived with them found life glad and nutritious life is sweet and tolerable only in our belief in such society and actually or ideally we manage to live with superiors we call our children and our lands by their names their names are wrought into the verbs of language their works and effigies are in our houses and every circumstance of the day recalls an anecdote of them the search after the great is the dream of youth and the most serious occupation of manhood we travel into foreign parts to find his works if possible to get a glimpse of him but we are put off with fortune instead you say the english are practical the germans are hospitable in valencia the climate is delicious and in the hills of the sacramento there is gold for the gathering yes but i do not travel to find comfortable rich and hospitable people or clear sky or ingots 
that cost too much. But if there were any magnet that would point to the countries and houses where are the persons who are intrinsically rich and powerful, I would sell all and buy it and put myself on the road today. The race goes with us on their credit. The knowledge that in the city is a man who invented the railroad raises the credit of all the citizens. But enormous populations, if they be beggars, are disgusting, like moving cheese, like hills of ants or of fleas, the more the worse. Our religion is the love and cherishing of these patrons. The gods of fable are the shining moments of great men. We run all our vessels into one mould. Our colossal theologies of Judaism, Christism, Buddhism, Mohammedism are the necessary and structural action of the human mind. The student of history is like a man going into a warehouse to buy clothes or carpets. He fancies he has a new article. If he go to the factory, he shall find that his new stuff still repeats the scrolls and rosettes which are found on the interior walls of the pyramids of Thebes. Our theism is the purification of the human mind. Man can paint or make or think nothing but man. He believes that the great material elements had their origin from his thought, and our philosophy finds one essence collected or distributed. If now we proceed to inquire into the kinds of service we derive from others, let us be warned of the danger of modern studies and begin low enough. We must not contend against love or deny the substantial existence of other people. I know not what would happen to us. We have social strengths. Our affection towards others creates a sort of vantage or purchase which nothing will supply. I can do that by another which I cannot do alone. I can say to you what I cannot first say to myself. Other men are lenses through which we read our own minds. Each man seeks those of different quality from his own, and such as are good of their kind, that is, he seeks other men and the other rest. The stronger the nature, the more it is reactive. Let us have the quality pure. A little genius let us leave alone. A main difference betwixt men is whether they attend their own affair or not. Man is that noble endogenous plant which grows like the palm from within outward. His own affair, though impossible to others, he can open with celerity and in sport. It is easy to sugar to be sweet and to nitre to be salt. We take a great deal of pains to waylay and entrap that which of itself will fall into our hands. I count him a great man who inhabits a higher sphere of thought into which other men rise with labor and difficulty. He has but to open his eyes to see things in a true light and in large relations whilst they must make painful corrections and keep a vigilant eye on many sources of error. His service to us is of like sort. It costs a beautiful person no exertion to paint her image on our eyes, yet how splendid is that benefit! It costs no more for a wise soul to convey his quality to other men. And every one can do his best thing easiest. Peu de moyens, beaucoup de fait. He is great who is what he is from nature, and who never reminds us of others. But he must be related to us, and our life receive from him some promise of explanation. I cannot tell what I would know, but I have observed there are persons who, in their character and actions, answer questions which I have not skill to put. One man answers some questions which none of his contemporaries put, and is isolated. 
the past and passing religions and philosophies answer some other questions certain men affect us as rich possibilities but helpless to themselves and to their times the sport perhaps of some instinct that rules in the air they do not speak to our want but the great are near we know them at sight they satisfy expectation and fall into place what is good is effective generative makes for itself room food and allies a sound apple produces seed a hybrid does not is a man in his place he is constructive fertile magnetic inundating armies with his purpose which is thus executed the river makes its own shores and each legitimate idea makes its own channels and welcome harvests for food institutions for expression weapons to fight with and disciples to explain it the true artist has the planet for his pedestal the adventurer after years of strife has nothing broader than his own shoes our common discourse respects two kinds of use or service from superior men direct giving is agreeable to the early belief of men direct giving of material or metaphysical aid as of health eternal youth fine senses arts of healing magical power and prophecy the boy believes there is a teacher who can sell him wisdom churches believe in imputed merit but in strictness we are not much cognizant of direct serving man is endogenous and education is his unfolding the aid we have from others is mechanical compared with the discoveries of nature in us what is thus learned is delightful in the doing and the effect remains right ethics are central and go from the soul outward gift is contrary to the law of the universe serving others is serving us i must absolve me to myself mind thy affair says the spirit coxcomb would you meddle with the skies or with other people indirect service is left men have a pictorial or representative quality and serve us in the intellect Bayman and swedenborg saw that things were representative men are also representative first of things and secondly of ideas as plants convert the materials into food for animals so each man converts some raw material in nature to human use the inventors of fire electricity magnetism iron lead glass linen silk cotton the makers of tools the inventor of decimal notation the geometer the engineer the musician severally make an easy way for all through unknown and impossible confusions each man is by secret liking connected with some district of nature whose agent and interpreter he is as linnaeus of plants huber of bees fries of lichens van mons of pears dalton of atomic forms euclid of lines newton of fluxions a man is a centre for nature running out threads of relation through everything fluid and solid material and elemental the earth rolls every clod and stone comes to the meridian so every organ function acid crystal grain of dust has its relation to the brain it waits long but its turn comes each plant has its parasite and each created thing its lover and poet justice has already been done to stream to iron to wood to coal to lodestone to iodine to corn and cotton but how few materials are yet used by our arts the mass of creatures and of qualities are still hid and expectant it would seem as if each waited 
like the enchanted princess in fairy tales for a destined human deliverer each must be disenchanted and walk forth to the day in human shape in the history of discovery the ripe and latent truth seems to have fashioned a brain for itself a magnet must be made man in some gilbert or swedenborg or orsted before the general mind can come to entertain its powers if we limit ourselves to the first advantages a sober grace adheres to the mineral and botanic kingdoms which in the highest moments comes up as the charm of nature the glitter of the spar the sureness of affinity the veracity of angles light and darkness heat and cold hunger and food sweet and sour solid liquid and gas circle us round in a wreath of pleasures and by their agreeable quarrel beguile the day of life the eye repeats every day the first eulogy on things he saw that they were good we know where to find them and these performers are relished all the more after a little experience of the pretending races we are entitled also to higher advantages something is wanting to science until it has been humanized the table of logarithms is one thing and its vital play in botany music optics and architecture another there are advancements to numbers anatomy architecture astronomy little suspected at first when by union with intellect and will they ascend into the life and reappear in conversation character and politics but this comes later we speak now only of our acquaintance with them in their own sphere and the way in which they seem to fascinate and draw to them some genius who occupies himself with one thing all his life long the possibility of interpretation lies in the identity of the observer with the observed each material thing has its celestial side has its translation through humanity into the spiritual and necessary sphere where it plays a part as indestructible as any other and to these their ends all things continually ascend the gases gather to the solid firmament the chemic lump arrives at the plant and grows arrives at the quadruped and walks arrives at the man and thinks but also the constituency determines the vote of the representative he is not only representative but participant like can only be known by like the reason why he knows about them is that he is of them he has just come out of nature or from being a part of that thing animated chlorine knows of chlorine and incarnate zinc of zinc their quality makes his career and he can variously publish their virtues because they compose him man made of the dust of the world does not forget his origin and all that is yet inanimate will one day speak and reason unpublished nature will have its whole secret told shall we say that quartz mountains will pulverize into innumerable verners von buchs and beaumonts and the laboratory of the atmosphere holds in solution i know not what burza loses and davies end of section three Section 4 of The Oxford Book of American Essays, chosen by Brander Matthews. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 4 Thus we sit by the fire and take hold on the poles of the earth. This quasi-omnipresence supplies the imbecility of our condition. 
in one of those celestial days when heaven and earth meet and adorn each other it seems a poverty that we can only spend it once we wish for a thousand heads a thousand bodies that we might celebrate its immense beauty in many ways and places is this fancy well in good faith we are multiplied by our proxies how easily we adopt their labors every ship that comes to america got its chart from columbus every novel is a debtor to homer every carpenter who shaves with a foreplane borrows the genius of a forgotten inventor life is girt all round with the zodiac of sciences and contributions of men who have perished to add their point of light to our sky engineer broker jurist physician moralist theologian and every man in as much as he has any science is a definer and map maker of the latitudes and longitudes of our condition these road makers on every hand enrich us we must extend the area of life and multiply our relations we are as much gainers by finding a new property in the old earth as by acquiring a new planet we are too passive in the reception of these material or semi-material aids we must not be sacks and stomachs to ascend one step we are better served through our sympathy activity is contagious looking where others look and conversing with the same things we catch the charm which lured them napoleon said you must not fight too often with one enemy or you will teach him all your art of war talk much with any man of vigorous mind and we acquire very fast the habit of looking at things in the same light and on each occurrence we anticipate his thought men are helpful through the intellect and the affections other help i find a false appearance if you affect to give me bread and fire i perceive that i pay for it the full price and at last it leaves me as it found me neither better nor worse but all mental and moral force is a positive good it goes out from you whether you will or not and profits me whom you never thought of i cannot even hear of personal vigor of any kind great power of performance without fresh resolution we are emulous of all that man can do cecil's saying of sir walter raleigh i know that he can toil terribly is an electric touch so are clarendon's portraits of hampton who was of an industry and vigilance not to be tired out or wearied by the most laborious and of parts not to be imposed on by the most subtle and sharp and of a personal courage equal to his best parts of falkland who was so severe an adorer of truth that he could as easily have given himself leave to steal as to dissemble we cannot read plutarch without a tingling of the blood and i accept the saying of the chinese mencius a sage is the instructor of a hundred ages when the manners of lu are heard of the stupid become intelligent and the wavering determined this is the moral of biography yet it is hard for departed men to touch the quick like our own companions whose names may not last as long what is he whom i never think of whilst in every solitude are those who succour our genius and stimulate us in wonderful manners there is a power in love to divine another's destiny better than that other can and by heroic encouragements hold him to his task what has friendship so signal as its sublime attraction to whatever virtue is in us we will never more think cheaply of ourselves or of life we are piqued 
to some purpose, and the industry of the diggers on the railroad will not again shame us. Under this head, too, falls that homage, very pure, as I think, which all ranks pay to the hero of the day, from Coriolanus and Gracchus down to Pitt, Lafayette, Wellington, Webster, Lamartine. Hear the shouts in the street. The people cannot see him enough. They delight in a man. Here is a head and a trunk. What a front! What eyes! Atlantean shoulders, and the whole carriage heroic, with equal inward force to guide the great machine. This pleasure of full expression to that which, in their private experience, is usually cramped and obstructed, runs also much higher, and is the secret of the reader's joy in literary genius. Nothing is kept back. There is fire enough to fuse the mountain of ore. Shakespeare's principal merit may be conveyed in saying that he, of all men, best understands the English language, and can say what he will. Yet these unchoked channels and floodgates of expression are only health or fortunate constitution. Shakespeare's name suggests other and purely intellectual benefits. Senates and sovereigns have no complement with their medals, swords, and armorial coats like the addressing to a human being thoughts out of a certain height and presupposing his intelligence. This honor, which is possible in personal intercourse, scarcely twice in a lifetime, genius perpetually pays. Contented, if now and then, in a century, the proffer is accepted. The indicators of the values of matter are degraded into a sort of cooks and confectioners on the appearance of the indicators of ideas. Genius is the naturalist or geographer of the supersensible regions and draws their map, and by acquainting us with new fields of activity cools our affection for the old. These are at once accepted as the reality of which the world we have conversed with is the show. We go to the gymnasium and the swimming school to see the power and beauty of the body. There is the like pleasure and higher benefit from witnessing intellectual feats of all kinds, as feats of memory, of mathematical combination, great power of abstraction, the transmutings of the imagination, even versatility and concentration, as these acts expose the invisible organs and members of the mind, which respond, member for member, to the parts of the body. For we thus enter a new gymnasium, and learn to choose men by their truest marks, taught with Plato, to choose those who can, without aid, from the eyes or any other sense, proceed to truth and to being. Foremost among these activities are the somersaults, spells, and resurrections wrought by the imagination. When this wakes, a man seems to multiply ten times or a thousand times his force. It opens the delicious sense of indeterminate size, and inspires an audacious mental habit. We are as elastic as the gas of gunpowder, and a sentence in a book or a word dropped in conversation, sets free our fancy, and instantly our heads are bathed with galaxies, and our feet tread the floor of the pit. And this benefit is real, because we are entitled to these enlargements, and, once having passed the bounds, shall never again be quite the miserable pedants we were. The high functions of the intellect are so allied that some imaginative power usually appears in all eminent minds, even in arithmeticians of the first class, but especially in meditative men of an intuitive habit of thought. This class serves us 
so that they have the perception of identity and perception of reaction. The eyes of Plato, Shakespeare, Swedenborg, Goethe, never shut on either of these laws. The perception of these laws is a kind of meter of the mind. Little minds are little through failure to see them. Even these feats have their surfeit. Our delight in reason degenerates into idolatry of the herald, especially when a mind of powerful method has instructed men we find the examples of oppression. The dominion of Aristotle, the Ptolemaic astronomy, the credit of Luther, of Bacon, of Locke, in religion the history of hierarchies, of saints, and the sects which have taken the name of each founder are in point. Alas, every man is such a victim. The imbecility of men is always inviting the impudence of power. It is the delight of vulgar talent to dazzle and to blind the beholder, but true genius seeks to defend us from itself. True genius will not impoverish, but will liberate and add new senses. If a wise man should appear in our village, he would create, in those who conversed with him, a new consciousness of wealth by opening their eyes to unobserved advantages. He would establish a sense of immovable equality, calm us with assurances that we could not be cheated, as every one would discern the checks and guarantees of condition. The rich would see their mistakes and poverty, the poor their escapes and their resources. But nature brings all this about in due time. Rotation is her remedy. The soul is impatient of masters and eager for change. Housekeepers say of a domestic who has been valuable, she has lived with me long enough. We are tendencies, or rather symptoms, and none of us complete. We touch and go and sip the foam of many lives. Rotation is the law of nature. When nature removes a great man, people explore the horizon for a successor. But none comes and none will. His class is extinguished with him. In some other and quite different field, the next man will appear. Not Jefferson, not Franklin, but now a great salesman, then a road contractor, then a student of fishes, then a buffalo hunting explorer or a semi-savage western general. Thus we make a stand against our rougher masters, but against the best there is a finer remedy. The power which they communicate is not theirs. When we are exalted by ideas, we do not owe this to Plato, but to the idea to which also Plato was debtor. I must not forget that we have a special debt to a single class. Life is a scale of degrees. Between rank and rank of our great men are wide intervals. Mankind have, in all ages, attached themselves to a few persons who, either by the quality of that idea they embodied, or by the largeness of their reception, were entitled to the position of leaders and law-givers. These teach us the qualities of primary nature, admit us to the constitution of things. We swim day by day on a river of delusions, and are effectually amused with houses and towns in the air of which the men about us are dupes. But life is a sincerity. In lucid intervals we say, let there be an entrance opened for me into realities. I have worn the fool's cap too long. We will know the meaning of our economies and politics. Give us the cipher, and if persons and things are scores of a celestial music, let us read off the strains. We have been cheated of our reason. Yet there have been sane men who enjoyed a rich and related existence. 
what they know they know for us with each new mind a new secret of nature transpires nor can the bible be closed until the last great man is born these men correct the delirium of the animal spirits make us considerate and engage us to new aims and powers the veneration of mankind selects these for the highest place witness the multitude of statues pictures and memorials which recall their genius in every city village house and ship ever their phantoms arise before us our loftier brothers but one in blood at bed and table they lord it over us with looks of beauty and words of good how to illustrate the distinctive benefit of ideas the service rendered by those who introduce moral truths into the general mind i am plagued in all my living with a perpetual tariff of prices if i work in my garden and prune an apple tree i am well enough entertained and could continue indefinitely in the like occupation but it comes to mind that a day is gone and i have got this precious nothing done i go to boston or new york and run up and down on my affairs they are sped but so is the day i am vexed by the recollection of this price i have paid for a trifling advantage i remember the podin on which whoso sat should have his desire but a piece of the skin was gone for every wish i go to a convention of philanthropists do what i can i cannot keep my eyes off the clock but if there should appear in the company some gentle soul who knows little of persons or parties of carolina or cuba but who announces a law that disposes these particulars and so certifies me of the equity which checkmates every false player bankrupts every self-seeker and apprises me of my independence on any condition of country or time or human body that man liberates me i forget the clock i pass out of the sore relation to persons i am healed of my hurts i am made immortal by apprehending my possession of incorruptible goods here is great competition of rich and poor we live in a market where is only so much wheat or wood or land and if i have so much more every other must have so much less i seem to have no good without breach of good manners nobody is glad in the gladness of another and our system is one of war of an injurious superiority every child of the saxon race is educated to wish to be first it is our system and a man comes to measure his greatness by the regrets envies and hatreds of his competitors but in these new fields there is room here are no self-esteems no exclusions i admire great men of all classes those who stand for facts and for thoughts i like rough and smooth scourges of god and darlings of the human race i like the first caesar and charles the fifth of spain and charles the twelfth of sweden richard plantagenet and bonaparte in france i applaud a sufficient man an officer equal to his office captains ministers senators i like a master standing firm on legs of iron well born rich handsome eloquent loaded with advantages drawing all men by fascination into tributaries and supports of his power sword and staff or talents sword-like or staff-like carry on the work of the world but i find him greater when he can abolish himself and all heroes by letting in this element of reason irrespective of persons this subtilizer and 
irresistible upward force into our thought, destroying individualism, the power so great that the potentate is nothing. Then he is a monarch who gives a constitution to his people, a pontiff who preaches the equality of souls and releases his servants from their barbarous homages, an emperor who can spare his empire. But I intended to specify with a little minuteness two or three points of service. Nature never spares the opium or nepenthe, but wherever she mars her creature with some deformity or defect, lays her poppies plentifully on the bruise, and the sufferer goes joyfully through life, ignorant of the ruin, and incapable of seeing it, though all the world point their finger at it every day. The worthless and offensive members of society, whose existence is a social pest, invariably think themselves the most ill-used people alive, and never get over their astonishment at the ingratitude and selfishness of their contemporaries. Our globe discovers its hidden virtues, not only in heroes and archangels, but in gossips and nurses. Is it not a rare contrivance that lodged the due inertia in every creature, the conserving, resisting energy, the anger at being waked or changed? Altogether independent of the intellectual force in each is the pride of opinion, the security that we are right, not the feeblest grandam, not a mowing idiot, but uses what spark of perception and faculty is left to chuckle and triumph in his or her opinion over the absurdities of all the rest. Difference from me is the measure of absurdity. Not one has a misgiving of being wrong. Was it not a bright thought that made things cohere with this bitumen fastest of cements? But in the midst of this chuckle of self-gratulation, some figure goes by which Thersites too can love and admire. This is he that should marshal us the way we were going. There is no end to his aid. Without Plato, we should almost lose our faith in the possibility of a reasonable book. We seem to want but one, but we want one. We love to associate with heroic persons, since our receptivity is unlimited, and with the great our thoughts and manners easily become great. We are all wise in capacity, though so few in energy. There needs but one wise man in a company, and all are wise, so rapid is the contagion. Great men are thus a collyrium to clear our eyes from egotism, and enable us to see other people and their works. But there are vices and follies incident to whole populations and ages. Men resemble their contemporaries even more than their progenitors. It is observed in old couples, or in persons who have been housemates for a course of years, that they grow like, and if they should live long enough, we should not be able to know them apart. Nature abhors these complacences, which threaten to melt the world into a lump, and hastens to break up such maudlin agglutinations. The like assimilation goes on between men of one town, of one sect, of one political party, and the ideas of the time are in the air, and infect all who breathe it. Viewed from any high point, this city of New York, yonder city of London, the western civilization, would seem a bundle of insanities. We keep each other in countenance, and exasperate by emulation the frenzy of the time. The shield against the stingings of conscience is the universal practice, or our contemporaries. Again, it is very easy to be as wise and good 
as your companions we learn of our contemporaries what they know without effort and almost through the pores of the skin we catch it by sympathy or as a wife arrives at the intellectual and moral elevations of her husband but we stop where they stop very hardly can we take another step the great or such as hold of nature and transcend fashions by their fidelity to universal ideas are saviors from these federal errors and defend us from our contemporaries they are the exceptions which we want where all grows alike a foreign greatness is the antidote for cabalism thus we feed on genius and refresh ourselves from too much conversation with our mates and exult in the depth of nature in that direction in which he leads us what indemnification is one great man for populations of pygmies every mother wishes one son a genius though all the rest should be mediocre but a new danger appears in the excess of influence of the great man his attractions warp us from our place we have become underlings and intellectual suicides ah yonder in the horizon is our help other great men new qualities counterweights and checks on each other we cloy of the honey of each peculiar greatness every hero becomes a bore at last perhaps voltaire was not bad-hearted yet he said of the good jesus even i pray you let me never hear that man's name again they cry up the virtues of george washington damn george washington is the poor jacobin's whole speech and confutation but it is human nature's indispensable defence the centripetence augments the centrifugence we balance one man with his opposite and the health of the state depends on the seesaw there is however a speedy limit to the use of heroes every genius is defended from approach by quantities of un availableness they are very attractive and seem at a distance our own but we are hindered on all sides from approach the more we are drawn the more we are repelled there is something not solid in the good that is done for us the best discovery the discoverer makes for himself it has something unreal for his companion until he too has substantiated it it seems as if the deity dressed each soul which he sends into nature in certain virtues and powers not communicable to other men and sending it to perform one more turn through the circle of beings wrote not transferable and good for this trip only on these garments of the soul there is somewhat deceptive about the intercourse of minds the boundaries are invisible but they are never crossed there is such good will to impart and such good will to receive that each threatens to become the other but the law of individuality collects its secret strength you are you and i am i and so we remain for nature wishes everything to remain itself and whilst every individual strives to grow and exclude and to exclude and grow to the extremities of the universe and to impose the law of its being on every other creature nature steadily aims to protect each against every other each is self-defended nothing is more marked than the power by which individuals are guarded from individuals in a world where every benefactor becomes so easily a malefactor only by continuation of his activity into places where it is not due where children seem so much at the mercy of their foolish parents and where almost all men are too social and interfering we rightly speak of the guardian angels of children how superior in their security from infusions of evil persons 
from vulgarity and second thought they shed their own abundant beauty on the objects they behold therefore they are not at the mercy of such poor educators as we adults if we huff and chide them they soon come not to mind it and get a self-reliance and if we indulge them to folly they learn the limitation elsewhere we need not fear excessive influence a more generous trust is permitted serve the great stick at no humiliation grudge no offence thou canst render be the limb of their body the breath of their mouth compromise thy egotism who cares for that so thou gain aught wider and nobler never mind the taunt of boswellism the devotion may easily be greater than the wretched bride which is guarding its own skirts be another not thyself but a platonist not a soul but a christian not a naturalist but a cartesian not a poet but a shakespearean in vain the wheels of tendency will not stop nor will all the forces of inertia fear or of love itself hold thee there on and forever onward the microscope observes a monad or wheel insect among the infusories circulating in water presently a dot appears on the animal which enlarges to a slit and it becomes two perfect animals the ever proceeding detachment appears not less in all thought and in society children think they cannot live without their parents but long before they are aware of it the black dot has appeared and the detachment taken place any accident will now reveal to them their independence but great men the word is injurious is there caste is there fate what becomes the promise to virtue the thoughtful youth laments the superfetation of nature generous and handsome he says is your hero but look at yonder poor paddy whose country is his wheelbarrow look at his whole nation of paddies why are the masses from the dawn of history down food for knives and powder the idea dignifies a few leaders who have sentiment opinion love self-devotion and they make war and death sacred but what for the wretches whom they hire and kill the cheapness of man is every day's tragedy it is as real a loss that others should be low as that we should be low for we must have society is it a reply to these suggestions to say society is a pestalozian school all are teachers and pupils in turn we are equally served by receiving and by imparting men who know the same things are not long the best company for each other but bring to each other an intelligent person of another experience and it is as if you let off water from a lake by cutting a lower basin it seems a mechanical advantage and great benefit it is to each speaker as he can now paint out his thoughts to himself we pass very fast in our personal moods from dignity to dependence and if any appear never to assume the chair but always to stand and serve it is because we do not see the company in a sufficiently long period for the whole rotation of parts to come about as to what we call the masses and common men there are no common men all men are at last of a size and true art is only possible on the conviction that every talent has its apotheosis somewhere fair play and an open field and freshest laurels to all who have won them but heaven reserves an equal scope for every creature 
each is uneasy until he has produced his private ray unto the concave sphere and beheld his talent also in its last nobility and exaltation the heroes of the hour are relatively great of a faster growth or they are such in whom at the moment of success a quality is ripe which is then in request other days will demand other qualities some rays escape the common observer and want a finely adapted eye ask the great man if there be none greater his companions are and not the less great but the more that society cannot see them nature never sends a great man into the planet without confiding the secret to another soul one gracious fact emerges from these studies that there is true ascension in our love the reputations of the nineteenth century will one day be quoted to prove its barbarism the genius of humanity is the real subject whose biography is written in our annals we must infer much and supply many chasms in the record the history of the universe is symptomatic and life is mnemonical no man in all the procession of famous men is reason or illumination or that essence we are looking for but is an exhibition in some quarter of new possibilities could we one day complete the immense figure which these flagrant points compose the study of many individuals leads us to an elemental region wherein the individual is lost or wherein all touch by their summits thought and feeling shall break out there cannot be impounded by any fence of personality this is the key to the power of the greatest men their spirit diffuses itself a new quality of mind travels by night and by day in concentric circles from its origin and publishes itself by unknown methods the union of all minds appears intimate what gets admission to one cannot be kept out of any other the smallest acquisition of truth or of energy in any quarter is so much good to the commonwealth of souls if the disparities of talent and position vanish when the individuals are seen in the duration which is necessary to complete the career of each even more swiftly the seeming injustice disappears when we ascend to the central identity of all the individuals and know that they are made of the substance which ordaineth and doeth the genius of humanity is the right point of view of history the qualities abide the men who exhibit them have now more now less and pass away the qualities remain on another brow no experience is more familiar once you saw phoenixes they are gone the world is not therefore disenchanted the vessels on which you read sacred emblems turn out to be common pottery but the sense of the pictures is sacred and you may still read them transferred to the walls of the world for a time our teachers serve us personally as meters or milestones of progress once they were angels of knowledge and their figures touched the sky then we drew near saw their means culture and limits and they yielded their place to other geniuses happy if a few names remain so high that we have not been able to read them nearer and age and comparison have not robbed them of a ray but at last we shall cease to look in men for completeness and shall content ourselves with their social and delegated quality all that respects the individual is temporary and prospective 
like the individual himself, who is ascending out of his limits into a Catholic existence. We have never come at the true and best benefit of any genius, so long as we believe him an original force. In the moment when he ceases to help us as a cause, he begins to help us more as an effect. Then he appears as an exponent of a vaster mind and will. The opaque self becomes transparent with the light of the first cause. Yet, within the limits of human education and agency, we may say great men exist, that there may be greater men. The destiny of organized nature is amelioration, and who can tell its limits? It is for man to tame the chaos on every side, whilst he lives to scatter the seeds of science and of song that climate corn animals men may be milder and the germs of love and benefit may be multiplied buds and bird voices by nathaniel hawthorne balmy spring weeks later than we expected and months later than we longed for her comes at last to revive the moss on the roof and walls of our old mansion she peeps brightly into my study window, inviting me to throw it open and create a summer atmosphere by the intermixture of her genial breath with the black and cheerless comfort of the stove. As the casement ascends forth into infinite space fly the innumerable forms of thought or fancy that have kept me company in the retirement of this little chamber during the sluggish lapse of wintry weather visions gay grotesque and sad pictures of real life tinted with nature's homely gray and russet scenes in dreamland bedizened with rainbow hues which faded before they were well laid on all these may vanish now and leave me to mould a fresh existence out of sunshine brooding meditation may flap her dusky wings and take her owl-like flight blinking amid the cheerfulness of noontide such companions befit the season of frosted window panes and crackling fires when the blast howls through the black ash trees of our avenue and the drifting snowstorm chokes up the wood paths and fills the highway from stone wall to stone wall in the spring and summer time all sombre thoughts should follow the winter northward with the sombre and thoughtful crows the old paradisiacal economy of life is again in force we live not to think nor to labour but for the simple end of being happy nothing for the present hour is worthy of man's infinite capacity save to imbibe the warm smile of heaven and sympathise with the reviving earth the present spring comes onward with fleeter footsteps because winter lingered so unconscionably long that with her best diligence she can hardly retrieve half the allotted period of her reign it is but a fortnight since i stood on the brink of our swollen river and beheld the accumulated ice of four frozen months go down the stream except in streaks here and there upon the hillsides the whole visible universe was then covered with deep snow, the nethermost layer of which had been deposited by an early December storm. It was a sight to make the beholder torpid in the impossibility of imagining how this vast white napkin was to be removed from the face of the corpse-like world in less time than had been required to spread it there. But who can estimate the power of gentle influences, whether amid material desolation or the moral winter of man's heart. There have been no tempestuous rains, even no sultry days, but a constant breath of southern winds, with now a day of kindly sunshine, and now a no less kindly mist, or a soft descent of showers 
in which a smile and a blessing seem to have been steeped. The snow has vanished as if by magic. Whatever heaps may be hidden in the woods and deep gorges of the hills, only two solitary specks remain in the landscape, and those I shall almost regret to miss when tomorrow I look for them in vain. Never before, methinks, has spring pressed so closely on the footsteps of retreating winter. Along the roadside, the green blades of grass have sprouted on the very edge of the snowdrifts. The pastures and mowing fields have not yet assumed a general aspect of verdure, but neither have they the cheerless brown tint which they wear in later autumn, when vegetation has entirely ceased. There is now a faint shadow of life, gradually brightening into the warm reality. Some tracts in a happy exposure, as for instance yonder southwestern slope of an orchard, in front of that old red farmhouse beyond the river, such patches of land already wear a beautiful and tender green to which no future luxuriance can add a charm. It looks unreal, a prophecy, a hope, a transitory effect of some peculiar light which will vanish with the slightest motion of the eye. But beauty is never a delusion. Not these verdant tracts, but the dark and barren landscape all around them is a shadow and a dream. Each moment wins some portion of the earth from death to life. A sudden gleam of verdure brightens along the sunny slope of a bank which an instant ago was brown and bare. You look again and behold an apparition of green grass. The trees in our orchard and elsewhere are as yet naked, but already appear full of life and vegetable blood. It seems as if by one magic touch they might instantaneously burst into full foliage, and that the wind which now sighs through their naked branches might make sudden music amid innumerable leaves. The moss-grown willow tree, which for forty years past has overshadowed these western windows, will be among the first to put on its green attire. There are some objections to the willow. It is not a dry and cleanly tree, and impresses the beholder with an association of sliminess. No trees, I think, are perfectly agreeable as companions unless they have glossy leaves, dry bark, and a firm and hard texture of trunk and branches. But the willow is almost the earliest to gladden us with the promise and reality of beauty in its graceful and delicate foliage, and the last to scatter its yellow, yet scarcely withered leaves upon the ground. All through the winter, too, its yellow twigs give it a sunny aspect which is not without a cheering influence even in the greyest and gloomiest day. Beneath a clouded sky it faithfully remembers the sunshine. Our old house would lose a charm were the willow to be cut down with its golden crown over the snow-covered roof and its heap of summer verdure. The lilac shrubs under my study window are likewise almost in leaf. In two or three days more I may put forth my hand and pluck the topmost bough in its freshest green. These lilacs are very aged, and have lost the luxuriant foliage of their prime. The heart, or the judgment, or the moral sense, or the taste, is dissatisfied with their present aspect. Old age is not venerable when it embodies itself in lilacs, rose bushes, or any other ornamental shrubs. It seems as if such plants as they grow only for beauty ought to flourish only in immortal youth, or at least to die before their sad decrepitude. Trees of beauty are trees of paradise, and therefore not subject to decay by their original nature, though they have lost that precious birthright by being transplanted to an earthly soil. There is a kind of ludicrous unfitness in the idea of a time-stricken and grandfatherly lilac bush. The analogy holds good in human life. Persons who can only be 
graceful and ornamental, who can give the world nothing but flowers, should die young, and never be seen with grey hair and wrinkles any more than the flower shrubs with mossy bark and blighted foliage, like the lilacs under my window. Not that beauty is worthy of less than immortality, no, the beautiful should live forever, and thence perhaps the sense of impropriety when we see it triumphed over by time. Apple trees, on the other hand, grow old without reproach. Let them live as long as they may, and contort themselves into whatever perversity of shape they please, and deck their withered limbs with a springtime gaudiness of pink blossoms. Still they are respectable, even if they afford us only an apple or two in a season. Those few apples, or at all events the remembrance of apples in bygone years, are the atonement which utilitarianism inexorably demands for the privilege of lengthened life. Human flower shrubs, if they will grow old on earth, should, besides their lovely blossoms, bear some kind of fruit that will satisfy earthly appetites, else neither man nor the decorum of nature will deem it fit that the moss should gather on them. One of the first things that strikes the attention when the white sheet of winter is withdrawn is the neglect and disarray that lay hidden beneath it. Nature is not cleanly, according to our prejudices. The beauty of preceding years, now transformed to brown and blighted deformity, obstructs the brightening loveliness of the present hour. Our avenue is strewn with the whole crop of autumn's withered leaves. There are quantities of decayed branches which one tempest after another has flung down, black and rotten, and one or two with the ruin of a bird's nest clinging to them. In the garden are the dried bean vines, the brown stalks of the asparagus bed, and melancholy old cabbages, which were frozen into the soil before their unthrifty cultivator could find time to gather them. How invariable throughout all the forms of life do we find these intermingled memorials of death. On the soil of thought and in the garden of the heart, as well as in the sensual world, lie withered leaves, the ideas and feelings that we have done with. There is no wind strong enough to sweep them away. Infinite space will not garner them from our sight. What mean they? Why may we not be permitted to live and enjoy as if this were the first life and our own the primal enjoyment, instead of treading always on these dry bones and mouldering relics from the aged accumulation of which springs all that now appears so young and new? Sweet must have been the springtime of Eden, when no earlier year had strewn its decay upon the virgin turf, and no former experience had ripened into summer and faded into autumn in the hearts of its inhabitants. That was a world worth living in. O oh, thou murmurer, it is out of the very wantonness of such a life that thou feignest these idle lamentations. There is no decay. Each human soul is the first created inhabitant of its own Eden. We dwell in an old moss-covered mansion and tread in the worn footprints of the past and have a grey clergyman's ghost for our daily and nightly inmate. Yet all these outward circumstances are made less than visionary by the renewing power of the spirit. Should the spirit ever lose this power, should the withered leaves and the rotten branches and the moss-covered house and the ghost of the grey past ever become its realities, and the verdure and the freshness merely its faint dream, then let it pray to be released from earth. It will need the air of heaven to revive its pristine energies. What an unlooked-for flight was this from our shadowy avenue of 
black ash and balm of gilead trees into the infinite now we have our feet again upon the turf nowhere does the grass spring up so industriously as in this homely yard along the base of the stone wall and in the sheltered nooks of the buildings and especially round the southern doorstep a locality which seems particularly favourable to its growth for it is already tall enough to bend over and wave in the wind i observe that several weeds and most frequently a plant that stains the fingers with its yellow juice have survived and retained their freshness and sap throughout the winter one knows not how they have deserved such an exception from the common lot of their race they are now the patriarchs of the departed year and may preach mortality to the present generation of flowers and weeds among the delights of spring how is it possible to forget the birds even the crows are welcome as the sable harbingers of a brighter and livelier race they visited us before the snow was off but seem mostly to have betaken themselves to remote depths of the woods which they haunt all summer long many a time shall i disturb them there and feel as if i had intruded among a company of silent worshippers as they sit in sabbath stillness among the treetops their voices when they speak are in admirable accordance with the tranquil solitude of a summer afternoon and resounding so far above the head their loud clamour increases the religious quiet of the scene instead of breaking it a crow however has no real pretensions to religion in spite of his gravity of mien and black attire he is certainly a thief and probably an infidel the gulls are far more respectable in a moral point of view these denizens of sea-beaten rocks and haunters of the lonely beach come up our inland river at this season and soar high overhead flapping their broad wings in the upper sunshine they are among the most picturesque of birds because they so float and rest upon the air as to become almost stationary parts of the landscape the imagination has time to grow acquainted with them they have not flitted away in a moment you go up among the clouds and greet these lofty flighted gulls and repose confidently with them upon the sustaining atmosphere ducks have their haunts along the solitary places of the river and alight in flocks upon the broad bosom of the overflowed meadows their flight is too rapid and determined for the eye to catch enjoyment from it although it never fails to stir up the heart with the sportsman's ineradicable instinct they have now gone farther northward but will visit us again in autumn the smaller birds the little songsters of the woods and those that haunt man's dwellings and claim human friendship by building their nests under the sheltering eaves or among the orchard trees these require a touch more delicate and a gentler heart than mine to do them justice their outburst of melody is like a brook let loose from wintry chains we do not deem it a too high and solemn word to call it a hymn of praise to the creator since nature who pictures the reviving year in so many sights of beauty has expressed the sentiment of renewed life in no other sound save the notes of these blessed birds their music however just now seems to be incidental and not the result of a set purpose they are discussing the economy of life and love and the site and architecture of their summer residences and have no time to sit on a twig and pour forth solemn hymns or overtures operas symphonies and waltzes anxious questions are asked grave subjects are settled in quick and animated debate and only by occasional accident as from pure ecstasy does a rich warble 
roll its tiny waves of golden sound through the atmosphere. Their little bodies are as busy as their voices. They are in a constant flutter and restlessness. Even when two or three retreat to a treetop to hold counsel, they wag their tails and heads all the time with the irrepressible activity of their nature, which perhaps renders their brief span of life in reality as long as the patriarchal age of sluggish man. The blackbirds, three species of which consort together, are the noisiest of all our feathered citizens. Great companies of them, more than the famous four-and-twenty, whom Mother Goose has immortalized, congregate in contiguous treetops and vociferate with all the clamor and confusion of a turbulent political meeting. Politics certainly must be the occasion of such tumultuous debates, but still, unlike all other politicians, they instill melody into their individual utterances and produce harmony as a general effect. Of all bird voices, none are more sweet and cheerful to my ear than those of swallows in the dim, sun-streaked interior of a lofty barn. They address the heart with such a closer sympathy than Robin Redbreast. But indeed, all these winged people that dwell in the vicinity of homesteads seem to partake of human nature and possess the germ, if not the development, of immortal souls. We hear them saying their melodious prayers at morning's blush and eventide. A little while ago, in the deep of night, there came the lively thrill of a bird's note from a neighboring tree, a real song such as greets the purple dawn or mingles with the yellow sunshine. What could the little bird mean by pouring it forth at midnight? Probably the music gushed out of the midst of a dream in which he fancied himself in paradise with his mate, but suddenly awoke on a cold, leafless bough with a New England mist penetrating through his feathers. That was a sad exchange of imagination for reality. End of section 4《Section 5 of the Oxford Book of American Essays Chosen by Brander Matthews This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 5 Insects are among the earliest births of spring. Multitudes of I know not what species appeared long ago on the surface of the snow. Clouds of them almost too minute for sight hover in a beam of sunshine and vanish as if annihilated when they pass into the shade a mosquito has already been heard to sound the small horror of his bugle horn wasps infect the sunny windows of the house a bee entered one of the chambers with a prophecy of flowers rare butterflies came before the snow was off flaunting in the chill breeze and looking forlorn, and all astray in spite of the magnificence of their dark velvet cloaks with golden borders. The fields and wood paths have as yet few charms to entice the wanderer. In a walk the other day I found no violets or anemones, nor anything in the likeness of a flower. It was worth while, however, to ascend our opposite hill for the sake of gaining a general idea of the advance of spring, which I had hitherto been studying in its minute developments. The river lay round me in a semicircle, overflowing all the meadows which gave it its Indian name, and offering a noble breath to sparkle in the sunbeams. Along the hither shore a row of trees stood up to their knees in water, and afar off, on the surface of the stream, tufts of bushes thrust up their heads, as it were, to breathe. The most striking objects were great solitary trees here and there, with a mild-wide 
waste of water all around them the curtailment of the trunk by its immersion in the river quite destroys the fair proportions of the tree and thus makes us sensible of a regularity and propriety in the usual forms of nature the flood of the present season though it never amounts to a freshet on our quiet stream has encroached further upon the land than any previous one for at least a score of years it has overflowed stone fences and even rendered a portion of the highway navigable for boats the waters however are now gradually subsiding islands become annexed to the mainland and other islands emerge like new creations from the watery waste the scene supplies an admirable image of the receding of the nile except that there is no deposit of black slime or of noah's flood only that there is a freshness and novelty in these recovered portions of the continent which give the impression of a world just made rather than of one so polluted that a deluge had been requisite to purify it these upspringing islands are the greenest spots in the landscape the first gleam of sunlight suffices to cover them with verdure the earth and man himself by sympathy with his birthplace would be far other than we find them if life toiled wearily onward without this periodical infusion of the primal spirit will the world ever be so decayed that spring may not renew its greenness can man be so dismally age-stricken that no faintest sunshine of his youth may revisit him once a year it is impossible the moss on our time-worn mansion brightens into beauty the good old pastor who once dwelt here renewed his prime regained his boyhood in the genial breezes of his ninetieth spring alas for the worn and heavy soul if whether in youth or age it had outlived its privilege of springtime sprightliness from such a soul the world must hope no reformation of its evil no sympathy with the lofty faith and gallant struggles of those who contend in its behalf summer works in the present and thinks not of the future autumn is a rich conservative winter has utterly lost its faith and clings tremulously to the remembrance of what has been but spring with its outgushing life is the true type of the movement the philosophy of composition by edgar allan poe charles dickens in a note now lying before me alluding to an examination i once made of the mechanism of barnaby rudge says by the way are you aware that godwin wrote his caleb williams backwards he first involved his hero in a web of difficulties forming the second volume and then for the first cast about him for some mode of accounting for what had been done i cannot think this the precise mode of the procedure on the part of godwin and indeed what he himself acknowledges is not altogether in accordance with mr dickens idea but the author of caleb williams was too good an artist not to perceive the advantage derivable from at least a somewhat similar process nothing is more clear than that every plot worth the name must be elaborated to its denouement before anything be attempted with the pen it is only with the denouement constantly in view that we can give a plot its indispensable air of consequence or causation by making the incidents and especially the tone at all points tend to the development of the intention there is a radical error i think in the usual mode of constructing a story either history affords a thesis or one is suggested by an incident of the day or at best 
the author sets himself to work in the combination of striking events to form merely the basis of his narrative designing generally to fill in with description dialogue or autorial comment whatever crevices of fact or action may from page to page render themselves apparent i prefer commencing with the consideration of an effect keeping originality always in view for he is false to himself who ventures to dispense with so obvious and so easily attainable a source of interest i say to myself in the first place of the innumerable effects or impressions of which the heart the intellect or more generally the soul is susceptible what one shall i on the present occasion select having chosen a novel first and secondly a vivid effect i consider whether it can be best wrought by incident or tone whether by ordinary incidents and peculiar tone or the converse or by peculiarity both of incident and tone afterward looking about me or rather within for such combinations of event or tone as shall best aid me in the construction of the effect i have often thought how interesting a magazine paper might be written by any author who would that is to say who could detail step by step the processes by which any one of his compositions attained its ultimate point of completion why such a paper has never been given to the world i am much at a loss to say but perhaps the autorial vanity has had more to do with the omission than any one other cause most writers poets in especial prefer having it understood that they compose by a species of fine frenzy an ecstatic intuition and would positively shudder at letting the public take a peep behind the scenes at the elaborate and vacillating crudities of thought at the true purposes seized only at the last moment at the innumerable glimpses of idea that arrived not at the maturity of full view at the fully matured fancies discarded in despair as unmanageable at the cautious selections and rejections at the painful erasures and interpolations in a word at the wheels and pinions the tackle for scene shifting the step ladders and demon traps the cock's feathers the red paint and the black patches which in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred constitute the properties of the literary historio i am aware on the other hand that the case is by no means common in which an author is at all in condition to retrace the steps by which his conclusions have been attained in general suggestions having arisen pell-mell are pursued and forgotten in a similar manner for my own part i have neither sympathy with the repugnance alluded to nor at any time the least difficulty in recalling to mind the progressive steps of any of my compositions and since the interest of an analysis or reconstruction such as i have considered a desideratum is quite independent of any real or fancied interest in the thing analyzed it will not be regarded as a breach of decorum on my part to show the modus operandi by which some one of my own works was put together i select the raven as the most generally known it is my design to render it manifest that no one point in its composition is referable either to accident or intuition that the work proceeded step by step to its completion with the precision and rigid consequence of a mathematical problem let us dismiss as irrelevant to the poem per se the circumstance or say the necessity which in the first place gave rise to the intention of composing a poem that should suit at once the popular and the critical taste we commence then with this intention the initial consideration was that of extent if any literary work is too long to be read at one sitting we must be content 
dispense with the immensely important effect derivable from unity of impression for if two sittings be required the affairs of the world interfere and everything like totality is at once destroyed but since ceteris paribus no poet can afford to dispense with anything that may advance his design it but remains to be seen whether there is in extent any advantage to counterbalance the loss of unity which attends it here i say no at once what we term a long poem is in fact merely a succession of brief ones that is to say of brief poetical effects it is needless to demonstrate that a poem is such only inasmuch as it intensely excites by elevating the soul and all intense excitements are through a physical necessity brief for this reason at least one half of the paradise lost is essentially prose a succession of poetical excitements interspersed inevitably with corresponding depressions the whole being deprived through the extremeness of its length of the vastly important artistic element totality or unity of effect it appears evident then that there is a distinct limit as regards length to all works of literary art the limit of a single sitting and that although in certain classes of prose composition such as robinson crusoe demanding no unity this limit may be advantageously overpassed it can never properly be overpassed in a poem within this limit the extent of a poem may be made to bear mathematical relation to its merit in other words to the excitement or elevation again in other words to the degree of the true poetical effect which it is capable of inducing for it is clear that the brevity must be in direct ratio of the intensity of the intended effect this with one proviso that a certain degree of duration is absolutely requisite for the production of any effect at all holding in view these considerations as well as that degree of excitement which i deemed not above the popular while not below the critical taste i reached at once what i conceived the proper length for my intended poem a length of about one hundred lines it is in fact a hundred and eight my next thought concerned the choice of an impression or effect to be conveyed and here i may as well observe that throughout the construction i kept steadily in view the design of rendering the work universally appreciable i should be carried too far out of my immediate topic were i to demonstrate a point upon which i have repeatedly insisted and which with poetical stands not in the slightest need of demonstration the point i mean that beauty is the sole legitimate province of the poem a few words however in elucidation of my real meaning which some of my friends have evinced a disposition to misrepresent that pleasure which is at once the most intense the most elevating and the most pure is i believe found in the contemplation of the beautiful when indeed men speak of beauty they mean precisely not a quality as is supposed but an effect they refer in short just to that intense and pure elevation of soul not of intellect or of heart upon which i have commented and which is experienced in consequence of contemplating the beautiful now i designate beauty as the province of the poem merely because it is an obvious rule of art that effects should be made to spring from direct causes that objects should be attained through means best adapted for their attainment no one as yet having been weak enough to deny that the peculiar elevation alluded to is most readily attained in the poem now the object truth or the satisfaction of the intellect and the object passion or the excitement of the heart are although attainable to a certain extent in poetry far more readily attainable in prose 
truth in fact demands a precision and a passion a homeliness the truly passionate will comprehend me which are absolutely antagonistic to that beauty which i maintain is the excitement or pleasurable elevation of the soul it by no means follows from everything here said that passion or even truth may not be introduced and even profitably introduced into a poem for they may serve in elucidation or aid the general effect as do discords in music by contrast but the true artist will always contrive first to tone them into proper subservience to the predominant aim and secondly to unveil them as far as possible in that beauty which is the atmosphere and the essence of the poem regarding then beauty as my province my next question referred to the tone of its highest manifestation and all experience has shown that this tone is one of sadness beauty of whatever kind in its supreme development invariably excites the sensitive soul to tears melancholy is thus the most legitimate of all the poetical tones the length the province and the tone being thus determined i betook myself to ordinary introduction with the view of obtaining some artistic piquancy which might serve me as a keynote in the construction of the poem some pivot upon which the whole structure might turn in carefully thinking over the usual artistic effects or more properly points in the theatrical sense i did not fail to perceive immediately that no one had been so universally employed as that of the refrain the universality of its employment sufficed to assure me of its intrinsic value and spared me the necessity of submitting it to analysis i considered it however with regard to its susceptibility of improvement and soon saw it to be in a primitive condition as commonly used the refrain or burden not only is limited to lyric verse but depends for its impression upon the force of monotone both in sound and thought the pleasure is deduced solely from the sense of identity of repetition i resolved to diversify and so vastly heighten the effect by adhering in general to the monotone of sound while i continually varied that of thought that is to say i determined to produce continuously novel effects by the variation of the application of the refrain the refrain itself remaining for the most part unvaried these points being settled i next bethought me of the nature of my refrain since its application was to be repeatedly varied it was clear that the refrain itself must be brief for there would have been an insurmountable difficulty in frequent variations of application in any sentence of length in proportion to the brevity of the sentence would of course be the facility of the variation this led me at once to the single word as the best refrain the question now arose as to the character of the word having made up my mind to a refrain the division of the poem into stanzas was of course a corollary the refrain forming the close to each stanza that such a close to have force must be sonorous and susceptible of protracted emphasis admitted no doubt and these considerations inevitably led me to the long o as the most sonorous vowel in connection with r as the most producible consonant the sound of the refrain being thus determined it became necessary to select a word embodying this sound and at the same time in the fullest possible keeping with that melancholy which i had predetermined as the tone of the poem in such a search it would have been absolutely impossible to overlook the word nevermore in fact it was the very first which presented itself the next desideratum 
was a pretext for the continuous use of the word nevermore in observing the difficulty which i at once found in inventing a sufficiently plausible reason for its continuous repetition i did not fail to perceive that this difficulty arose solely from the pre-assumption that the word was to be continuously or monotonously spoken by a human being i did not fail to perceive in short that the difficulty lay in the reconciliation of this monotony with the exercise of reason on the part of the creature repeating the word here then immediately rose the idea of a non-reasoning creature capable of speech and very naturally a parrot in the first instance suggested itself but was superseded forthwith by a raven as equally capable of speech and infinitely more in keeping with the intended tone i had now gone so far as the conception of a raven the bird of ill omen monotonously repeating the one word nevermore at the conclusion of each stanza in a poem of melancholy tone and in length about one hundred lines now never losing sight of the object supremeness or perfection at all points i asked myself of all melancholy topics what according to the universal understanding of mankind is the most melancholy death was the obvious reply and when i said is this most melancholy of topics most poetical from what i have already explained at some length the answer here also is obvious when it most closely allies itself to beauty the death then of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world and equally is it beyond doubt that the lips best suited for such a topic are those of the bereaved lover i had now to combine the two ideas of a lover lamenting his deceased mistress and a raven continuously repeating the word nevermore i had to combine these bearing in mind my design of varying at every turn the application of the word repeated but the only intelligible mode of such combination is that of imagining the raven employing the word in answer to the queries of the lover and here it was that i saw at once the opportunity afforded for the effect on which i had been depending that is to say the effect of the variation of application i saw that i could make the first query propounded by the lover the first query to which the raven should reply nevermore that i could make this first query a commonplace one the second less so the third still less and so on until at length the lover startled from his original nonchalance by the melancholy character of the word itself by its frequent repetition and by a consideration of the ominous reputation of the fowl that uttered it is at length excited to superstition and wildly propounds queries of a far different character queries whose solution he has passionately at heart propounds them half in superstition and half in that species of despair that delights in self-torture propounds them not altogether because he believes in the prophetic or demoniac character of the bird which reason assures him is merely repeating a lesson learned by rote but because he experiences a frenzied pleasure in so modelling his questions as to receive from the expected nevermore the most delicious because the most intolerable of sorrow perceiving the opportunity thus afforded me or more strictly thus forced upon me in the progress of the construction i first established in mind the climax or concluding query that to which nevermore should be in the last place an answer that in reply to which this word nevermore should involve the utmost conceivable amount of sorrow and despair here then the poem may be said to have its beginning at the end 
where all works of art should begin for it was here at this point of my pre-considerations that i first put pen to paper in the composition of the stanza prophet said i thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil by that heaven that bends above us by that god we both adore tell this soul with sorrow laden if within the distant aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name lenore clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name lenore quoth the raven nevermore I composed this stanza at this point first that by establishing the climax I might the better vary and graduate as regards seriousness and importance the preceding queries of the lover, and secondly that I might definitely settle the rhythm, the meter, and the length and general arrangement of the stanza, as well as graduate the stanzas, which were to precede so that none of them might surpass this in rhythmical effect had i been able in the subsequent composition to construct more vigorous stanzas i should without scruple have purposely enfeebled them so as not to interfere with the climacteric effect and here i may as well say a few words of the versification my first object, as usual, was originality. The extent to which this has been neglected in versification is one of the most unaccountable things in the world. Admitting that there is little possibility of variety in mere rhythm, it is still clear that the possible varieties of meter and stanza are absolutely infinite, and yet for centuries no man in verse has ever done or ever seemed to think of doing an original thing the fact is originality unless in minds of very unusual force is by no means a matter as some suppose of impulse or intuition in general to be found it may be elaborately sought and although a positive merit of the highest class demands in its attainment less of invention than negation of course i pretend to no originality in either the rhythm or metre of the raven the former is trochaic the latter is octometer acatalectic alternating with heptameter catalectic repeated in the refrain of the fifth verse and terminating with tetrameter catalectic less pedantically the feet employed throughout trochees consist of a long syllable followed by a short the first line of the stanza consists of eight of these feet the second of seven and a half in effect two-thirds the third of eight the fourth of seven and a half the fifth the same the sixth three and a half now each of these lines taken individually has been employed before and what originality the raven has is in this combination into stanza nothing even remotely approaching this combination has ever been attempted the effect of this originality of combination is aided by other unusual and some altogether novel effects arising from an extension of the application of the principles of rhyme and alliteration the next point to be considered was the mode of bringing together the lover and the raven and the first branch of this consideration was the locale for this the most natural suggestion might seem to be a forest or the fields but it has always appeared to me that a close circumscription of space is absolutely necessary to the effect of insulated incident it has the force of a frame to a picture it has an indisputable moral power in keeping concentrated the attention and of course must not be confounded with mere unity of place i determined then to place the lover in his chamber in a chamber rendered sacred to him by memories of her who had frequented it the room is represented as richly furnished 
this in mere pursuance of the ideas i have already explained on the subject of beauty as the sole true poetical thesis the locale being thus determined i had now to introduce the bird and the thought of introducing him through the window was inevitable the idea of making the lover suppose in the first instance that the flapping of the wings of the bird against the shutter is a tapping at the door originated in a wish to increase by prolonging the reader's curiosity and in a desire to admit the incidental effect arising from the lover's throwing open the door finding all dark and thence adopting the half fancy that it was the spirit of the mistress that knocked i made the night tempestuous first to account for the ravens seeking admission and secondly for the effect of contrast with the physical serenity within the chamber i made the bird alight on the bust of paulus also for the effect of contrast between the marble and the plumage it being understood that the bust was absolutely suggested by the bird the bust of paulus being chosen first as most in keeping with the scholarship of the lover and secondly for the sonorousness of the word paulus itself about the middle of the poem also i have availed myself of the force of contrast with a view of deepening the ultimate impression for example an air of the fantastic approaching as nearly to the ludicrous as was admissible is given to the raven's entrance he comes in with many a flirt and flutter not the least obeyance made he not a moment stopped or stayed he but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door in the two stanzas which follow the design is more obviously carried out then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore though thy crest be shorn and shaven thou i said art sure no craven ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonium shore quoth the raven nevermore much i marvelled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly though its answer little meaning little relevancy bore for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such name as nevermore the effect of the denouement being thus provided for i immediately dropped the fantastic for a tone of the most profound seriousness this tone commencing in the stanza directly following the one last quoted with the line but the raven sitting lonely on that placid bust spoke only etc from this epoch the lover no longer jests no longer sees anything even of the fantastic in the raven's demeanour he speaks of him as a grim ungainly ghastly gaunt and ominous bird of yore and feels the fiery eyes burning into his bosom's core this revolution of thought or fancy on the lover's part is intended to induce a similar one on the part of the reader to bring the mind into a proper frame for the denouement which is now brought about as rapidly and as directly as possible with the denouement proper with the raven's reply nevermore to the lover's final demand if he shall meet his mistress in another world the poem in its obvious phase that of a simple narrative may be said to have its completion so far everything is within the limits of the accountable of the real a raven having learned by rote the single word nevermore and having escaped from the custody of its owner is driven at midnight through the violence of a storm to seek admission at a window from which a light still gleams the chamber window of a student 
occupied half in poring over a volume, half in dreaming of a beloved mistress deceased, the casement being thrown open at the fluttering of the bird's wings, the bird itself perches on the most convenient seat out of the immediate reach of the student, who, amused by the incident and the oddity of the visitor's demeanour, demands of it, in jest and without looking for a reply, its name, the raven addressed, answers with its customary word, nevermore, a word which finds immediate echo in the melancholy heart of the student, who, giving utterance aloud to certain thoughts suggested by the occasion, is again startled by the fowl's repetition of nevermore. The student now guesses the state of the case, but is impelled, as I have before explained, by the human thirst for self-torture, and in part by superstition, to propound such queries to the bird as will bring him, the lover, the most of the luxury of sorrow, through the anticipated answer nevermore. With the indulgence to the utmost extreme of this self-torture, the narration, in what I have termed its first or obvious phase, has a natural termination, and so far there has been no overstepping of the limits of the real. But in subjects so handled, however skilfully, or with however vivid an array of incident, there is always a certain hardness or nakedness which repels the artistic eye. Two things are invariably required. First, some amount of complexity, or more properly, adaptation. And secondly, some amount of suggestiveness, some undercurrent, however indefinite, of meaning. It is this latter in especial, which imparts to a work of art so much of that richness, to borrow from colloquy a forcible term, which we are too fond of confounding with the ideal. It is the excess of the suggested meaning, it is the rendering this the upper instead of the undercurrent of the theme, which turns into the prose, and that of the very flattest kind, so-called poetry of the so-called transcendentalists. Holding these opinions, I added the two concluding stanzas of the poem, their suggestiveness being thus made to pervade all the narrative which has preceded them. The undercurrent of meaning is rendered first apparent in the lines, Take thy beak from out my heart and Take thy form from off my door, quoth the raven nevermore. It will be observed that the words from my heart involve the first metaphorical expression in the poem. They, with the answer nevermore, dispose the mind to seek a moral in all that has been previously narrated. The reader begins now to regard the raven as emblematical, but it is not until the very last line of the very last stanza that the intention of making him emblematical of the mournful and never-ending remembrance is permitted distinctly to be seen, and the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Paulus, just above my chamber door and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight over him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Bread and the Newspaper by Oliver Wendell Holmes this is the new version of the Panem et Circenses of the Roman populace. It is our ultimatum, as that was theirs. They must have something to eat, and the circus shows to look at. We must have something to eat, and the papers to read. Everything else we can give up. If we are rich, 
we can lay down our carriages, stay away from Newport or Saratoga, and adjourn the trip to Europe sine die. If we live in a small way, there are at least new dresses and bonnets and everyday luxuries which we can dispense with. If the young Zouave of the family looks smart in his new uniform, its respectable head is content, though he himself grow seedy as a caraway humble late in the season, late in the season. He will cheerfully calm the perturbed nap of his old beaver by patient brushing in place of buying a new one, if only the lieutenant's jaunty cap is what it should be. We all take a pride in sharing the epidemic economy of the time. Only bread and the newspaper we must have, whatever else we do without. How this war is simplifying our mode of being. We live on our emotions, as the sick man is said in the common speech to be nourished by his fever. Our ordinary mental food has become distasteful, and what would have been intellectual luxuries at other times are now absolutely repulsive. All this change in our manner of existence implies that we have experienced some very profound impression which will sooner or later betray itself in permanent effects on the minds and bodies of many among us. We cannot forget Corvisart's observation of the frequency with which diseases of the heart were noticed as the consequence of the terrible emotions produced by the scenes of the great French Revolution. Lenick tells the story of a convent of which he was the medical director where all the nuns were subjected to the severest penances and schooled the most painful doctrines. They all became consumptive soon after their entrance, so that in the course of his ten years' attendance, all the inmates died out two or three times, and were replaced by new ones. He does not hesitate to attribute the disease from which they suffered to those depressing moral influences to which they were subjected. So far we have noticed little more than disturbances of the nervous system as a consequence of the war excitement in non-combatants. Take the first trifling example which comes to our recollection. A sad disaster to the Federal Army was told the other day in the presence of two gentlemen and a lady. Both the gentlemen complained of a sudden feeling of epigastrium or less learnedly the pit of the stomach, changed color, and confessed to a slight tremor about the knees. The lady had a grand revolution, as French patients say, went home, and kept her bed for the rest of the day. Perhaps the reader may smile at the mention of such trivial indispositions, but in more sensitive natures death itself follows in some cases from no more serious cause. An old gentleman fell senseless in fatal apoplexy on hearing of Napoleon's return from Elba, one of our early friends who recently died of the same complaint was thought to have had his attack mainly in consequence of the excitements of the time. We all know what the war fever is in our young men, what a devouring passion it becomes in those whom it assails. Patriotism is the fire of it, no doubt, but this is fed with fuel of all sorts. The love of adventure, the contagion of example, the fear of losing, the chance of participating in the great events of the time, the desire of personal distinction, all help to produce those singular transformations which we often witness, turning the most peaceful of our youth into the most ardent of our soldiers. But something of the same fever in a different form reaches a good many non-combatants, who have no thought of losing a drop of precious blood belonging to themselves or their families. Some of the symptoms we shall mention are almost universal. 
they are as plain in the people we meet everywhere as the marks of an influenza when that is prevailing the first is a nervous restlessness of a very peculiar character men cannot think or write or attend to their ordinary business they stroll up and down the streets or saunter out upon the public places we confessed to an illustrious author that we laid down the volume of his work which we were reading when the war broke out it was as interesting as a romance but the romance of the past grew pale before the red light of the terrible present meeting the same author not long afterwards he confessed that he had laid down his pen at the same time that we had closed his book he could not write about the sixteenth century any more than we could read about it while the nineteenth was in the very agony and bloody sweat of its great sacrifice another great eminent scholar told us in all simplicity that he had fallen into such a state that he would read the same telegraphic dispatches over and over again in different papers as if they were new until he felt as if he were an idiot who did not do just the same thing and does not often do it still now that the first flush of the fever is over another person always goes through the side streets on his way for the noon extra he is so afraid somebody will meet him and tell the news he wishes to read first on the bulletin board and then in the great capitals and leaded type of the newspaper when any startling piece of war news comes it keeps repeating itself in our minds in spite of all we can do the same trains of thought go tramping round in circle through the brain like the supernumeraries that make up the grand army of a stage show now if a thought goes round through the brain a thousand times in a day it will have worn as deep a track as one which has passed through it once a week for twenty years this accounts for the ages we seem to have lived since the twelfth of april last and to state it more generally for that ex post facto operation of a great calamity or any very powerful impression which we once illustrated by the image of a stain spreading backwards from the leaf of life open before us through all those which we have already turned blessed are those who can sleep quietly in times like these yet not wholly blessed either for what is more painful than the awakening from peaceful unconsciousness to a sense that there is something wrong we cannot at first think what and then groping our way about through the twilight of our thoughts until we come full upon the misery which like some evil bird seemed to have flown away but which sits waiting for us on its perch by our pillow in the grey of the morning the converse of this is perhaps still more painful many have the feeling in their waking hours that the trouble they are aching with is after all only a dream if they will rub their eyes briskly enough and shake themselves they will awake out of it and find all their supposed grief is unreal the attempt to cajole ourselves out of an ugly fact always reminds us of those unhappy flies who have been indulging in the dangerous sweets of the paper prepared for their especial use watch one of them he does not feel quite well at least he suspects himself of indisposition nothing serious let us just rub our forefeet together as the enormous creature who provides for us rubs his hands and all will be right he rubs them with that peculiar twisting movement of his and pauses for the effect no all is not quite right yet ah it is our head that is not set on just as it ought to be let us settle that where it should be and then we shall certainly be in good trim again so he pulls his head about as an old lady adjusts her cap and passes his forepaw over it like a kitten 
washing herself. Poor fellow. It is not a fancy, but a fact that he has to deal with. If he could read the letters at the head of the sheet, he would see they were fly paper. So with us, when, in our waking misery, we try to think we dream. Perhaps very young persons may not understand this. As we grow older, our waking and dreaming life run more and more into each other. Another symptom of our excited condition is seen in the breaking up of old habits. The newspaper is as imperious as a Russian ukas. It will be had and it will be read. To this all else must give place. If we must go out at unusual hours to get it, we shall go in spite of after-dinner nap or evening somnolence. If it finds us in company, it will not stand on ceremony, but cuts short the compliment and the story by the divine right of its telegraphic dispatches. War is a very old story, but it is a new one to this generation of Americans. Our own nearest relation in the ascending line remembers the revolution well. How should she forget it? Did she not lose her doll, which was left behind, when she was carried out of Boston, about that time growing uncomfortable for reason of cannonballs dropping in from the neighboring heights at all hours, in token of which we see the tower of Brattle Street Church at this very day? War in her memory means seventy-six. As for the brush of eighteen-twelve, we did not think much about that, and everybody knows that the Mexican business did not concern us much except in its political relations. No, war is a new thing to all of us who are not in the last quarter of their century. We are learning many strange matters from our fresh experience, and besides, there are new conditions of existence which make war as it is with us very different from war as it has been. The first and obvious difference consists in the fact that the whole nation is now penetrated by the ramifications of a network of iron nerves which flash sensation and volition backward and forward to and from towns and provinces as if they were organs and limbs of a single living body. The second is the vast system of iron muscles, which, as it were, moves the limbs of the mighty organisms one upon another. What was the railroad force which put the 6th Regiment in Baltimore on the 19th of April but a contraction and extension of the arm of Massachusetts, with a clenched fist full of bayonets at the end of it? This perpetual intercommunication, joined to the power of instantaneous action, keeps us always alive with excitement. It is not a breathless courier who comes back with a report from an army we have lost sight of for a month, nor a single bulletin which tells us all we are to know for a week of some great engagement, but almost hourly paragraphs laden with truth or falsehood, as the case may be, making us restless always for the last fact or rumor they are telling and so of the movements of our armies to-night the stout lumbermen of maine are encamped under their own fragrant pines in a score or two of hours they are among the tobacco fields and the slave pens of virginia the war passion burned like scattered coals of fire the households of revolutionary times. Now it rushes all through the land like a flame over the prairie, and this instant diffusion of every fact and feeling produces another singular effect in the equalizing and steadying of public opinion. We may not be able to see a month ahead of us, but as to what has passed a week afterwards, it is as thoroughly talked out and judged as it would have been in a whole season before our national nervous system was organized. As the wild tempest wakes the slumbering sea, 
thou only teachest all that man can be we indulged in the above apostrophe to war in a phi beta kappa poem of long ago which we liked better before we read mr cutler's beautiful prolonged lyric delivered at the recent anniversary of that society oftentimes in paroxysms of peace and goodwill towards all mankind we have felt twinges of conscience about the passage especially when one of our orators showed us that a ship of war costs as much to build and keep as a college and that every porthole we could stop would give us a new professor now we begin to think that there was some meaning in our poor couplet war has taught us as nothing else could what we can be and are it has exalted our manhood and our womanhood and driven us all back upon our substantial human qualities for a long time more or less kept out of sight by the spirit of commerce the love of art science or literature or other qualities not belonging to all of us as men and women it is at this very moment doing more to melt away the petty social distinctions which keep generous souls apart from each other than the preaching of the beloved disciple himself would do we are finding out that not only patriotism is eloquence but that heroism is gentility all ranks are wonderfully equalized under the fire of a masked battery the plain artisan or the rough fireman who faces the lead and iron like a man is the truest representative we can show of the heroes of cressy and agincourt and if one of our fine gentlemen puts off his straw-coloured kids and stands by the other shoulder to shoulder or leads him on to the attack he is as honourable in our eyes and in theirs as if he were ill-dressed and his hands were soiled with labour even our poor brahmans whom a critic in ground-glass spectacles the same who grasps his statistics by the blade and strikes at his supposed antagonist with the handle oddly confounds with the bloated aristocracy whereas they are very commonly pallid under vitalized shy sensitive creatures whose only birthright is an aptitude for learning even these poor new england brahmins of ours subverates of an organizable base as they often are count as full men if their courage is big enough for the uniform which hangs so loosely about their slender figures a young man was drowned not very long ago in the river running under our windows a few days afterwards a field piece was dragged to the water's edge and fired many times over the river we asked a bystander who looked like a fisherman what that was for it was to break the gall he said and to bring the drowned person to the surface a strange physiological fancy and a very odd non sequitur but that is not our present point a good many extraordinary objects do really come to the surface when the great guns of war shake the waters as when they roared over the charleston harbor End of section five section six of the oxford book of american essays chosen by brander matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain section six treason came up hideous fit only to be huddled into its dishonourable grave but the wrecks of precious virtues which had been covered with the waves of prosperity came up also and all sorts of unexpected and unheard-of things which had lain unseen during our national life of fourscore years came up and are coming up daily 
shaken from their bed by the concussions of the artillery bellowing around us. It is a shame to own it, but there were persons otherwise respectable not unwilling to say that they believed the old valor of revolutionary times had died out from among us. They talked about our own northern people as the English in the last centuries used to talk about the French. Goldsmith's old soldier, it may be remembered, called one Englishman good for five of them. As Napoleon spoke of the English again, as a nation of shopkeepers, so these persons affected to consider the multitude of their countrymen as unwarlike artisans, forgetting that Paul Revere taught himself the value of liberty in working upon gold, and Nathaniel Green fitted himself to shape armies in the labor of forging iron. These persons have learned better now. The bravery of our free-working people was overlaid, but not smothered, sunken, but not drowned. The hands which had been busy conquering the elements had only to change their weapons and their adversaries, and they were as ready to conquer the masses of living force opposed to them as they had been to build towns, to dam rivers, to hunt whales, to harvest rice, to hammer brute matter into every shape civilization can ask for. Another great fact came to the surface and is coming up every day in new shapes, that we are one people. It is easy to say that a man is a man in Maine or Minnesota, but not so easy to feel it all through our bones and marrow. The camp is deprovincializing us very fast. Brave Winthrop, marching with the city elegance, seems to have been a little startled to find how wonderfully human were the hard-handed men of the 8th Massachusetts. It takes all the nonsense out of everybody, or ought to do it, to see how fairly the real manhood of a country is distributed over its surface. And then, just as we are beginning to think our own soil has a monopoly of heroes as well as of cotton, up turns a regiment of gallant Irishmen, like the 69th, to show us that continental provincialism is as bad as that of Coos County, New Hampshire, or of Broadway, New York. Here, too, side by side in the same great camp are half a dozen chaplains representing half a dozen modes of religious belief. When the masked battery opens, does the Baptist lieutenant believe in his heart that God takes better care of him than of his Congregationalist colonel? Does any man really suppose that of a score of noble young fellows who have just laid down their lives for their country, the homo Usians are received to the mansion of bliss, and the homoi Usians translated from the battlefield to the abodes of everlasting woe? War not only teaches what man can be, but it teaches also what he must not be. He must not be a bigot and a fool in the presence of that day of judgment proclaimed by the trumpet which calls to battle, and where a man should have but two thoughts, to do his duty and trust his maker. Let our brave dead come back from the fields where they have fallen for law and liberty, and if you will follow them to their graves, you will find out what the broad church means. The narrow church is sparing of its exclusive formulae over the coffins wrapped in the flag which the fallen heroes have defended. Very little comparatively do we hear at such times the dogmas on which men differ, very much of the faith and trust in which all sincere Christians can agree. It is a noble lesson, and nothing less noisy than the voice of cannon can teach it, so that it shall be heard over all the angry cries of theological disputants. Now, too, we have a chance to test the sagacity of our friends, and to get at their principles of judgment. Perhaps most of us will agree that our faith in domestic prophets has been diminished 
by the experience of the last six months. We had the notable predictions attributed to the Secretary of State, which so unpleasantly refused to fulfill themselves. We are infested at one time with a set of ominous-looking seers, who shook their heads and muttered obscurely about some mighty preparations that were making to substitute the rule of the minority for that of the majority. Organizations were darkly hinted at. Some thought our armories would be seized, and there are not wanting ancient women in the neighboring university town who consider that the country was saved by the intrepid band of students who stood guard night after night over the g r cannon and the pile of balls in the cambridge arsenal as a general rule it is safe to say that the best prophecies are those which the sages remember after the event prophesied of has come to pass and remind us that they have made long ago those who are rash enough to predict publicly beforehand commonly give us what they hope or what they fear or some conclusion from an abstraction of their own or some guess founded on private information not half so good as what everybody gets who reads the papers never by any possibility a word that we can depend on simply because there are cobwebs of contingency between every to-day and to-morrow that no field glass can penetrate when fifty of them lie woven one over another prophesy as much as you like but always hedge say that you think the rebels are weaker than is commonly supposed but on the other hand that they may prove to be even stronger than, than is anticipated say what you like only don't be too peremptory and dogmatic we know that wiser men than you have been notoriously deceived in their predictions in this very matter ibis et redibis nonquam in bello peribis let that be your model, and remember, on peril of your reputation as a prophet, not to put a stop before or after the nunquam. There are two or three facts connected with time, besides that already referred to, which strike us very forcibly in their relation to the great events passing around us. We spoke of the long period seeming to have elapsed since this war began. The buds were then swelling, which held the leaves that are still green. It seems as old as time himself. We cannot fail to observe how the mind brings together the scenes of today and those of the old revolution. We shut up eighty years into each other like the joints of a pocket telescope. When the young men from Middlesex dropped into Baltimore the other day, it seemed to bring Lexington and the other 19th of April close to us. War has always been the mint in which the world's history has been coined, and now every day or week or month has a new medal for us. It was Warren that the first impressions bore in the last great coinage. If it is Ellsworth now, the new face hardly seems fresher than the old. All battlefields are alike in their main features the young fellows who fell in our earlier struggle seemed like old men to us until within these few months now we remember they were like these fiery youth we are cheering as they go to the fight it seems as if the grass of our bloody hillside was crimsoned but yesterday and the cannon-ball embedded in the church tower would feel warm if we laid our hand upon it nay in this our quickened life we feel that all the battles from earliest time to our own day where right and wrong have grappled are but one great battle varied with brief pauses or hasty bivouacs upon the field of conflict the issues seem to vary, but it is always a right against a claim, and, however, the struggle of the hour may go, of movement onward of the campaign, which uses defeat as well as victory to serve its mighty ends. 
the very implements of our warfare change less than we think our bullets and cannon-balls have lengthened into bolts like those which whistled out of old arbalests our soldiers fight with weapons such as are pictured on the walls of theban tombs wearing a newly invented headgear as old as the days of the pyramids whatever miseries this war brings upon us it is making us wiser and we trust better wiser for we are learning our weakness our narrowness our selfishness our ignorance in lessons of sorrow and shame better because all that is noble in men and women is demanded by the time and our people are rising to the standard the time calls for for this is the question the hour is putting to each of us are you ready if need be to sacrifice all that you have and hope for in this world that the generations to follow you may inherit a whole country whose natural conditions shall be peace and not a broken province which must live under the perpetual threat if not in the constant presence of war and all that war brings with it if we are all ready for the sacrifice battles may be lost but the campaign and its grand object must be won heaven is very kind in its way of putting questions to mortals we are not abruptly asked to give up all that we most care for in view of the momentous issues before us perhaps we shall never be asked to give up all but we have already been called upon to part with much that is dear to us and should be ready to yield the rest as it is called for the time may come when even the cheap public print shall be a burden our means cannot support and we can only listen in the square that was once the market-place to the voices of those who proclaim defeat or victory then there will be only our daily food left when we have nothing to read and nothing to eat it will be a favorable moment to offer a compromise at present we have all that nature absolutely demands we can live on bread and the newspaper walking by henry david thoreau i wish to speak a word for nature for absolute freedom and wildness as contrasted with a freedom and culture merely civil to regard man as an inhabitant or a part and parcel of nature rather than a member of society i wish to make an extreme statement if so i may make an emphatic one for there are enough champions of civilization the minister and the school committee and every one of you will take care of that i have met with but one or two persons in the course of my life who understood the art of walking that is of taking walks who had a genius so to speak for sauntering which word is beautifully derived from idle people who rove about the country in the middle ages and asked charity under the pretense of going a la saint terre to the holy land till the children exclaimed there goes a saint a saunterer a holy lander they who never go to the holy land in their walks as they pretend are indeed mere idlers and vagabonds but they who do go there are saunterers in the good sense such as i mean some however would derive the word from sans terre without land or a home which therefore in the good sense will mean having no particular home but equally at home everywhere for this is the secret of successful sauntering he who sits still in a house all the time may be the greatest vagrant of all but the saunterer 
in the good sense is no more vagrant than the meandering river which is all the while sedulously seeking the shortest course to the sea but i prefer the first which indeed is the most probable derivative for every walk is a sort of crusade preached by some peter the hermit in us to go forth and reconquer this holy land from the hands of the infidels it is true we are but faint-hearted crusaders even the walkers nowadays who undertake no persevering never-ending enterprises our expeditions are but tours and come round again at evening to the old hearthside from which we set out half the walk is but retracing our steps we should go forth on the shortest walk perchance in the spirit of undying adventure never to return prepared to send back our embalmed hearts only as relics to our desolate kingdoms if you are ready to leave father and mother and brother and sister and wife and child and friends and never see them again if you have paid your debts and made your will and settled all your affairs and are a free man then you are ready for a walk to come down to my own experience my companion and i for i sometimes have a companion take pleasure in fancying ourselves knights of a new or rather an old order not equestrians or chevaliers not ritters or riders but walkers a still more ancient and honourable class i trust the chivalric and heroic spirit which once belonged to the rider seems now to reside in or perchance to have subsided into the walker not the knight but walker errant he is a sort of fourth estate outside of church and state and people we have felt that we almost alone hereabouts practised this noble art though to tell the truth at least if their own assertions are to be received most of my townsmen would fain walk sometimes as i do but they cannot no wealth can buy the requisite leisure freedom and independence which are the capital in this profession it comes only by the grace of god it requires the direct dispensation from heaven to become a walker you must be born into the family of the walkers omulator nauseator non fit some of my townsmen it is true can remember and have described to me some walks which they took ten years ago in which they were so blessed as to lose themselves for half an hour in the woods but i know very well that they have confined themselves to the highway ever since whatever pretensions they may make to belong to this select class no doubt they were elevated for a moment as by the reminiscence of a previous state of existence when even they were foresters and outlaws when he came to green wood in a merry morning there he heard the notes small of birds merry singing it is fair gone said robin that i was last year my list a little for to shoot at the dawn dear i think that i cannot preserve my health and spirits unless i spend four hours a day at least and it is commonly more than that sauntering through the woods and over the hills and fields absolutely free from all worldly engagements you may safely say a penny for your thoughts or a thousand pounds when sometimes i am reminded that the mechanics and shopkeepers stay in their shops not only all the forenoon but all the afternoon too sitting with crossed legs so many of them as if the legs were made to sit upon and not to stand or walk upon i think that they deserve some credit for not having all committed suicide long ago i who cannot stay in my chamber for a single day without acquiring some rust and when sometimes i have stolen forth for a walk at the eleventh hour at four o'clock in the afternoon too late 
to redeem the day when the shades of night were already beginning to be mingled with the daylight have felt as if i had committed some sin to be atoned for i confess that i am astonished at the power of endurance to say nothing of the moral insensibility of my neighbors who confine themselves to shops and offices the whole day for weeks and months ay and years almost together i know not what manner of stuff they are of sitting there now at three o'clock in the afternoon as if it were three o'clock in the morning bonaparte may talk of the three o'clock in the morning courage but it is nothing to the courage which can sit down cheerfully at this hour in the afternoon over against one's self whom you have known all the morning to starve out a garrison to whom you are bound by such strong ties of sympathy i wonder that about this time or say between four and five o'clock in the afternoon too late for the morning papers and too early for the evening ones there is not a general explosion heard up and down the street scattering a legion of antiquated and house-bred notions and whims to the four winds for an airing and so the evil cure itself how womankind who are confined to the house still more than men stand it i do not know but i have ground to suspect that most of them do not stand it at all when early in a summer afternoon we have been shaking the dust of the village from the skirts of our garments making haste past those houses with purely doric or gothic fronts which have such an air of repose about them my companion whispers that probably about these times their occupants are all gone to bed then it is that i appreciate the beauty and the glory of architecture which itself never turns in but forever stands out and erect keeping watch over the slumberers no doubt temperament and above all age have a good deal to do with it as a man grows older his ability to sit still and follow indoor occupations increases he grows vespertinal in his habits as the evening of life approaches till at last he comes forth only just before sundown and gets all the walk that he requires in half an hour but the walking of which i speak has nothing in it akin to taking exercise as it is called as the sick take medicine at stated hours as the swinging of dumbbells or chairs but is itself the enterprise and adventure of the day if you would get exercise go in search of the springs of life think of a man's swinging dumbbells for his health when those springs are bubbling up in far-off pastures unsought by him moreover you must walk like a camel which is said to be the only beast which ruminates when walking when a traveller asked wordsworth's servant to show him her master's study she answered here is his library but his study is out of doors living much out of doors in the sun and wind will no doubt produce a certain roughness of character will cause a thicker cuticle to grow over some of the finer qualities of our nature as on the face and hands or as severe manual labor robs the hands of some of their delicacy of touch so staying in the house on the other hand may produce a softness and a smoothness not to say thinness of skin accompanied by an increased sensibility to certain impressions perhaps we should be more susceptible to some influences important to our intellectual and moral growth if the sun had shone and the wind blown on us a little less and no doubt it is a nice matter to proportion rightly the thick and thin skin but methinks that is a scurf that will fall off fast enough that the natural remedy is to be found in the proportion which the night bears to the day the winter to the summer thought to experience 
there will be so much the more air and sunshine in our thoughts the callous palms of the labourer are conversant with finer tissues of self-respect and heroism whose touch thrills the heart than the languid fingers of idleness that is mere sentimentality that lies abed by day and thinks itself white far from the tan and callous of experience when we talk we naturally go to the fields and woods what would become of us if we walked only in a garden or a mall even some sects of philosophers have felt the necessity of importing the woods to themselves since they did not go to the woods they planted groves and walks of platanes where they took subdialis abulationes in porticos open to the air of course it is of no use to direct our steps to the woods if they do not carry us thither i am alarmed when it happens that i have walked a mile into the woods bodily without getting there in spirit in my afternoon walk i would fain forget all my morning occupations and my obligations to society but it sometimes happens that i cannot easily shake off the village the thought of some work will run in my head and i am not where my body is i am out of my senses in my walks i would fain return to my senses what business have i in the woods if i am thinking of something out of the woods i suspect myself and cannot help a shudder when i find myself so implicated even in what are called good works for this may sometimes happen my vicinity affords many good walks and though for some many years i have walked almost every day and sometimes for several days together i have not yet exhausted them an absolutely new prospect is a great happiness and i can still get this any afternoon two or three hours walking will carry me to as strange a country as i expected ever to see a single farmhouse which i had not seen before is sometimes as good as the dominions of the king of dahomey there is in fact a sort of harmony discoverable between the capabilities of the landscape within a circle of ten miles radius or the limits of an afternoon walk and the threescore years and ten of human life it will never become quite familiar to you nowadays almost all man's improvements so called as the building of houses and the cutting down of the forest and of all large trees simply deform the landscape and make it more and more tame and cheap a people who would begin by burning the fences and let the forest stand i saw the fences half consumed their end lost in the middle of the prairie and some worldly miser with a surveyor looking after his bounds while heaven had taken place around him and he did not see the angels going to and fro but was looking for an old post hole in the midst of paradise i looked again and saw him standing in the middle of a boggy stygian fen surrounded by devils and he had found his bounds without a doubt three little stones where a stake had been driven and looking nearer i saw that the prince of darkness was his surveyor i can easily walk ten fifteen twenty any number of miles commencing at my own door without going by any house without crossing a road except where the fox and the mink do first along by the river and then the brook and then the meadow and the woodside there are square miles in my vicinity which have no inhabitant from many a hill i can see civilization and the abodes of man afar the farmers and their works are scarcely more obvious than woodchucks and their burrows man and his affairs church and state and school trade and commerce and manufactures and agriculture even politics the most alarming of them all i am pleased to see how little space they occupy in the landscape 
politics is but a narrow field, and that still narrower highway yonder leads to it. I sometimes direct the traveller thither. If you would go to the political world, follow the great road, follow that market man, keep his dust in your eyes, and it will lead you straight to it. For it, too, has its place merely, and does not occupy all space. I pass from it as from a bean-field into the forest, and it is forgotten. In one half-hour I can walk off to some portion of the earth's surface where a man does not stand from one year's end to another, and there consequently politics are not, for they are but as the cigar-smoke of a man. The village is the place to which the roads tend, a sort of expansion of the highway as a lake of a river. It is the body of which roads are the arms and legs, a trivial or quadrivial place. The thoroughfare and ordinary of travellers. The word is from the Latin villa, which, together with via, away, or more anciently ved, and vela, Varro derives from veo to carry, because the villa is the place to and from which things are carried. They who got their living by teeming were said villatorarum facere. Hence, too, apparently, the Latin word villus and our vile. This suggests what kind of degeneracy villagers are liable to. They are wayworn by the travel that goes by and over them without traveling themselves. Some do not walk at all, others walk in the highways, a few walk across lots. Roads are made for horses and men of business. I do not travel in them much comparatively, because I am not in a hurry to get to any tavern or grocery or livery stable or depot to which they lead. I am a good horse to travel, but not from choice a roadster. The landscape painter uses the figures of men to mark a road. He would not make that use of my figure. I walk out into a nature such as the old prophets and poets, Menu, Moses, Homer, Chaucer, walked in. You may name it America, but it is not America, neither Americus Vespucius, nor Columbus, nor the rest were the discoverers of it. There is a truer account of it in mythology than in any history of America, so called, that I have seen. However, there are a few old roads that may be trodden with profit, as if they led somewhere now that they are nearly discontinued. There is the old Marlborough Road, which does not go to Marlborough now, methinks, unless that is Marlborough, where it carries me. I am the bolder to speak of it here, because I presume that there are one or two such roads in every town. The old Marlborough Road, where they once dug for money, but never found any, where sometimes Marshall Miles singly files, and Elijah Wood, I fear for no good, no other man save Elijah Dugan, O man of wild habits, partridges and rabbits, who hast no cares, only to set snares, who livest all alone close to the bone, and where life is sweetest, constantly eatest. When the spring stirs my blood with the instinct to travel, I can get enough gravel on the old Marlborough Road. Nobody repairs it, for nobody wears it. It is a living way, as the Christians say. Not many there be who enter therein, only the guests of the Irishman Quinn. What is it, what is it, but a direction out there, and the bare possibility of going somewhere? Great guide-boards of stone, but travellers none, cenotaphs of the town named on their crowns. It is worth going to see where you might be what king did the thing. I am still wondering. Set up how or when, 
by what selectman gorgas or lee clark or darby there a great endeavor to be something forever blank tablets of stone where a traveller might groan and in one sentence grave all that is known which another might read in his extreme need i know one or two lines that would do literature that might stand all over the land which a man could remember till next december and read again in the spring after the thawing if with fancy unfurled you leave your abode you may go round the world by the old marlborough road at present in this vicinity the best part of the land is not private property the landscape is not owned and the walker enjoys comparative freedom but possibly the day will come when it will be partitioned off into so-called pleasure grounds in which a few will take an arrow and exclusive pleasure only when fences shall be multiplied and man traps and other engines invented to confine man to the public road and walking over the surface of god's earth shall be construed to mean trespassing on some gentleman's grounds to enjoy a thing exclusively is commonly to exclude yourself from the true enjoyment of it let us improve our opportunities then before the evil days come what is it that makes it so hard sometimes to determine whither we will walk i believe that there is a suitable magnetism in nature which if we unconsciously yield to it will direct us aright it is not indifferent to us which way we walk there is a right way but we are very liable from heedlessness and stupidity to take the wrong one we would fain take that walk never yet taken by us through this actual world which is perfectly symbolical of the path which we love to travel in the interior and ideal world and sometimes no doubt we find it difficult to choose our direction because it does not yet exist distinctly in our idea when i go out of the house for a walk uncertain as yet whether i will bend my steps and submit myself to my instinct to decide for me i find strange and whimsical as it may seem that i finally and inevitably settle southwest toward some particular wood or meadow or deserted pasture or hill in that direction my needle is slow to settle varies a few degrees and does not always point me due southwest it is true and it has good authority for this variation but it always settles between west and south southwest the future lies that way to me and the earth seems more unexhausted and richer on that side the outline which would bound my walks would be not a circle but a parabola or rather like one of those cometary orbits which have been thought to be non-returning curves in this case opening westward in which my house occupies the place of the sun i turn round and round irresolute sometimes for a quarter of an hour until i decide for a thousandth time that i will walk into the southwest or west eastward i go only by force but westward i go free thither no business leads me it is hard for me to believe that i shall find fair landscapes or sufficient wildness and freedom behind the eastern horizon i am not excited by the prospect of a walk thither but i believe that the forest which i see in the western horizon stretches uninterruptedly toward the setting sun and there are no towns nor cities in it of enough consequence to disturb me let me live where i will on this side is the city on that the wilderness and ever i am leaving the city more and more and withdrawing into the wilderness i should not lay so much stress on this fact if i did not believe that something like this is the prevailing tendency of our countrymen i must walk toward oregon 
and not toward europe and that way the nation is moving and i may say that mankind progress from east to west within a few years we have witnessed the phenomenon of a southeastward migration in the settlement of australia but this affects us as a retrograde movement and judging from the moral and physical character of the first generation of australians has not yet proved a successful experiment the eastern tartars think that there is nothing west beyond tibet the world ends there say they beyond there is nothing but a shoreless sea it is unmitigated east where they live we go eastward to realize history and study the works of art and literature retracing the steps of the race we go westward as into the future with a spirit of enterprise and adventure the atlantic is a lithian stream in our passage over which we have had an opportunity to forget the old world and its institutions if we do not succeed this time there is perhaps one more chance for the race left before it arrives on the banks of the styx and that is in the leth of the pacific which is three times as wide i know not how significant it is or how far it is an evidence of singularity that an individual should thus consent in his pettiest walk with the general movement of the race but i know that something akin to the migratory instinct in birds and quadrupeds which in some instances is known to have affected the squirrel tribe impelling them to a general and mysterious movement in which they were seen say some crossing the broadest rivers each on its particular chip with its tail raised for a sail and bridging narrower streams with their dead that something like the furor which affects the domestic cattle in the spring and which is referred to a worm in their tails affects both nations and individuals either perennially or from time to time not a flock of wild geese cackles over our town but it to some extent unsettles the value of real estate here and if i were a broker i should probably take that disturbance into account then longen folk to gone on pilgrimages and homeres for to seeken strange strands every sunset which i witness inspires me with the desire to go to a west as distant and as fair as that into which the sun goes down he appears to migrate westward daily and tempt us to follow him he is the great western pioneer whom the nations follow we dream all night of those mountain ridges in the horizon though they may be of vapor only which were last gilded by his rays the island of atlantis and the islands and gardens of the hesperides a sort of terrestrial paradise appear to have been the great west of the ancients enveloped in mystery and poetry who has not seen in imagination when looking into the sunset sky the gardens of the hesperides and the foundation of all those fables columbus felt the westward tendency more strongly than any before he obeyed it and found a new world for castile and Lyon. the herd of men in those days scented fresh pastures from afar and now the sun had stretched out all the hills and now was dropped into the western bay at last he rose and twitched his mantle blue to-morrow to fresh woods and pastures new where on the globe can there be found an area of equal extent with that occupied by the bulk of our states so fertile and so rich and varied in its productions and at the same time so habitable by the european as this is michaud who knew but part of them says that 
the species of large trees are much more numerous in north america than in europe in the united states there are more than one hundred and forty species that exceed thirty feet in height in france there are but thirty that attain this size later botanists more than confirm his observations humboldt came to america to realize his youthful dreams of a tropical vegetation and he beheld it in its greatest perfection in the primitive forests of the amazon the most gigantic wilderness on the earth which he has so eloquently described the geographer guillot himself a european goes farther farther than i am ready to follow him yet not when he says as the plant is made for the animal as the vegetable world is made for the animal world america is made for the man of the old world the man of the old world sets out upon his way leaving the highlands of asia he descends from station to station towards europe each of his steps is marked by a new civilization superior to the preceding by a greater power of development arrived at the atlantic he pauses on the shore of this unknown ocean the bounds of which he knows not and turns upon his footprints for an instant when he has exhausted the rich soil of europe and reinvigorated himself then recommences his adventurous career westward as in the earliest ages so far guillot from this western impulse coming in contact with the barrier of the atlantic sprang the commerce and enterprise of our modern times the younger michaud in his travels west of the alleghanies in eighteen o two says that the common inquiry in the newly settled west was from what part of the world have you come as if these vast and fertile regions would naturally be the place of meeting and common country of all the inhabitants of the globe to use an obsolete latin word i might say ex oriente lux ex occidente frux from the east light from the west fruit sir francis head an english traveller and a governor-general of canada tells us that in both the northern and southern hemispheres of the new world nature has not only outlined her works on a larger scale but has painted the whole picture with brighter and more costly colors than she used in delineating and in beautifying the old world the heavens of america appear infinitely higher the sky is bluer the air is fresher the cold is intenser the moon looks larger the stars are brighter the thunder is louder the lightning is vivider the wind is stronger the rain is heavier the mountains are higher the rivers longer the forests bigger the plains broader this statement will do at least to set against buffon's account of this part of the world and its productions linnaeus said long ago nescio que facies leta glabra plantis americanis i know not what there is of joyous and smooth in the aspect of american plants and i think that in this country there are no or at most very few africane bestiae african beasts as the romans called them and that in this respect also it, it is peculiarly fitted for the habitation of man we are told that within three miles of the centre of the east indian city of singapore some of the inhabitants are annually carried off by tigers but the traveller can lie down in the woods at night almost anywhere in north america without fear of wild beasts these are encouraging testimonies if the moon looks larger here than in europe probably the sun looks larger also if the heavens of america appear infinitely higher and the stars brighter i trust that these facts are symbolical of the height 
to which the philosophy and poetry and religion of her inhabitants may one day soar at length perchance the immaterial heaven will appear as much higher to the american mind and the intimations that star it as much brighter for i believe that climate does thus react on man as there is something in the mountain air that feeds the spirit and inspires will not man grow to greater perfection intellectually as well as physically under these influences or is it unimportant how many foggy days there are in his life i trust that we shall be more imaginative that our thoughts will be clearer fresher and more ethereal as our sky our understanding more comprehensive and broader like our plains our intellect generally on a grander scale like our thunder and lightning our rivers and mountains and forests and our hearts shall even correspond in breadth and depth and grandeur to our inland seas perchance there will appear to the traveller something he knows not what of leta and glabra of joyous and serene in our very faces else to what end does the world go on and why was america discovered to americans i hardly need to say westward the star of empire takes its way as a true patriot i should be ashamed to think that adam in paradise was more favorably situated on the whole than the backwoodsman in this country our sympathies in massachusetts are not confined to new england though we may be estranged from the south we sympathize with the west there is the home of the younger sons as among the scandinavians they took to the sea for their inheritance it is too late to be studying hebrew it is more important to understand even the slang of to-day some months ago i went to see a panorama of the rhine it was like a dream of the middle ages i floated down its historic stream in something more than imagination under bridges built by the romans and repaired by later heroes past cities and castles whose very names were music to my ears and each of which was the subject of a legend there were Aaron Breitstein and Roland's Zeck and Koblenz, which I knew only in history. They were ruins that interested me chiefly. There seemed to come up from its waters and its vine-clad hills and valleys as hushed music as of crusaders departing for the Holy Land. I floated along under the spell of enchantment as if i had been transported to an heroic age and breathed an atmosphere of chivalry soon after i went to see a panorama of the mississippi and as i worked my way up the river in the light of to-day and saw the steamboats wooding up counted the rising cities gazed on the fresh ruins of novo beheld the indians moving west across the stream and as before i had looked up the moselle now looked up the ohio and the missouri and heard the legends of dubuque and of winona's cliff still thinking more of the future than of the past or present i saw that this was a rhine stream of a different kind that the foundations of castles were yet to be laid and the famous bridges were yet to be thrown over the river and i felt that this was the heroic age itself though we know it not for the hero is commonly the simplest and obscurest of men the west of which i speak is but another name for the wild and what i have been preparing to say is that in wildness is the preservation of the world every tree sends its fibres forth in search of the wild the cities import it at any price men plough and sail for it from the forest and wilderness come the tonics and barks which brace mankind our ancestors were savages 
the story of romulus and remus being suckled by a wolf is not a meaningless fable the founders of every state which has risen to eminence have drawn their nourishment and vigor from a similar wild source it was because the children of the empire were not suckled by the wolf that they were conquered and displaced by the children of the northern forests who were i believe in the forest and in the meadow and in the night in which the corn grows we require an infusion of hemlock spruce or arbor vitae in our tea there is a difference between eating and drinking for strength and from mere gluttony the hottentots eagerly devour the marrow of the kudu and other antelopes raw as a matter of course some of our northern indians eat raw the marrow of the arctic reindeer as well as various other parts including the summits of the antlers as long as they are soft and herein perchance they have stolen a march on the cooks of paris they get what usually goes to feed the fire this is probably better than stall fed beef and slaughterhouse pork to make a man of give me a wildness whose glance no civilization can endure as if we lived on the marrow of kudus devoured raw there are some intervals which border the strain of the wood thrush to which i would migrate wild lands where no settler has squatted to which methinks i am already acclimated the african hunter cummings tells us that the skin of the eland as well as that of most other antelopes just killed emits the most delicious perfume of trees and grass i would have every man so much like a wild antelope so much a part and parcel of nature that his very person should thus sweetly advertise our senses of his presence and remind us of those parts of nature which he most haunts i feel no disposition to be satirical when the trapper's coat emits the odor of muskish even it is a sweeter scent to me than that which commonly exhales from the merchants or the scholars garments when i go into their wardrobes and handle their vestments i am reminded of no greasy plains and flowery meads which they have frequented but of dusty merchants exchanges and libraries rather a tanned skin is something more than respectable and perhaps olive is a fitter color than white for a man a denizen of the woods the pale white man i do not wonder that the african pitied him darwin the naturalist says a white man bathing by the side of a tahitian was like a plant bleached by the gardener's art compared with a fine dark green one growing vigorously in the open fields ben jonson exclaims how near to good is what is fair so i would say how near to good is what is wild life consists with wildness the most alive is the wildest not yet subdued to man its presence refreshes him one who pressed forward incessantly and never rested from his labors who grew fast and made infinite demands on life would always find himself in a new country or wilderness and surrounded by the raw material of life he would be climbing over the prostrate stems of primitive forest trees hope and the future for me are not in lawns and cultivated fields not in towns and cities but in the impervious and quaking swamps when formerly i have analyzed my partiality for some farm which i had contemplated purchasing i have frequently found that i was attracted solely by a few square rods of impermeable and unfathomable bog 
a natural sink in one corner of it that was the jewel which dazzled me i derive more of my subsistence from the swamps which surround my native town than from the cultivated gardens in the village there are no richer parterres to my eyes than the dense beds of dwarf andromeda cassandra calicolata which cover these tender places on the earth's surface botany cannot go farther than tell me the names of the shrubs which grow there the high blueberry panicled andromeda lambkill azalea and rhodora all standing in the quaking sphagnum i often think that i should like to have my house front on this mass of dull red bushes omitting other flower-pots and borders transplanted spruce and trim box even gravelled walks to have this fertile spot under my windows not a few imported barrelfuls of soil only to cover the sand which was thrown out in digging the cellar why not put my house my parlor behind this plot instead of behind that meagre assemblage of curiosities that poor apology for a nature and art which i call my front yard it is an effort to clear up and make a decent appearance when the carpenter and mason have departed though done as much for the passer-by as the dweller within the most tasteful front-yard fence was never an agreeable object of study to me the most elaborate ornaments acorn tops or what not soon wearied and disgusted me bring your sills up to the very edge of the swamp then though it may not be the best place for a dry cellar so that there be no access on that side to citizens front yards are not made to walk in but at most through and you could go in the back way yes though you may think me perverse if it were proposed to me to dwell in the neighborhood of the most beautiful gardens that ever human art contrived or else of a dismal swamp i should certainly decide for the swamp how vain then have been all your labors citizens for me end of section six section seven of the oxford book of american essays chosen by brander matthews this librivox recording is in the public domain section seven my spirits infallibly rise in proportion to the outward dreariness give me the ocean the desert or the wilderness in the desert pure air and solitude compensate for want of moisture and fertility the traveller burton says of it your morale improves you become frank and cordial hospitable and single-minded in the desert spiritous liquors excite only disgust there is a keen enjoyment in a mere animal existence they who have been travelling long on the steppes of tartary say on re-entering cultivated lands the agitation perplexity and turmoil of civilization oppressed and suffocated us the air seemed to fail us and we felt every moment as if about to die of asphyxia when i would recreate myself i seek the darkest wood the thickest and most interminable and to the citizen most dismal swamp i enter a swamp as a sacred place a sanctum sanctorum there is the strength the marrow of nature the wild wood covers the virgin mould and the same soil is good for men and for trees a man's health requires as many acres of meadow to his prospect as his farm does loads of muck there are the strong meats on which he feeds the town is saved not more by the righteous man in it than by the woods and swamps that surround it 
a township where one primitive forest waves above while another primitive forest rots below such a town is fitted to raise not only corn and potatoes but poets and philosophers for the coming ages in such a soil grew homer and confucius and the rest and out of such a wilderness comes the reformer eating locusts and wild honey to preserve wild animals implies generally the creation of a forest for them to dwell in or resort to so it is with man a hundred years ago they sold bark in our streets peeled from our own woods in the very aspect of those primitive and rugged trees there was methinks a tanning principle which hardened and consolidated the fibres of men's thoughts ah already i shudder for these comparatively degenerate days of my native village when you cannot collect a load of bark of good thickness and we no longer produce tar and turpentine the civilized nations greece rome england have been sustained by the primitive forests which anciently rotted where they stand they survive as long as the soil is not exhausted alas for human culture little is to be expected of a nation when the vegetable mould is exhausted and it is compelled to make manure of the bones of its fathers there the poet sustains himself merely by his own superfluous fat and the philosopher comes down on his marrow bones it is said to be the task of the american to work the virgin soil and that agriculture here already assumes proportions unknown everywhere else i think that the farmer displaces the indian even because he redeems the meadow and so makes himself stronger and in some respects more natural i was surveying for a man the other day a single straight line one hundred and thirty-two rods long through a swamp at whose entrance might have been written the words which dante read over the entrance to the infernal regions leave all hope ye that enter that is of ever getting out again where at one time i saw my employer actually up to his neck and swimming for his life in his property though it was still winter he had another similar swamp which i could not survey at all because it was completely under water and nevertheless with regard to a third swamp which i did survey from a distance he remarked to me true to his instincts that he would not part with it for any consideration on account of the mud which it contained and that man intends to put a girdling ditch round the hole in the course of forty months and so redeem it by the magic of his spade i refer to him only as the type of a class the weapons with which we have gained our most important victories which should be handed down as heirlooms from father to son are not the sword and the lance but the bushwhack the turf cutter the spade and the bog hoe rusted with the blood of many a meadow and begrimed with the dust of many a hard-fought field the very winds blew the indian's cornfield into the meadow and pointed out the way which he had not the skill to follow he had no better implement with which to entrench himself in the land than a clam-shell but the farmer is armed with plough and spade in literature it is only the wild that attracts us dullness is but another name for tameness it is the uncivilized free and wild thinking in hamlet and the iliad in all the scriptures and mythologies not learned in the schools that delights us as the wild duck is more swift and beautiful than the tame so is the wild the mallard thought which mid falling dews wings its way above the fens a truly 
good book is something as natural and as unexpectedly and unaccountably fair and perfect as a wild flower discovered on the prairies of the west or in the jungles of the east genius is a light which makes the darkness visible like the lightning's flash which perchance shatters the temple of knowledge itself and not a taper lighted at the hearthstone of the race which pales before the light of common day english literature from the days of the minstrels to the lake poets chaucer and spencer and milton and even shakespeare included breathes no quite fresh and in the sense wild strain it is an essentially tame and civilized literature reflecting greece and rome her wilderness is a green wood her wild man a robin hood there is plenty of genial love of nature but not so much of nature herself her chronicles inform us when her wild animals but not when the wild man in her became extinct the science of humboldt is one thing poetry is another thing the poet to-day notwithstanding all the discoveries of science and the accumulated learning of mankind enjoys no advantage over homer where is the literature which gives expression to nature he would be a poet who would impress the winds and streams into his service to speak for him who nailed words to their primitive senses as farmers drive down stakes in the spring which the frost has heaved who derived his words as often as he used them transplanted them to his page with earth adhering to their roots whose words were so true and fresh and natural that they would appear to expand like the buds at the approach of spring though they lay half smothered between two musty leaves in a library i to bloom and bear fruit there after their kind annually for the faithful reader in sympathy with surrounding nature i do not know of any poetry to quote which adequately expresses this yearning for the wild approached from this side the best poetry is tame i do not know where to find in any literature ancient or modern any account which contents me of that nature with which even i am acquainted you will perceive that i demand something which no augustan or elizabethan age which no culture in short can give mythology comes nearer to it than anything how much more fertile a nature at least has grecian mythology its roots in than english literature mythology is the crop which the old world bore before its soil was exhausted before the fancy and imagination were affected with blight and which it still bears wherever its pristine vigour is unabated all other literatures endure only as the elms which overshadow our houses but this is like the great dragon tree of the western isles as old as mankind and whether that does or not will endure as long for the decay of other literatures makes the soil in which it thrives the west is preparing to add its fables to those of the east the valleys of the ganges the nile and the rhine having yielded their crop it remains to be seen that the valleys of the amazon the platte the onorico the st lawrence and the mississippi will produce perchance when in the course of ages american liberty has become a fiction of the past as it is to some extent a fiction of the present the poets of the world will be inspired by american mythology the wildest dreams of wild men even are not the less true though they may not recommend themselves to the sense which is most common among englishmen and americans to-day it is not every truth that recommends itself to the common sense nature has a place for the wild 
clematis as well as for the cabbage some expressions of truth are reminiscent others merely sensible as the phrase is others prophetic some forms of disease even may prophesy forms of health the geologist has discovered that the figures of serpents griffins flying dragons and other fanciful embellishments of heraldry have their prototypes in the forms of fossil species which were extinct before man was created and hence indicate a faint and shadowy knowledge of the previous state of organic existence the hindus dreamt that the earth rested on an elephant and the elephant on a tortoise and the tortoise on a serpent and though it may be an unimportant coincidence it will not be out of place here to state that a fossil tortoise has lately been discovered in asia large enough to support an elephant i confess that i am partial to these wild fancies which transcend the order of time and development they are the sublimest recreation of the intellect the partridge loves peas but not those that go with her into the pot in short all good things are wild and free there is something in a strain of music whether produced by an instrument or by the human voice take the sound of a bugle in a summer night for instance which by its wildness to speak without satire reminds me of the cries emitted by wild beasts in their native forests it is so much of their wildness as i can understand give me for my friends and neighbors wild men not tame ones the wildness of the savage is but a faint symbol of the awful ferity with which good men and lovers meet i love even to see the domestic animals reassert their native rights any evidence that they have not wholly lost their original wild habits and vigor as when my neighbor's cow breaks out of her pasture early in the spring and boldly swims the river a cold gray tide twenty-five or thirty rods wide swollen by the melted snow it is the buffalo crossing the mississippi this exploit confers such dignity on the herd in my eyes already dignified the seeds of instinct are preserved under the thick hides of cattle and horses like seeds in the bowels of the earth an indefinite period any sportiveness in cattle is unexpected i saw one day a herd of a dozen bullocks and cows running about and frisking in unwieldy sport like huge rats even like kittens they shook their heads raised their tails and rushed up and down a hill and i perceived by their horns as well as by their activity their relation to the deer tribe but alas a sudden loud woe would have dampened their ardour at once reduced them from venison to beef and stiffened their sides and sinews like the locomotive who but the evil one has cried woe to mankind indeed the life of cattle like that of many men is but a sort of locomotiveness they move aside at a time and man by his machinery is meeting the horse and the ox halfway whatever part the whip has touched is thenceforth palsied who would ever think of a side of any of the supple cat tribe as we speak of a side of beef i rejoice that horses and steers have to be broken before they can be made the slaves of men and that men themselves have some wild oats still left to sow before they become submissive members of society undoubtedly all men are not equally fit subjects for civilization and because the majority like dogs and sheep are tame by inherited disposition this is no reason why the others should have their natures broken that they may be reduced to the same level 
men are in the main alike but they were made several in order that they might be various if a low use is to be served one man will do nearly or quite as well as another if a high one individual excellence is to be regarded any man can stop a hole to keep the wind away but no other man could serve so rare a use as the author of this illustration did confucius says the skins of the tiger and the leopard when they are tanned are as the skins of the dog and the sheep tanned but it is not the part of a true culture to tame tigers any more than it is to make sheep ferocious and tanning their skins for shoes is not the best use to which they can be put when looking over a list of men's names in a foreign language as of military officers or of authors who have written on a particular subject i am reminded once more that there is nothing in a name the name menchikoff for instance has nothing in it to my ears more human than a whisker and it may belong to a rat as the names of the poles and russians are to us so are ours to them it is as if they had been named by the child's rigmarole iry wiry itchery von tittletotan i see in my mind a herd of wild creatures swarming over the earth and to each the herdsman has affixed some barbarous sound in his own dialect the names of men are of course as cheap and meaningless as bows and tray the names of dogs methinks it would be some advantage to philosophy if men were named merely in the gross as they are known it would be necessary only to know the genus and perhaps the race or variety to know the individual we are not prepared to believe that every private soldier in a roman army had a name of his own because we have not supposed that he had a character of his own at present our only true names are nicknames i knew a boy who from his peculiar energy was called buster by his playmates and this rightly supplanted his christian name some travellers tell us that an indian had no name given him at first but earned it and his name was his fame and among some tribes he acquired a new name with every new exploit it is pitiful when a man bears a name for convenience merely who has earned neither name nor fame i will not allow mere names to make distinctions for me but still see men in herds for all them a familiar name cannot make a man less strange to me it may be given to a savage who retains in secret his own wild title earned in the woods we have a wild savage in us and a savage name is perchance somewhere recorded as ours i see that my neighbour who bears the familiar epithet william or edwin takes it off with his jacket it does not adhere to him when asleep or in anger or aroused by any passion or inspiration i seem to hear pronounced by some of his kin at such a time his original wild name in some jaw-breaking or else melodious tongue here in this vast savage howling mother of ours nature lying all around with such beauty and such affection for her children as the leopard and yet we are so early weaned from her breast to society to that culture which is exclusively an interaction of man on man a sort of breeding in and in, in which produces at most a merely english nobility a civilization destined to have a speedy limit in society in the best of institutions of men it is easy to detect a certain precocity when we should still be growing children we are already little men give me a culture which imports much muck from the meadows 
and deepens the soil not that which trusts to heating manures and improved implements and modes of culture only many a poor sore-eyed student that i have heard of would grow faster both intellectually and physically if instead of sitting up so very late he honestly slumbered a fool's allowance there may be an excess even of informing light neeps a frenchman discovered actinism that power in the sun rays which produces a chemical effect that granite rocks and stone structures and statues of metal are all alike destructively acted upon during the hours of sunshine and but for provisions of nature no less wonderful would soon perish under the delicate touch of the most subtle of the agencies of the universe but he observed that these bodies which underwent this change during the daylight possessed the power of restoring themselves to their original conditions during the hours of night when this excitement was no longer influencing them hence it has been inferred that the hours of darkness are as necessary to the inorganic creation as we know night and sleep are to the organic kingdom not even does the moon shine every night but gives place to darkness i would not have every man nor every part of a man cultivated any more than i would have every acre of earth cultivated part will be tillage but the greater part will be meadow and forest not only serving an immediate use but preparing a mould against a distant future by the animal decay of the vegetation which it supports there are other letters for the child to learn than those which cadmus invented the spaniards have a good term to express this wild and dusky knowledge grammatica parda tawny gramma a kind of mother wit derived from that same leopard to which i have referred we have heard of a society for the diffusion of useful knowledge it is said that knowledge is power and the like methinks there is equal need of a society for the diffusion of useful ignorance what we will call beautiful knowledge a knowledge useful in a higher sense for what is most of our boasted so-called knowledge but a conceit that we know something which robs us of the advantage of our actual ignorance what we call knowledge is often our positive ignorance ignorance our negative knowledge by long years of patient industry and reading of the newspapers for what are libraries of science but files of newspapers a man accumulates a myriad facts lays them up in his memory and then when in some spring of his life he saunters abroad into the great fields of thought he as it were goes to grass like a horse and leaves all his harness behind in the stable i would say to the society for the diffusion of useful knowledge sometimes go to grass you have eaten hay long enough the spring has come with its green crop the very cows are driven to their country pastures before the end of may though i have heard of one unnatural farmer who kept his cow in the barn and fed her on hay all the year round so frequently the society for the diffusion of useful knowledge treats its cattle a man's ignorance sometimes is not only useful but beautiful while his knowledge so called is oftentimes worse than useless besides being ugly which is the best man to deal with he who knows nothing about a subject and what is extremely rare knows that he knows nothing or he who really knows something about it but thinks that he knows all my desire for knowledge is intermittent but my desire to bathe my head in atmospheres unknown to my feet is perennial and constant the highest that we can attain 
to is not knowledge but sympathy with intelligence i do not know that this higher knowledge amounts to anything more definite than a novel and grand surprise on a sudden revelation of the insufficiency of all that we called knowledge before a discovery that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy it is the lighting up of the mist by the sun man cannot know in any higher sense than this any more than he can look serenely and with impunity in the face of sun ostinon u kelnon non sais you will not perceive that as perceiving a particular thing says the chaldean oracles there is something servile in the habit of seeking after a law which we may obey we may study the laws of matter at and for our convenience but a successful life knows no law it is an unfortunate discovery certainly that of a law which binds us where we did not know before that we were bound live free child of the mist and with respect to knowledge we are all children of the mist the man who takes the liberty to live is superior to all the laws by virtue of his relation to the lawmaker that is active duty says vishnu purana which is not for our bondage that is knowledge which is for our liberation all other duty is good only unto weariness all other knowledge is only the cleverness of an artist it is remarkable how few events or crises there are in our histories how little exercised we have been in our minds how few experiences we have had i would fain be assured that i am growing apace and rankly though my very growth disturb this dull equanimity though it be with struggle through long dark muggy nights or seasons of gloom it would be well if all our lives were a divine tragedy even instead of this trivial comedy or farce dante bunyan and others appear to have been exercised in their minds more than we they were subjected to a kind of culture such as our district schools and colleges do not contemplate even mohammed though many may scream at his name had a good deal more to live for ay and to die for than they have commonly when at rare intervals some thought visits one as perchance he is walking on a railroad then indeed the cars go by without his hearing them but soon by some inexorable law our life goes by and the cars return gentle breeze that wanderest unseen and bendest the thistles round loira of storms traveller of the windy glens why hast thou left my ear so soon while almost all men feel an attraction drawing them to society few are attracted strongly to nature in their relation to nature men appear to me for the most part notwithstanding their arts lower than the animals it is not often a beautiful relation as in the case of the animals how little appreciation of the beauty of the landscape there is among us we have to be told that the greeks called the world cosmos beauty or order but we do not see clearly why they did so and we esteem it at best only a curious philological fact for my part i feel that with regard to nature i live a sort of border life on the confines of a world into which i make occasional and transional and transient forays only and my patriotism and allegiance to the state into whose territories i seem to retreat are those of a moss trooper unto a life which i call natural i would gladly follow even a will-o'-the-wisp 
through bogs and sloughs unimaginable but no moon nor firefly has shown me the causeway to it nature is a personality so vast and universal that we have never seen one of her features the walker in the familiar fields which stretch around my native town sometimes finds himself in another land than is described in their owner's deeds as it were in some faraway field on the confines of the actual concord where her jurisdiction ceases and the idea which the word concord suggests ceases to be suggested these farms which i have myself surveyed these bounds which i have set up appear dimly still as through a mist but they have no chemistry to fix them they fade from the surface of the glass and the picture which the painter painted stands out dimly from beneath the world with which we are commonly acquainted leaves no trace and it will have no anniversary i took a walk on spaulding's farm the other afternoon i saw the setting sun lighting up the opposite side of a stately pine wood its golden rays straggled into the aisles of the wood as into some noble hall i was impressed as if some ancient and altogether admirable and shining family had settled there in that part of the land called concord unknown to me to whom the son was servant who had not gone into society in the village who had not been called upon i saw their park their pleasure ground beyond through the wood in spaulding's cranberry meadow the pines furnished them with gables as they grew their house was not obvious to vision the trees grew through it i do not know whether i heard the sounds of a suppressed hilarity or not they seemed to recline on the sunbeams they have sons and daughters they are quite well the farmer's cart path which leads directly through their hall does not in the least put them out as the muddy bottom of a pool is sometimes seen through the reflected skies they never heard of spaulding and do not know that he is their neighbour notwithstanding i heard him whistle as he drove his team through the house nothing can equal the serenity of their lives their coat of arms is simply a lichen i saw it painted on the pines and oaks their attics were in the tops of the trees they are of no politics there was no noise of labor i did not perceive that they were weaving or spinning yet i did detect when the wind lulled and hearing was done away the finest imaginable sweet musical hum as of a distant hive in may which perchance was the sound of their thinking they had no idle thoughts and no one without could see their work for their industry was not as in knots and excrescences embayed but i find it difficult to remember them they fade irrevocably out of my mind even now while i speak and endeavour to recall them and recollect myself it is only after a long and serious effort to recollect my best thoughts that i become again aware of their cohabitancy if it were not for such families as this i think i should move out of concord we are accustomed to say in new england that few and fewer pigeons visit us every year our forests furnish no mast for them so it would seem fewer and fewer thoughts visit each growing man from year to year for the grove in our minds is laid waste sold to feed unnecessary fires of ambition or sent to mill and there is scarcely a twig left for them to perch on they no longer build nor breed with us in some more genial season perchance a faint shadow flits across the landscape of the mind 
cast by the wings of some thought in its vernal or autumnal migration but looking up we are unable to detect the substance of the thought itself our winged thoughts are turned to poultry they no longer soar and they attain only to a shanghai and cochin china grandeur those great thoughts those great men you hear of we hug the earth how rarely we mount methinks we might elevate ourselves a little more we might climb a tree at least i found my account in climbing a tree once it was a tall white pine on the top of a hill and though i got well pitched i was well paid for it for i discovered new mountains in the horizon which i had never seen before so much more of the earth and the heavens i might have walked about the foot of the tree for threescore years and ten and yet i certainly should never have seen them but above all i discovered around me it was near the end of june on the ends of the topmost branches only a few minute and delicate red cone-like blossoms the fertile flower of the white pine looking heavenward i carried straight away to the village the topmost spire and showed it to stranger jurymen who walked the streets for it was court week and to farmers and lumber dealers and wood choppers and hunters and not one had ever seen the like before but they wondered as at a star dropped down tell of ancient architects finishing their works on the tops of columns as perfectly as on the lower and more visible parts nature has from the first expanded the minute blossoms of the forest only towards the heavens above men's heads and unobserved by them we see only the flowers that are under our feet in the meadows the pines have developed their delicate blossoms on the highest twigs of the wood every summer for ages as well over the heads of nature's red children as of her white ones yet scarcely a farmer or hunter in the land has ever seen them above all we cannot afford not to live in the present he is blessed over all mortals who loses no moment of the passing life in remembering the past unless our philosophy hears the cock crow in every barnyard within our horizon it is belated that sound commonly reminds us that we are growing rusty and antique in our employments and habits of thought his philosophy comes down to a more recent time than ours there is something suggested by it that is a newer testament the gospel according to this moment he has not fallen astern he has got up early and kept up early and to be where he is is to be in season in the foremost rank of time it is an expression of the health and soundness of nature a brag for all the world healthiness as of a spring burst forth a new fountain of the muses to celebrate this last instant of time where he lives no fugitive slave laws are passed who has not betrayed his master many times since last he heard that note the merit of this bird's strain is in its freedom from all plaintiveness the singer can easily move us to tears or to laughter but where is he who can excite in us a pure morning joy when in doleful dumps breaking the awful stillness of our wooden sidewalk on a sunday or perchance a watcher in the house of mourning i hear a cockerel crow far or near i think to myself there is one of us well at any rate and with a sudden gush return to my senses we had a remarkable sunset one day last november i was walking in a meadow the source of a small brook 
when the sun at last just before setting after a cold grey day reached a clear stratum in the horizon and the softest brightest morning sunlight fell on the dry grass and on the stems of the trees in the opposite horizon and on the leaves of the shrub oaks on the hillside while our shadows stretched long over the meadow eastward as if we were the only motes in its beams it was such a light as we could not have imagined a moment before and the air also was so warm and serene that nothing was wanting to make a paradise of that meadow when we reflected that this was not a solitary phenomenon never to happen again but that it would happen for ever and ever an infinite number of evenings and cheer and reassure the latest child that walked there it was more glorious still the sun sets on some retired meadow where no house is visible with all the glory and splendor that it lavishes on cities and perchance as it has never set before where there is but a solitary marsh hawk to have his wings gilded by it or only a musquash looks out from his cabin and there is some little black-veined brook in the midst of the marsh just beginning to meander winding slowly round a decaying stump we walked in so pure and bright a light gilding the withered grass and leaves so softly and serenely bright i thought i had never bathed in such a golden flood without a ripple or a murmur to it the west side of every wood and rising ground gleamed like the boundary of elysium and the sun on our backs seemed like a gentle herdsman driving us home at evening so we saunter toward the holy land till one day the sun shall shine more brightly than ever he has done shall perchance shine into our minds and hearts and light up our whole lives with a great awakening light as warm and serene and golden as on a bankside in autumn on a certain condescension in foreigners footnote from the atlantic monthly january eighteen sixty nine and a footnote by james russell lowell walking one day towards the village as we used to call it in the good old days when almost every dweller in the town had been born in it i was enjoying that delicious sense of disenthrallment from the actual which the deepening twilight brings with it giving as it does a sort of obscure novelty to things familiar the coolness the hush broken only by the distant bleat of some belated goat querulous to be disburdened of her milky load the few faint stars more guessed as yet than seen the sense that the coming dark would so soon fold me in the secure privacy of its disguise all things combined in a result as near absolute peace as can be hoped for by a man who knows that there is a writ out against him in the hands of the printer's devil for a moment i was enjoying the blessed privilege of thinking without being called on to stand and deliver what i thought to the small public who are good enough to take any interest therein i love old ways and the path i was walking felt kindly to the feet it had known for almost fifty years how many fleeting impressions it has shared with me how many times i have lingered to study the shadows of the leaves mezzotinted upon the turf that edged it by the moon of the bare boughs etched with a touch beyond rembrandt by the same unconscious artist on the smooth page of snow if i turned round through dusky tree gaps came the few twinkle of evening lamps in the dear old homestead 
on Corey's hill i could see these tiny pharoses of love and home and sweet domestic thoughts flash out one by one across the blackening salt meadow between how much has not kerosene added to the cheerfulness of our evening landscape a pair of night herons flapped heavily over me towards the hidden river the war was ended i might walk townward without that aching dread of bulletins that had darkened the july sunshine and twice made the scarlet leaves of october seem stained with blood i remembered with a pang half proud half painful how so many years ago i had walked over the same path and felt round my fingers the soft pressure of a little hand that was one day to hearten with faithful grip of sabre on how many paths leading to how many homes where proud memory does all she can to fill up the fireside gaps with shining shapes must not men be walking in just such pensive mood as i ah young heroes safe in immortal youth as those of homer who at least carried your ideal hence untarnished it is locked for you beyond moth or rust in the treasure chamber of death is not a country i thought that has had such as they in it that could give such as they a brave joy in dying for it worth something then and as i felt more and more the soothing magic of evening's cool palm upon my temples as my fancy came home from its reverie and my senses with reawakened curiosity ran to the front window again from the viewless closet of abstraction and felt a strange charm in finding the old tree and shabby fence still there under the travesty of falling night nay were conscious of an unsuspected newness in familiar stars and the fading outlines of hills my earliest horizon i was conscious of an immortal soul and could not but rejoice in the unwaning goodliness of the world into which i had been born without any merit of my own i thought of dear henry vaughan's rainbow still young and fine i remembered people who had to go over to the alps to learn what the divine silence of snow was who must run to italy before they were conscious of the miracle wrought every day under their very noses by the sunset who must call upon the berkshire hills to teach them what a painter autumn was while close at hand the fresh pond meadows made all orioles cheap with hues that showed as if a sunset cloud had been wrecked among their maples one might be worse off than even in america i thought there are some things so elastic that even the heavy roller of democracy cannot flatten them altogether down the mind can weave itself warmly in the cocoon of its own thoughts and dwell a hermit anywhere a country without traditions without ennobling associations a scramble of parvenu with a horrible consciousness of shoddy running through politics manners art literature nay religion itself i confess it did not seem so to me there in that illimitable quiet that serene self-possession of nature where collins might have brooded his ode to evening or where those verses on solitude in dodley's collection that hawthorne liked so much might have been composed traditions granting that we had done all that is worth having in them is the common property of the soul an estate in gavelkind for all the sons of adam and moreover 
if a man cannot stand on his two feet the prime quality of whoever has left any tradition behind him were it not better for him to be honest about it at once and go down on all fours and for associations if one have not the wit to make them for himself out of native earth no ready-made ones of other men will avail much lexington is none the worse to me for not being in greece nor gettysburg that its name is not marathon blessed old fields i was just exclaiming to myself like one of mrs radcliffe's heroes dear acres innocently secure from history which these eyes first beheld may you be also those to which they shall at last slowly darken when i was interrupted by a voice which asked me in german whether i was the herr professor doctor so-and-so the doctor was by brevet or vaticination to make the grade easier to my pocket one feels so intimately assured that he is made up in part of shreds and leavings of the past in part of the interpolations of other people that an honest man would be slow in saying yes to such a question but my name is so-and-so is a safe answer and i gave it while i had been romancing with myself the street lamps had been lighted and it was under one of these detectives that have robbed the old road of its privilege of sanctuary after nightfall that i was ambushed by my foe the inexorable villain had taken my description it appears that i might have the less chance to escape him dr holmes tells us that we change our substance not every seven years as was once believed but with every breath we draw why had i not the wit to avail myself of the subterfuge and like peter to renounce my identity especially as in certain moods of mind i have often more than doubted of it myself when a man is as it were his own front door and is thus knocked at why may he not assume the right of that sacred wood to make every house a castle by denying himself to all visitations i was truly not at home when the question was put to me but had to recall myself from all out of doors and to piece my self-consciousness hastily together as well as i could before i answered it i knew perfectly well what was coming it is seldom that debtors or good samaritans waylay people under gas lamps in order to force money upon them so far as i have seen or heard i was also aware from considerable experience that every foreigner is persuaded that by doing this country the favour of coming to it he has laid every native thereof under an obligation pecuniary or other as the case may be whose discharge he is entitled to on demand duly made in person or by letter too much learning of this kind has made me mad in the provincial sense of the word i had begun life with the theory of giving something to every beggar that came along though sure of never finding a native-born countryman among them in a small way i was resolved to emulate hatem ty's tent with its three hundred and sixty-five entrances one for every day in the year i know not whether he was astronomer enough to add another for leap years the beggars were a kind of german silver aristocracy not real plate to be sure but better than nothing where everybody was overworked they supplied the comfortable equipoise of absolute leisure so aesthetically needful besides i was but too conscious of a vagrant fibre in myself which too often thrilled me in my solitary walks with the temptation to wander on 
into infinite space and by a single spasm of resolution to emancipate myself from the drudgery of prosaic serfdom to respectability and the regular course of things this prompting has been at times my familiar demon and i could not but feel a kind of respectful sympathy for men who had dared what i had only sketched out to myself as a splendid possibility for seven years i helped maintain one heroic man on an imaginary journey to portland as fine an example as i have ever known of hopeless loyalty to an ideal i assisted another so long in a fruitless attempt to reach mecklenburg schwerin that at last we grinned in each other's faces when we met like a couple of augurs he was possessed by this harmless mania as some are by the north pole and i shall never forget his look of regretful compassion as for one who was sacrificing his higher life to the flesh-pots of egypt when i at last advised him somewhat strenuously to go to the devil whither the road was so much travelled that he could not miss it general banks in his noble zeal for the honour of his country would confer on the secretary of state the power of imprisoning in case of war all those seekers of the unattainable thus by a stroke of the pen annihilating the single poetic element in our humdrum life alas not everybody has the genius to be a bobbin boy or doubtless all these who would have chosen that most prosperous line of life but moralists sociologists political economists and taxes have slowly convinced me that my beggarly sympathies were a sin against society especially was the buckle doctrine of averages so flattering to our free will persuasive with me for as there must be in every year a certain number who would bestow an alms on these abridged editions of the wandering jew the withdrawal of my quota could make no possible difference since some destined proxy must always step forward to fill my gap just so many misdirected letters every year and no more would it were as easy to reckon up the number of men on whose backs fate has written the wrong address so that they arrive by mistake in congress and other places where they do not belong may not these wanderers of whom i speak have been sent into the world without any proper address at all where is our dead-letter office for such and if wiser social arrangements should furnish us with something of the sort fancying horrible thought how many a working man's friend a kind of industry in which the labour is light and the wages heavy would be sent thither because not called for in the office where he at present lies end of section seven